a chill books original the ascensions of jerusalem in the path of self-knowledge by abu hamid al-ghazali the sermon of the book in the name of god the most gracious the most merciful praise be to god the creator of souls and the maker of bodies the opener of locks and knots the giver of relations and counts from him comes guidance and right direction praise be to him as much as the repeated glances of eyes and their multiplicity and as much as the renewed breaths from chests and their repetition blessings and peace be upon the most honorable parent and child muhammad and his family a blessing that remains and continues forever know that god almighty has opened the insights of his allies with wisdom and reflection singled them out to witness the wonders of his creation in both rural and urban settings everything they observed had a lesson in it for all entities are mirrors reflecting the pure existence of the truth the apparent in its essence is god glorified be he and everything else signifies his manifestations and the signs of his light in everything there's a sign that indicates he is one whenever they witness something in the theaters of sight and the channels of thought they're drawn to the realm of sanctity getting closer to the mighty the ever stable one whose state does not change his knowledge and perfections are actualized and he is in the highest horizon when they achieve this ascension they persistently progress until they reach the utmost goal where truths of knowledge secrets of cognizance and wonders of signs in the realm of earth and heavens overflow upon them once they reach this end point it is the ultimate lote tree and they do not deviate to the world of falsehood the revelation speaks of this state saying he was taught by one mighty in power endowed with wisdom for he appeared in stately form while he was in the highest part of the horizon then he approached and came closer and was at a distance of but two bow lengths or nearer so did allah convey the inspiration to his servant dash conveyed what he meant to convey the heart did not lie about what it saw indeed he saw of the greatest signs of his lord so it's proper for every sensible person that god glory be to him should be the beginning and end of every thought the innermost and outermost of every consideration one's eyes should be intoxicated by gazing at him standing in his presence the mind should travel in the highest realm observing the greatest signs of his lord if one settles down he should see him in his traces for he in his essence manifests in everything by everything revealing traces that show the glory of the truth's essence and the perfection of his attributes the true knowledge is knowing one's self as god said soon will we show them our signs in the furthest regions and in their own souls until it becomes manifest to them that this is the truth and on the earth are signs for those of assured faith and also in your own selves will you not then see the prophet peace be upon him said whoever knows himself knows his lord and he also said the one who recognizes himself recognizes his lord in this book we are sent from the levels of self knowledge to the knowledge of the truth may his glory be exalted and mention the essence of what the proofs lead to regarding the state of the human soul we discuss what the thorough research has concluded about its nature its distinction from the attributes of bodies the knowledge of its powers and forces and the understanding of its occurrence survival happiness and misery after departure in a way that uncovers the veils raises the barriers and points to the stored secrets and hidden knowledge suspected by those who are not its people then when we conclude the chapters on self knowledge we then turn to the knowledge of the absolute truth exalted be his majesty all sciences are introductions and means to know the first truth exalted be his majesty anything seen for something else without achieving its intended purpose is wasted so whoever knows himself truly knows his lord his attributes and his actions he understands the ranks of the world its creator and its constituents he knows the angels and their ranks the assembly of the realm the assembly of satan divine favor and disappointment he understands the message prophecy the nature of revelation miracles and news about the unseen he is aware of the afterlife its bliss its misery its divisions and the pleasure of joy in it he realizes the ultimate happiness which is meeting god almighty those who are fortunate to embark on this journey perpetually wander in a paradise as vast as the heavens and the earth 
residing in the body, settled in the homeland. It is a journey where the face of knowledge is revealed, the knots of lights are untied, and resources never diminish regardless of the crowd. Its spoils are everlasting and its fruits continuously grow. Those not qualified to roam this field and wander in these gardens have only superficiality, consuming as the sheep do and grazing as beasts. Describing this journey and explaining this immense knowledge cannot be contained in pages and tablets, words and pens fall short in expressing its wonders, with the help of God Almighty, we hint at every sentence in a way that a discerning individual can understand independently. As for the rigid traditionalist who learns through imitation, he is far from such knowledge, everything is made easy for what it was created for. Those who are destined for happiness and are close to achieving their desires are granted the pinnacle of intellect, clarity of thought, pure instinct, burning intuition, single-mindedness, high intelligence, sharpness, grand opinions, and excellent understanding. These are gifts from God that cannot be acquired by mere effort. Those blessed with such sharpness should then strive for deeper understanding, ponder their intuitions, employ their thoughts, invest their minds by focusing their insight on unraveling mysteries, solving problems through deep contemplation, seeking solitude, freeing the mind, avoiding busy tasks, and performing acts of worship until they reach the pinnacle of knowledge. We named the book The Ascensions of Jerusalem, Holiness, in the Steps of Self-Knowledge. May God help us complete it. Introduction Regarding the meanings of synonymous terms related to the self, they are four, the self, the heart, the soul, and the mind. As for the self, it has two meanings. The first meaning, it refers to a comprehensive meaning of blameworthy qualities, which are the animalistic forces opposed to the rational forces. This concept is found in Sufism. It is said, the best jihad is to strive against your own self. This is what the Prophet, peace be upon him, alluded to when he said, the most dangerous enemy of yours is your own self which is between your sides. The second meaning, it refers to the essence or true nature of a human being. The self of anything is its essence, the substance that is the place for intelligibles. It belongs to the world of the unseen and the world of command as we will explain. Indeed, its names change based on its various states. If it turns towards the right path, and divine tranquility descends upon it, and continuous breezes of divine generosity blow upon it, it becomes content with the remembrance of God and finds peace in divine knowledge and soars to the highest horizons of sovereignty. Then, it is called the contented soul, God Almighty said, O serene soul, return to your Lord, well pleased and pleasing, to him, Quran, 89 27-28. But if it is in a state of struggle and conflict, and there is a war between it and its forces, then sometimes it has the upper hand, and sometimes the forces do. At times it leans towards rationality, grasping intelligible matters and remaining firm in acts of obedience. At other times, the forces dominate, causing it to sink to the lowest depths of animalistic behavior. This self is termed the accusing soul. This state is common among most people, some elevate to the level of angels, filled with knowledge and virtues, they are almost angelic, transcending humanity and not resembling humans except in outward form. Thus, God said, this is not a human, rather, it is, none but, a noble angel. Quran, 1231, others degrade to the point where they are like animals, if they were to be depicted as a standing, talking dog or donkey, there would be no difference due to their departure from human virtues and not resembling humans except in form. Such a soul is called the soul that prompts evil. They resemble the donkeys, dogs, or wolves. They are from the mentioned humans in God's saying, demons among men and jinn inspire each other with embellished words, misleading, them. Quran, 6-112. Ali, may God be pleased with him, said, they look like men, but they are not. Such souls appear to always be enslaved by desires, or static, or beastly, or vile. God informed us about this, saying, Surely the soul is prone to evil, Quran, 1253. As for the heart, it also has two meanings. The first meaning, it refers to the fleshly organ, cone-shaped, located in the chest of humans on the left side. It's known through anatomy as the organ that pumps dark blood and is the source of vapor, 
which constitutes the animal spirit. This exists in all animals and is not specific to humans. It is the one that, upon death, causes all senses to cease due to it. And the second is the one we are about to explain. It is the human spirit, the bearer of God's trust, endowed with knowledge. In it is innate knowledge, it speaks of monotheism by saying, indeed, he is the origin of mankind and the end of beings in the afterlife. God Almighty said, say, the spirit is of the command of my Lord. Quran 1785, and he also said, verily, in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find rest. Quran 1328, and our prophet, peace be upon him, said, the hearts of the children of Adam are all between two fingers of the fingers of the merciful. And wherever the heart is mentioned in the Sharia, what we are about to explain is intended, and if it is used to refer to the fleshy, pineal organ, it is because of its specific association. The first of these associations is as the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Indeed in the body there is a piece of flesh, if it is sound, the whole body is sound, and if it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt, and behold, it is the heart. As for the spirit, it refers to and means the subtle vapor that rises from the source of the heart, ascending to the brain through the veins, and also to all of the body, acting in each place according to its temperament and preparedness. This vapor is like a lamp, and the life it supports is like its light. Its effect on the body is similar to how a lamp illuminates the rooms of a house. It also refers to and means the Creator emanating from the command of God, the repository of knowledge, revelation, and inspiration, of the same nature as the angels, distinct from the physical world, self-sustaining as we have been informed. It also refers to and means the Spirit which is opposite all the angels, and it is the first Creator and the Holy Spirit. It also refers to and means the Quran, in general, it represents all that has life. As for the intellect, it refers to and means the first intellect, which is referred to as the intellect in the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the first thing Allah created was the intellect, and he said to it, come forth, and it came forth. Then he said to it, go back, and it went back, meaning, come forward to be completed through me, and go back so that the entire world can be completed through you, apart from you. It is the one to whom God said, by my might and majesty, I have not created a creation more honorable and superior to you. Through you I give and through you I take. It is also the one referred to as the pen, as he, peace be upon him, said, the first thing Allah created was the pen and he said to it, write. It asked, what should I write? He replied, write what is to happen till the day of judgment, and it wrote everything that is going to happen till the day of judgment. The second connotation is that it refers to and means the human soul. The third connotation is that it refers to and means the attribute of the soul, which is to the soul as sight is to the eye, through which it is ready to perceive the intelligibles, just as the eye, through sight, is prepared to perceive the sensibles. Regarding this, the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, said about his Lord Almighty, by my might and majesty, I will certainly perfect you in those I love. When we use the term soul, spirit, heart, and intellect in this book, we mean the human soul which is the place of intelligibles. Proof of the self The assertion that the self is evident in the sentence, the self is more manifest than to require evidence for its proof. All divine discourses address not non-existent entities but existing, living beings that understand the discourse. However, we illuminate its statement further, saying, it is well known without doubt that things, no matter how much they share in one aspect and differ in another, that which is common among them is not the same as that in which they differ. We encounter all bodies having in common that they are bodies and can have three intersecting dimensions, then we find them differing in motion and perception. If their motion is due to their corporeality, then everybody should move, because truths don't differ, and what applies to a type applies to all that share in that type and truth. If it's for a reason beyond corporeality, then a principle of action is proven in general, and that principle is the soul, until it's clear whether it's a substance or an attribute. For example, we see vegetative bodies nourish, grow, reproduce, and move in various ways such as branching and rooting. If these meanings were due to corporeality, then all bodies should be like that. If they're not due to corporeality but to an additional meaning, then that meaning is called a vegetative soul. Then, animals have what plants have, feel sensations, 
move with intention, and seek their benefits. They seek what benefits them and flee from harm. We conclude that animals have an additional meaning beyond vegetative bodies. Then, humans have all the meanings found in plants and animals, but they're distinguished by perceiving things beyond sensation, like understanding that the whole is greater than the part. Humans perceive particulars with the five senses, and universals with intellectual faculties. They share sensations with animals but differ in intellectual faculties. A human comprehends the universal from every particular, establishes the universal as a measuring criterion, and derives a conclusion from it. Neither the universal perception is denied, nor the perceiver of that denied. No accident, no body receptive to accidents, no plant, and no animal other than a human comprehends the universal, to the extent that they use that universal to categorize body parts. Universals have a unique unity such that they don't divide at all. Thus, the absolute universal for humans isn't half or a third or a quarter. Opposite to the universal form is a substance that isn't a body nor an accident in a body, has no place or location to point to. Its existence is more concealed from all sensory things and more manifest to the intellect than anything. Thus, the existence of the soul is proven, and it's proven in general that it's a substance, and it's proven to be transcendent from matter and corporeal forms. A classification showing the principles of actions we say, every principle from which an action emanates, either has awareness of its action or doesn't. If it doesn't have awareness, its action is either consistent and uniform, or varied. If it has awareness, it either has intellect or doesn't. If it has intellect, its action is either consistent and uniform or varied. These are five categories. The principle whose action is uniform and doesn't have awareness is called a natural principle, as seen in heavy bodies falling and light bodies rising. If its action is varied and doesn't have awareness, it's the vegetative soul, because plants move in varied ways. If it has sensation but no intellect, it's the animal soul. If it has intellect and with that intellect a choice in action and abstention, it's the human soul. If it has intellect and its action follows one unvaried path, it's the celestial soul. Sketching the three souls. We outline the three souls with their symbols, for the conditions of the true definition are impossible to exist here, and indeed in all existences. We say, as for the vegetative soul, it is the primary perfection for an organic natural body concerning what nourishes, grows, and reproduces. As for the animal soul, it is the primary perfection for an organic natural body concerning what perceives details and moves with intent. As for the human soul, it is the primary perfection for an organic natural body concerning what it does by rational choice, inference by opinion, and from the standpoint of perceiving universal matters. When we say the primary perfection, it means without the mediation of another perfection, because perfection can be primary or secondary. When we say for a natural body, it means not artificial, not in minds but in substances. And when we say organic, it means possessing organs that this primary perfection utilizes to attain secondary and tertiary perfections. The term perfection is more fitting than power because power is relative to what arises from it in actions, or in comparison to what it accepts from sensible and intelligible forms. Calling them both power would be due to a shared term, so the definition would be based on a shared term, even if one of them makes the definition incomplete. The term perfection encompasses both powers harmoniously, so it's more appropriate. If it's said to be a form, it is in relation to the matter it occupies, thereby combining to form either a vegetative or animal essence. The term perfection is in relation to the totality of essences, and for the completion of the genus by a derived species. It's more appropriate than the term form. It must be known that when the word soul is applied to the form of the sphere, and to the forms of plants, animals, and humans, it's said due to a shared name. For the celestial souls don't act with organs, and their life isn't a life of nourishment and growth, their perception isn't like that of animals, and their speech isn't like that of humans. The soul is essence. Proof that the soul is essence, and this is established from both religious and logical perspectives, from a religious perspective, all religious texts indicate that the soul is an essence. Similarly, the penalties mentioned in the religious texts after death indicate that the soul is an essence. Pain, even if felt by the body, is ultimately for the soul. 
then there is another torment specific to the soul, like shame, regret, and the pain of separation, this also indicates its endurance, as we will explain later, God willing. From a logical perspective, there are two aspects, a general aspect that can be proven to anyone and a specific aspect that only those with insight and fairness can perceive. The general aspect is to understand that the essence of a human is not just the body, he becomes human only when he is an essence, when he has dimensions that require length, width, and depth, while also possessing a soul. This soul nourishes, feels, moves by will, and can understand abstract concepts, learn crafts, and work without external hindrances, particularly from the human aspect. When all of these come together, it forms a single entity which is the human being. Thus, it is established that the essence of a human is not an accident, because accidents can change, but the essence remains. So, whatever remains constant in you is your soul, and whatever comes and goes are mere accidents. The specific aspect, which is suitable for those with discernment, subtle understanding, and correctness, is that when you are healthy, free from afflictions, protected from harmful desires and other obstructions, and your body parts do not touch each other and you are in an open space, in this state, you are always aware of your essence and your reality, even in sleep. Anyone with subtlety and wisdom knows that he is an essence, independent of matter and its connections, his essence cannot be separated from itself, the essence of understanding is an abstract nature for the knower, and its nature is abstract to itself, it doesn't need abstraction and peeling. This subtle point is precious and profound, and we will elaborate on it further, God willing. The proof of the authenticity of this specific explanation is that if what you perceive and feel was not essentially you, or your soul, but rather was the body and its accidents, it would either be the entirety of your body or a part of it. It can't be the entirety, as in the scenario mentioned, a person can be detached from the whole body while still perceiving themselves. If it were a part, it would either be external or internal. If external, it would be perceived by the senses, but the soul is not perceived by the senses. If the soul or essence was an internal part, like the heart or brain, this too is not feasible, as internal parts can only be reached through dissection. Thus, it's established that what you perceive is not any of these things. What you inherently perceive is not something sensed through mere observation. So, when it's proven that your essence is not among the things sensed or anything similar, then your soul is indeed an essence. Clarification from the perspective of perception. We say that you always perceive your essence. So, what do you perceive? There must be a perceiver. It must either be one of your external senses, your intellect, or some power other than your senses. If it's your intellect, then this perception either involves a medium or is based on analogy, or through a power that is intermediate between perception and the soul, or without any medium at all. I don't think you need a medium for this, because if there was a medium, you wouldn't perceive your essence. There is no medium between your essence and your awareness of it. Thus, the perception must be without a medium, and if so, then this perception is either through your senses or through your essence. It's inconceivable to be through your senses because the senses only perceive physical bodies and attributes related to them like colors, sounds, etc. Hence, you perceive your essence through your essence itself. From this, it's established that you are a distinct essence. This specific explanation is either overlooked or definitive, overlooked by those who are heedless, who only notice it with disdain. For those who observe with disdain, doubt comes to them faster than water to a thirsty person. But for those who are discerning, it's definitive. If someone argues that they only affirm their essence through a medium, and that medium is one of their actions, and they deduce the existence of the soul from their actions, the answer to this is twofold. First, this doesn't match our given hypothesis, because we have isolated you from actions. Still, your essence and nature are established. Secondly, this action either affirms it as an absolute action, which then requires you to affirm an absolute doer, which is your soul. And if you confirm it as your action and attribute it specifically, then you've already established and perceived your essence. For you've taken your essence as part of your action, and the perception of a part before perceiving the whole is at least simultaneous if not prior. Therefore, your essence is established with it or before it, not by it. And this distinction is subtle and forms the foundation of a noble branch of knowledge, as we will mention, God willing. 
the soul is an essence without dimension or quantity. It is stated that the soul does not have a dimension or a space, it is not perceived by senses nor is it recognized by a body, its perception does not depend on bodily instruments in any situation. This is more intricate and more challenging for minds that have deviated from the right path and are accustomed to imaginations and sensory entities. We aim to approach this purpose with definitive proofs and clear evidence. The first proof, it is known that we receive rational concepts and perceive things that do not fall within the senses or imagination. The rational is unified, and if it were to occupy something divisible, it would divide, but the unified cannot be divided. This impossibility becomes clearer when considering that if the soul had dimensions and a rational concept occupied it, that concept would either be in a divisible or an indivisible entity. It is known that what's indivisible is the tip of a line, which does not distinguish in position from the line or the dimension it's connected to. It's similar to how a point does not exist independently but is an intrinsic end to something with a dimension. If a point were isolated, accepting entities, it would have two aspects, one aligned with the line and one opposed. This leads to the implication that either the point has an infinite or finite presence in the line. Referring to a symbol of it, we can deduce that when two points coincide, they either have a median point separating them, making them divisible, which is impossible, or the median point doesn't separate them, rendering all points as one. This single point, separated from the line, makes the line separate from one end and connected at the other. Assuming that the rational image is in a divisible entity and considering its division, the parts either have to be similar or dissimilar. If similar, they would result in something defined by dimension and increased number, not the image. Therefore, every rational image is not just a shape, and consequently, the image becomes imaginary, not rational. It is shown by this that it cannot be said that each of the two parts is, in itself, the whole in meaning because if the second is not included in the meaning of the whole, we must place in the beginning for the meaning of the whole this one and not both of them. And if it was intrinsically different in its meaning, it is clear that neither of them alone indicates the same meaning of completeness, even if they are dissimilar. So, let's see how the rational image can have dissimilar parts, for the dissimilar parts can only be the parts of the boundary which are the genera and the divisions. From this, we deduce certain impossibilities, one of them being that every part of the body is also divisible, so the genera and divisions must be infinitely powerful. Yet it is true that the intrinsic genera and divisions of one thing are not infinitely powerful, because it is impossible that the illusion of division creates the genus and division, and from what we are certain of, if there's a genus and division deserving distinction, then the distinction does not rely on the illusion of division. Thus, the genera and divisions must also actually be finite, it's true that the genera and divisions or parts of the boundary of one thing are finite in every way. If they were actually infinite here, then the one body would be required to be infinitely divided in reality, and also the division occurred from one side, separating a genus from one side or a division from another side. If we changed the division, it would fall on the side of half a genus and half a division, or it would turn around and we assume that illusion takes the place of the genus and division in it, yet that also does not suffice, as we can impose a division within a division, and every rational can be divided into simpler rationals. Here, these rationals are the simplest rationals, and the principles of composition in all rationals, so they don't have genera or divisions, nor are they divided in quantity or meaning, like unity and cause and so on. Therefore, it is not possible that the parts assumed in it are similar parts, each of which is in the meaning of the whole, but the whole occurs only by association, and also it cannot be dissimilar, so it is not possible for the rational image to be divided, nor for a part of the quantities to be undivided, showing that the place of rationals is essence, not a body, and also not power in a body, as it follows the body in division, then followed by other impossibilities. The second proof, we say that mental power is the essence of abstracting rationals from the limited quantity, place, position, and all other bodily accidents. Therefore, we must look at the essence of this image abstracted from the position, how is it abstracted from it, by comparison to the thing taken from it, or by comparison to the taker, I mean this rational essence is abstracted from the position in the external existence, or in the imagined existence in the rational essence. It is impossible to be so in the external existence, 
so it remains only to be separate from position and place when it exists in the mind. So, if it existed in the mind, it would not be positioned, and in such a way that a sign of segmentation and division or something similar in meaning would apply to it, it cannot be in a body. The third proof, when an indivisible, unified form, which represents things that are indivisible in meaning, is imprinted onto a divisible material with dimensions, one of two possibilities must arise, either the form and none of its parts, as imposed by its dimensions, has a relation to the indivisible, immaterial intellect, or every one of its parts has that relation, or some parts have it while others do not. If none of its parts has a relation, then neither some nor all of them can possibly have a relation, thus, there should be no distinction between this intellect and another, which is not the case, as we find a necessary distinction. If some parts have a relation but others do not, then the part without relation is irrelevant in meaning. This would necessitate the single entity being both defined and undefined in relation to the two parts, which is impossible. If every part has a relation, then either each part relates to the entire intellect or to a part of it. If every imposed part relates to the entire intellect, then these parts are not really parts of the intellect's meaning but each one is an intellect on its own. If each part has a different relation to the intellect, then it's known that the intellect is divisible in meaning, which we have posited as indivisible, creating a contradiction. From this, it is clear that the form imprinted in the material can only be fragmented representations of things, with each part having an actual or potential relation, or a potential relation to a part of it. If it's argued that the confusion in this proof is saying that if the intellectual meaning relates to some of the entity, then the other part is irrelevant in the intellectual meaning, and we indeed say so, for what we perceive is a part that is indivisible, which is called the individual essence. We respond, you have two options, either you say the intellect relates to a divisible part or to an indivisible part. If its relation is to a divisible part, then if we divide, the intellect becomes divisible, and the first proof applies exactly. If you say it relates to an indivisible part, every part of the body is divisible, and we have proved that, there are geometrical proofs for this, which are not mentioned here. Fourth proof, if we were to say that the mental power, if it were to comprehend through a physical instrument, such that its action is only completed by utilizing that physical instrument, then it would have to not understand its own essence, and not comprehend the instrument, and not understand that it has understood. Because there isn't an instrument between it and its own essence, nor between it and its tool, nor between it and its understanding. But it understands its own essence, its tool, and the fact that it has understood. Hence, it comprehends with its essence, not with the instrument. Furthermore, it's either that its understanding of its instrument is due to the existence of the form of its instrument, or due to another form different from it, which is a form present in it and its instrument. If it's due to the form of its instrument, then the form of the instrument is always in the instrument. Hence, it has to constantly comprehend its always present instrument, for which it comprehends due to the form of the instrument. And if it's due to the existence of a different form, then the differences among things that fall under a single category are either due to differences in substances and accidents, or due to differences in what is general and what is particular, the abstracted from matter and the existence in matter. Here, there is no difference in substances and accidents, for the substance is one and the accidents are one. There isn't a difference here in abstraction and existence in matter, for both exist in matter, there is no difference in particularity and generality, for one of them only benefits from particularity due to the particular substance and what follows it in terms of the substance in which it exists. This meaning is not specific to one over the other. As for the essence of the soul, it constantly perceives its existence, without any physical entities with it. In it, it's not possible for the existence of another intelligible form other than the form of its instrument. This is more impossible, because when the intelligible form becomes the thinking essence, it makes it a thinker as long as that form is its form, or as long as that form is added to it. This intelligible form isn't the form of this instrument, nor is it the form of something added to it by its essence, because the essence of this instrument is a substance, and we only take and consider the form of its essence, and the substance in its essence isn't added at all. This is a great proof that it's not permissible for the perceiver to perceive the instrument which is its tool in perception. For this reason, 
the sense only perceives an external thing and doesn't perceive its essence, its action, or its tool, but if it imagines its tool, it imagines it not specifically as it is indispensable to it without anything else, but because the sensory returns to it the form of its tool if possible. Thus, it only narrates an imagination taken from the sense, not added to it, so if its tool wasn't like that, it wouldn't imagine it. The fifth proof, it is a composite of clear evidences and undeniable testimonies that fully confirm that the soul is not a body, nor does it occupy physical forms. We argue by saying that if the soul were a body, it would either be within the body or outside of it. If it were outside the body, how would it influence and interact with the body? How would the body be sustained by it? And how would it deal with intellectual knowledge in the heavenly realm, know the ultimate truth, travel in intellectual recognition, and understand abstract concepts? If it were within the body, it would either occupy the entire body or only a part of it. If it occupies the whole body, then if a part of the body were cut off, the soul should diminish or shift from one organ to another, expanding and contracting with the body. All of this is impossible for anyone with sound intuition and clear reasoning. If the soul were in a specific part of the body, that part would either actually or potentially be divisible, leading to the division of the soul until it is reduced to its smallest and most trivial part. This is evidently impossible. The soul, which is the seat of knowledge and the honor that elevates humans above all animals, is prepared to meet God Almighty. It is the entity addressed, rewarded, punished, and when purified, brings success, but when tainted, leads to failure. It is the essence of existence and the cream of creation in the spiritual realm. It remains after the body dies and, when adorned with knowledge, reaches eternal happiness, rejoicing in meeting God Almighty. Anyone with a semblance of reason knows that this essence cannot simply occupy the body, nor be a part of it, neither as a solid nor as a vapor nor in any other form. Furthermore, you know your soul remains consistent even when your body changes. If it were part of the body, it wouldn't require sustenance, for sustenance is the replacement of one part of the body with another. Thus, the soul is not part of the body or its attributes. If the human soul were merely an imprint in the body, its actions would weaken as the body weakens. However, the soul doesn't weaken even when the body does, proving it's not merely imprinted in the body. The evidence is observational, after the age of 40, while physical strength may decline, intellectual strength usually increases. As for those who believe that the soul forgets or becomes inactive during illness or old age, thinking its functionality is solely dependent on the body, their assumption is neither necessary nor accurate. After understanding that the soul functions independently, we must look for reasons when it seems inactive. It is possible for the soul to act independently and yet appear inactive during bodily illness without contradiction. The soul has two functions, one in relation to the body, like governance, and the other in relation to its own essence and principles, like reasoning. These two are opposing, if one is active, the other becomes passive, it's hard for the soul to balance both. The bodily concerns include sensation, imagination, desires, anger, fear, sadness, and pain. You realize that when you engage in deep thought, all these fade unless external factors dominate and force the soul back to them. You know that the senses oppose the soul from thinking, especially when they focus on the perceptible, without any harm or affliction affecting the instrument of reasoning or its essence. You are aware that the reason for this is the soul being preoccupied with one action over another. For this reason, the actions of the intellect are disrupted during illness. If the intelligible image was nullified and corrupted due to the instrument, i.e., the brain, then the instrument's return to its normal state would require new acquisition from the beginning. However, this is not the case. The soul can return to its full capacity, recalling everything it once knew. This indicates that all of this knowledge was with it, but it was just preoccupied and not accessing it. It is not only the difference in the soul's activities that results in conflicts in its actions. Even an increase in the actions from one aspect can cause this. For instance, fear makes one forget pain, desire distracts from anger, and anger diverts from fear. The reason for all of this is the same, the soul being wholly diverted to one thing. All of these are the powers of the singular soul, and it controls them. These powers are its subjects and soldiers, 
Therefore, it is not necessary that if the soul doesn't perform an action when it's preoccupied with something, it can't perform that action without that thing being present. We will not delve deeply into explaining this topic because this subject is one of the most complex aspects of the soul. However, once we have achieved adequate understanding, any further elaboration would be considered unnecessary and cumbersome. From the principles we have established, it is clear that the soul is not imprinted in the body, nor is it sustained by it. Hence, its relationship with the body must be one of management and direction, and Allah is the guide to the right path and the grand tour of success. Animal, Vital Powers The, animal, vital powers are divided into motive and perceptive. The motive power can either be the initiator of an action or the executor of it. The initiating power can either attract benefits or repel harms. The power that attracts benefits is what we refer to as desire. It is the force that, when an idea forms in the imagination perceived as good or presumed as such, prompts the active force to seek that benefit. On the other hand, the power that repels harm is termed as anger. It is the force that, when something perceived or assumed as harmful forms in the imagination, prompts an action to repel that harm or threat, often driven by a desire for revenge or dominance. As for the motive power in its capacity as an executor, it originates in the nerves and muscles. Its role is to contract muscles, pulling the tendons and ligaments connected to the organs towards their point of origin, or to relax them allowing tendons and ligaments to move in the opposite direction. This power is what we refer to as capability, while the initiating force is the will. To elaborate on this, any voluntary action that comes into existence doesn't do so until the messenger of capability, which is the meaning embedded in the muscles, arrives. The capability does not emanate from its abode, it remains at rest and in comfort until the messenger of the will, either the will to attract benefits or repel harm, reaches it. The will does not rise from its place until the messenger of knowledge comes to it. When this knowledge is confirmed, the will is summoned, and it finds no choice but to comply and submit. Once the will confirms the judgment, it summons the capability to move the organs. The capability has no choice but to comply and execute based on its command. When the capability confirms the judgment, the organs move, leaving no room for hesitation. As long as the messenger of knowledge is uncertain, the will remains uncertain. As long as the will is uncertain, the capability remains uncertain. And as long as the capability is uncertain, actions do not come into existence and are not manifested in the organs. However, once a decisive judgment is established, actions are realized. Increase in Realization Know that the voluntary movement which is a characteristic of the animal has a beginning, middle, and perfection. The beginning is the need of the deficient for perfection and the longing of the seeker. As for perfection, it is the attainment of the desired, and between them is the middle, which is the seeking behavior. Thus, the voluntary movements of the animal are actual spatial movements in different directions, based on knowledge, feeling, and demand, unlike the movements of plants. For when they were non-voluntary, they directed themselves in various directions without knowledge, feeling, or seeking good. Their movements are those of growth and wilting. The voluntary movements of humans are intellectual, verbal, and actual movements. Their different directions are unlike animal movements, as they lack two of them, the intellectual and verbal. The plant movement needs good care and pruning until it reaches its desired perfection, which is fruit and reproduction. The fruit is for the benefit of its person, and reproduction is for the benefit of its kind. Its existence in the universe does not lack partial benefit for its person, and total benefit for its kind. Animal movement also needs good care and utilization to reach its desired perfection, which is benefit in the form of burden, work, food, and tillage, and benefit for its kind in form of offspring and production. Its existence in the universe does not lack partial benefit for its person, and total benefit for its kind. As for human movement, it requires good care and responsibility with support, guidance, and definition. Intellectual movement involves truth and falsehood, so one should choose the truth over falsehood. Verbal movements involve truth and lying, so one should choose truth over lying. Actual movements involve good and evil, and one should choose the good over evil. 
This choice is only achieved through support, guidance, and definition. Support manifests its effect in actions, guiding manifests in words, and definition manifests in thoughts. These three levels are determined by the three higher levels, sometimes represented by supporting angels, sometimes by spiritual forefathers, and sometimes by letters and words in the higher realms. Just as plant movements need pruning, and animal movements need refinement, human movements also need discipline. The one who purifies his choices in his three movements from the flaws of falsehood, lying, and evil from every aspect is the one who has the right to say, my Lord has educated me, and he has perfected my education. He is the one who deserves to educate others, refine, purify, teach, and remind as per the saying of the Almighty, as we have sent among you a messenger from you who recites to you our verses, purifies you, teaches you the book and wisdom, and teaches you what you did not know. Perceptive Powers They are divided, in the first division, into two types, perceived from the exterior and perceived from the interior. The ones perceived from the exterior are divided into five types, which are the five senses, we will mention them and explain how they connect to the common sense. Know that the first of the senses, existing in animals and common to all animals, and is widespread in the body of the animal, is the sense of touch. It is a force spread throughout the animal's skin, flesh, veins, and nerves. Through it, one perceives heat and cold, wetness and dryness, hardness, softness, roughness, lightness, and heaviness. Its carrier is a subtle body in the neural network called a spirit, deriving from the heart and the brain. For it to perceive, the nature of the skin must change to be opposite to the perceived thing, like heat or cold, etc. Thus, it does not perceive anything unless it's colder, hotter, rougher, or softer than it. Such perceptions are rare. While there are various perceptions, they all rely on a single sense. Some say the sense of touch categorizes into four types of powers, one governs the contrast between hot and cold, the second governs wet and dry, the third, hard and soft, and the fourth, rough and smooth. This sense is the first to awaken in the soul. No part of the skin is devoid of the sense of touch, and no animal exists without it. The wisdom behind the tactile power is that divine wisdom, when necessitating an animal that moves by will composed of elements, and which isn't safeguarded from the harms of changing environments during movement, endowed it with the sense of touch. With it, the animal avoids unsuitable environments and seeks suitable ones. Following the sense of touch is the sense of smell. Since animals, like humans, cannot do without nourishment, and their acquisition of food is a conscious act, and since some foods may not be suitable while others are, they are endowed with the olfactory power. Thus, scents strongly indicate to the animal which foods are suitable. The sense of smell is a power located in the two protrusions of the brain, resembling the teats of a breast. Through it, various pleasant and unpleasant smells are perceived. Its carrier, too, is a subtle body in these protrusions, and the air, not just transporting the smell to the sense, transforms by proximity, as it changes by the proximity of heat or cold. The air, due to its subtlety, is faster in capturing sense than in capturing heat or cold. This power in animals is stronger and more prevalent. The first thing the fetus connects with after the sense of touch is the sense of smell. That's why mothers avoid unpleasant smells and shouldn't smell food unless they eat it, to prevent any harm to the fetus. It's thought that ants can smell a grain, and thus they leave their home, search for it, and find it, even if it's behind a wall. This is not just mere intuition but a power in a sense. How can it not be when what sort often has no smell? Many express feelings using the term smell, as in the saying, souls are like conscripted soldiers, those who recognize each other come together, and those who don't remain apart. Here, recognition refers to sensing. The sense of taste is also a leading sense that identifies agreeable and disagreeable tastes. It is a power situated in the nerve lining the body of the tongue, recognizing the flavors of substances that come into contact with it, mixing with the fresh moisture present, it takes on the flavor of substances and might transform into it, or transform it into itself. Whenever a flavor connects with that nerve, the nerve perceives it. This sense follows the sense of smell and connects to the fetus after the power of smell, appearing in the fetus at birth, causing it to move, move its tongue, and lick itself. As for the sense of sight and its benefits, 
when a willful animal moves towards places like fire sources or away from places like mountain tops and seashores, it may harm itself. Therefore, divine care necessitated giving most animals the power of sight. This power is situated in the hollow nerve, recognizing the images imprinted on the icy moisture, of colored phantoms of bodies reflecting on transparent bodies onto the surfaces of glossy bodies. Do not assume that something detaches from the colored object and reaches the eye, nor that a beam detaches from the eye and extends to the colored object. However, an image occurs in the prepared glossy surface, conditioned by specific facing and mediation of the transparent. When the image is formed in the icy moisture, it leads to the hollow nerve containing a subtle body, just like when an image falls on still water, it leads to the meeting point of the two tubes connected to the eyes at the front of the brain. The common sense then perceives one unified image from the two combined images, otherwise, we would see two things, because the image in the icy moisture would be two images. Since the icy moisture is spherical, and what faces the surface of the sphere only faces its center along imagined lines extending from the surface to the center, wherever the distance between the observer and the observed is closer, the lines are more, the conical shape from them to the center is shorter, and the angle is larger, and wherever the distance is longer, the lines are fewer, the conical shape from them to the center is longer, and the angle is smaller. This is why distant objects appear smaller and closer objects appear in their actual form. As for the sense of hearing, it is a power situated in the nerve dispersed on the surface of the eardrum, recognizing the form conveyed to it by the vibration of the air compressed by a strike or hit. A violent compression produces a sound that travels to the trapped stagnant air in the cavity of the eardrum, moving it in the same manner of its movement. Different wave contacts stimulate that nerve, conveying it to the common sense. It is said that this nerve is laid at the far end of the eardrum, stretch like skin on the drum, but it's as delicate as spider silk and as tough as tanned leather. It is said that they are nerves like the strings of a lute, spread on the sides of the ear cavity, and these strings move with the movement of the stagnant air within it, producing a resonance. This resonance follows the arrangement and sequence of letters and sounds, their variations in pitch, lightness and heaviness, sharpness and thickness. Just as light is essential for vision, air is essential for hearing. Hearing perceives from the circumference of a circle, while vision sees along a straight line. These straight lines emerge from the circumference and reach the center of the rounded sphere. Some assume that these lines are rays emitted from the sight to the base or images captured from the base to the sight, but both these views are incorrect, as we mentioned. The auditory power follows the visual inutility. The reason for its utility is that harmful and beneficial things can be deduced specifically from their sounds. Thus, divine providence necessitated the placement of the auditory power in most animals. However, the utility of this power in the speaking species of animals almost surpasses the other three. As for the internal perceptive powers, they are initially divided into three categories, those that perceive but do not retain, those that retain but do not reason, and those that perceive and act. Perception can either be of the image or the meaning, while retention can be of the image or the meaning. Action at times is about the image and at times about the meaning. Perception may be primary without an intermediary, or it might be through another perceiver. The difference between the image and the meaning is that, in this context, by the image we mean what the external sense perceives, and then the internal sense perceives without any involvement of the external sense. These are the general classifications of perceptions. As for their details and the affirmation and areas of their existence, the perceiver of the image is the common sense, also called fantasia and its storehouse is the imagination. The perceiver of the meaning is the estimative power, and its storages are memory and recall. The one that perceives and reasons is the rational power, while what does not reason is what we mentioned of illusion and sensation. As for their affirmation, it is according to sensation, the affirmation of the common sense is that you see a descending line as straight, and the rotating point quickly as a circle, all by sight, not by imagination. If the perceiver was the external eye, it would see the diameter as it is, and the point as it is, because it perceives only the opposite descending, which is not in a line. So we knew that there is another force in which the shape of what it saw is imprinted. Before that form fades, others follow, so he sees it either as a straight line or as a circle. 
The evidence for this is that if the point is rotated quickly, you will see separate points. So, you have a force before sight, the sight delivers to it what it observes, there, sensations gather and are perceived. Similarly, a person feels that when he sees a person or hears a word, the observer perceives one person, and the heard perceives one word. In the eye, there is not two people, meaning two images in the eyes, and two words in the ears, so he knew for sure that the place of perception is something behind the eyes and ears. The perceiving force for them is one force where the two images, meaning the apparitions in the eyes, meet in agreement, and the two perceived, meaning the seen and the heard, differ. This force gathers the similar and the different, hence, we called it the common sense because the self can only perceive with this force. We called it the tablet because sensations only gather in this force. Its function is only perception, but imprinting and preservation are for another force. One of its characteristics is to recall sensations, in the senses or not, then perceive them again. Among its properties is that it perceives personal particles without intellectual generalities, and it feels pleasure and pain from imaginations just as it feels pain and pleasure from external sensations. As for the description of the imaginative power, we know that when we see something and leave it or it disappears from us, its image remains in us as if we see it and look at it. It preserves the likeness of sensations after they fade. With these two powers, you can judge that this taste is for the creator of this universe, and the owner of this universe has this taste. The judge with these two judgments cannot judge unless what is judged is present for him. As for the description of the illusory power, speaking and non-speaking animals perceive from sensory personal individuals unsensory partial meanings, such as the sheep perceiving that this wolf is its enemy. Hostility and love are unsensory, and they judge them as they judge the sensory. So we knew this is for another power, the illusory power in humans has special rulings, some of which are for the soul to deny the existence of things that do not imagine or imprint in imagination, like intellectual jewels that are not in a space or place. Some of it is to prove the void surrounding the world, and some of it agrees with the demonstrator in delivering premises then opposes him in the result. It has been said that the illusory power is the main ruler in the animal with a judgment not continuous like intellectual judgment but with imaginative judgments associated with partial things and sensory images. Most animal actions emanate from it. As for the explanation of the retaining power, we know that when we grasp partial meanings, they don't completely elude us, we remember and recall them with the slightest contemplation. We know that these meanings have a keeper that preserves them, as long as they remain in it, that's the retaining power. If they fade and then are retrieved, that's memory. The relation of the retaining power to meanings is like the relation of the imaging power to perceivable images in the common sense. Regarding the power of imagination, we know that we can perceive an image and then dissect, assemble, add to, or subtract from it. We can perceive a meaning and attach it to the image. This operation is distinct from the powers previously mentioned. This power naturally functions in a structured or unstructured manner. The soul uses it in whatever manner it desires. If it weren't so, it would be a mundane, uninteresting natural phenomenon. Otherwise, humans wouldn't learn various crafts, fascinating engravings, and structured writings. They'd be stamped to one action like the rest of the animals. The soul uses this power in composition and detailing, sometimes according to practical reason and sometimes speculative reason. In essence, it assembles and dissects without being perceived. When the soul uses it in an intellectual matter, it's called thinking. If it continues its natural function, it's called imagining. The soul perceives what it assembles and dissects from the images by means of the common sense and what it assembles and dissects from images by the power of illusion. As for the locations of these powers, know that these are corporeal powers, so they must have a specific corporeal place and name. The common sense's tool and location is the infused spirit at the beginning of the sensory nerve, especially in the front of the brain. The imaging power, also called imagination, has its tool in the spirit infused into the first ventricle of the brain, but towards its back end. The illusory power's location and tool is the whole brain, but it's especially associated with the middle ventricle, particularly its back end. The imaginative power reigns in the first part of the middle ventricle, as if it's an intermediary power between illusion and reason. As for the remaining powers, which are memory and retention, 
they rule in the space of the spirit in the last ventricle, which is their tool. People have been guided to believe that these are the tools and that they differ in location due to the differences in powers. Corruption, when specific to a ventricle, leads to defects therein. Then, consider the necessity and the wisdom of the wise creator to prioritize the corporeal over the spiritual, to place the governing entity in them both, and to draw analogies from both sides in the middle, exalted be his power. The power specific to the human soul. Regarding the human rational soul, its powers can also be divided into an active power and a cognitive power. Both these powers are termed as intellect though they share the same name. The active power is the initial force that drives the human body towards specific actions based on certain viewpoints exclusive to it. It is related to the animal instinctual power and to the animal imaginative and illusory powers. It also has a relation to itself. Its relation to the animal instinctual power is that it can produce within it human-specific conditions, predisposing the individual towards rapid actions and reactions, such as embarrassment, modesty, laughter, crying, and similar emotions. Its relation to the animal imaginative and illusory powers is that it employs them in deriving measures for existing and decaying matters, and in extracting human crafts. Its relation to itself is that, along with the theoretical intellect, it produces commonly accepted notions like, lying is ugly, oppression is ugly, truthfulness is good, and justice is beautiful. In summary, all details of the Sharia, Islamic law, are elaborations of these commonly accepted notions generated between the theoretical and practical intellect. This power should dominate over all the other bodily powers, according to the rules of the power mentioned, so that the body does not react to it at all, but it reacts to the body and remains subdued beneath it. This ensures that the body doesn't develop submissive dispositions derived from natural matters, which are termed as moral vices. Instead, it should remain completely non-reactive and undominated, hence possessing moral virtues, although it's possible to attribute morals to the bodily powers too, if they are predominant, they manifest active conditions, and for this, reactive conditions. Hence, one thing can induce a trait in this and a trait in that. If they are subdued, they manifest reactive conditions, and for this, active conditions are not uncommon. The character is essentially one but has two attributes. But, upon scrutiny, morals truly belong to this power, because the human soul, as it appears, is one essence and relates to two sides, a side beneath it and a side above it. For each side, there's a power that establishes its relationship, this active power is the one that, in relation to the side beneath it, which is the body, manages it. And as for the theoretical power, it is the power that is relative to the side above it, to be affected and benefit from it, and accept from it. Thus, the soul has two facets from it, one facet towards the body, and this facet should not be affected at all by the inherent nature of the body. The other facet is towards the higher principles and the actual intellects. This facet should always accept and be influenced by them, completing the soul's perfection. Therefore, the theoretical power is for the completion of the soul's essence, and the practical power is for the governance of the body and its management in a way that leads to theoretical perfection. To him ascend the good words, and the righteous deeds raise them up. Quran. As for the theoretical power, it is a power whose role is to imprint with the universal forms abstracted from matter. If it is abstract in itself, then that's it, but if not, it makes them abstract by abstracting them, until there remains in it no trace of material links. This will be clarified later. This theoretical power has a relation to these forms, in that something which can accept something may be potentially accepting or actually doing so. Power is described in three senses, in order of priority and posteriority. Power is called the absolute readiness from which nothing has emerged in action, nor has anything happened by which it emerges, like the power of a child to write. Power is also described for this readiness when nothing has been obtained except what can lead to acquiring action without intermediaries, like the power of a boy who grew up knowing the inkpot, pen, and basics of letters to write. And power is described for this readiness when it is completed with a tool, and also when the readiness is complete so he can act whenever he wants without the need for acquisition, he merely needs to intend, like the power of a skilled writer when he doesn't write. The first power is called the absolute potential power, 
The second power is called the possible and owned power, and the third is the completion of power. So, sometimes the theoretical power's relation to the abstract forms we mentioned is like the absolute potential, especially when this power for the soul hasn't accepted anything from its perfection yet. At that time, it is called the potential intellect. This power, called the potential intellect, exists for every individual of the species, but equally, and in it there is arrangement and differentiation, in which there is a difference of opinion among the wise. It was named Hyalanic as an analogy to the primary matter, Hyal, which in its essence has no form among forms, but is receptive to all forms. Sometimes it's referred to in terms of potentiality, when the Hyalanic has achieved from the primary intelligibles, which lead to the secondary intelligibles. By primary intelligibles, I mean the premises that are believed in without acquisition, nor does the believer feel that he could ever abstain from believing in them, such as our belief that the whole is greater than its part or that things equal to a common thing are equal to each other. These are what are termed as necessary sciences, so, when this intellect has only achieved this much, it is called potential intellect or possessive intellect. It might also be called active intellect in relation to the first. It can be stronger, having acquired theoretical intelligibles, allowing it to reach secondary intelligibles. It can also be in terms of perfecting power, having also acquired intelligible forms after the primary ones, but not actively contemplating them, instead, they are stored. So, whenever he wishes, he actively contemplates and understands these forms, which is why it's called active intellect, he understands whenever he wishes without the need for acquisition or effort. However, it can also be termed potential intellect in comparison to what comes after. Sometimes it's in absolute actuality, when the intelligible form is present and actively contemplated. Then, it becomes a beneficiary intellect, which is the holy intellect. It's termed beneficiary because it will be clear that the potential intellect only becomes active due to an ever-active intellect. When the potential intellect connects in a certain manner, it gets imprinted with an external form, becoming beneficial. These are the levels of powers termed as theoretical intellects. With the beneficiary intellect, the animal species and human species are perfected. Here, human power is likened to the primary principles of all existence. More explanation on the holy beneficiary intellect will come in the prophethood section. Explanation of the differences in opinion on the Hyalanic intellect, which is absolute readiness. Know that philosophers differ on this readiness, whether it's identical in all individuals of a species or different. A group argued that it's identical in this readiness, but differences arise due to the utilization of this prepared matter in one science over another. When it becomes active, differences manifest. A group argued that the readiness is different based on the variations of the temperaments, and what emerges into action from them is only according to that readiness. Their ruling is not like that of the primary matter, Heil, in that it's receptive to all forms. The primary matter is receptive to the primary form, which is corporeal, and it's identical in all bodies. Then, through it, it accepts form after form based on its composition of the second form and the second Heil. For this reason, the primary matter doesn't have existence in its essence without the primary form, nor does the absolute body exist unless it's air, earth, or something else. The matter here is different because the soul has a verified existence and readiness for that existence, so it must be different according to the variations of the subject. Even if it is said that the human soul is similar in kind and that is accepted, there's no doubt that it's different in individual and essence according to the variations of the distinguishing accidents. Thus, the readiness in the Hyalanic intellect differs according to that. The soul only flows from the principles according to the readiness, so the more balanced the temperament, the nobler the soul. To this is added the influences of the planets and celestial bodies. Thus, just as the soul, even if united in kind, has distinctions and levels among them, the readiness also is ranked according to the nobility of the soul. There may be a prophetic soul so refined that it almost illuminates like oil, untouched by fire, and there may be a foolish soul that does not reflect upon thought for a moment. This view is stronger and closer to the methodologies of the religious law. Levels of Intellect from the Divine Book Know that God Almighty mentioned these levels in a single verse, saying, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. 
The example of his light is like a niche within which is a lamp, the lamp is within glass, the glass as if it were a pearly, white, starlit from, the oil of, a blessed olive tree, neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil would almost glow even if untouched by fire. Light upon light. Allah guides to his light whom he wills. And Allah presents examples for the people, and Allah is knowing of all things. Quran 24:35. The niche, Mishka, is a metaphor for the potential intellect, al akl al hayulani Just as the niche is prepared to have light placed in it, the soul by nature is prepared to receive the light of intellect. Then, when it gains minimal strength and obtains the beginnings of intelligible concepts, it becomes the glass, Zujaja. If it reaches a level where it can comprehend intelligible matters through correct thought, it becomes the tree, since a tree has branches, and likewise, thought has various disciplines. If it becomes even stronger and reaches a sovereign level where it understands matters through intuition, it is the oil, sight. If it becomes even stronger such that its oil almost shines on its own, and it understands matters as if directly observing them, it becomes the lamp, misbah. Then, when it grasps the intelligible matters, it is light upon light, the light of the acquired intellect upon the light of the natural intellect. These lights are derived from the cause of these lights in relation to them, like a lamp in relation to a vast fire that layers the earth. This fire is the active intellect that sheds the light of intelligible matters upon human souls. If this verse is taken as a metaphor for prophetic intellect, it is permissible, because it's a lamp lit from a blessed, divinely commanded, prophetic olive tree, neither of natural eastern origin nor human western origin. Its oil almost shines with the light of innate nature even if untouched by the fire of thought, a light from the lordly command upon the light of the prophetic intellect. God guides to his light whom he wills. Convergence of reason and divine law, and the mutual dependence of both on one another. Know that reason cannot find guidance without the divine law, and the divine law cannot be elucidated without reason. Reason is like the foundation, and divine law is like the structure built upon it. A foundation is of no use without a structure, and a structure cannot stand without a foundation. Moreover, reason is like sight, and divine law is like the light that illuminates it. Sight is useless without external light, and light is of no value without sight. Hence, the Almighty said, There has come to you from Allah a light and a clear book by which Allah guides those who pursue his pleasure to the ways of peace and brings them out from darknesses into the light, by his permission. Furthermore, reason is akin to a lamp, while divine law is the oil that fuels it. Without oil, a lamp cannot function, and without a lamp, oil cannot produce light. In relation to this, God mentioned, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, and continued with light upon light. The divine law is external wisdom, while reason is internal wisdom. Both are complementary, even convergent, because the divine law is seen as external wisdom. God stripped the term reason from the disbelievers in several verses of the Quran, like when he said, they are deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will not understand. On the other hand, since reason is internal wisdom, God described it as, the fitra, natural disposition, of God upon which he has created, all, people, no change should there be in the creation of God. That is the correct religion. Here, reason is termed as religion, being complementary, it said, light upon light, meaning the light of reason and the light of divine law. Furthermore, the Almighty said, Allah guides to his light whom he wills, he made them one light. Without reason, divine law would be obscured, just as light fades without sight, and reason, without divine law, would be impotent in many matters, just as the eye is impotent without light. Know that reason alone is quite limited. It can grasp the generalities of a matter without understanding its specifics. For instance, it can comprehend the importance of having a righteous belief, speaking the truth, performing good deeds, etc., without understanding them in detail. On the other hand, divine law understands both the generalities and specifics and clarifies what must be believed. In summary, reason cannot grasp the details of the ordinances of divine law. At times, divine law confirms what reason has determined, or it alerts the heedless and provides evidence so they recognize the truths of knowledge.
It also reminds the wise and educates about the details of the afterlife. The divine law is a system of correct beliefs and righteous actions. It guides towards the benefits of this world and the hereafter. Whoever deviates from it surely loses the right path. God pointed to the grace and mercy of reason and divine law, saying, If not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, you would have followed Satan, except for a few. Here, a few refers to the chosen and the righteous. The reality of perception and its levels in abstraction. Know that perception takes the form of what is perceived, or in other words, perception assumes the true essence of something and not its external reality. For the external form doesn't represent the perceived but rather an example of it. The sensed reality isn't the external one, but what is represented in the sense. The external is what the sensed was extracted from, and what is sensed is what occurs in the state and is felt. Its sensation only has meaning in its occurrence and its impression. Similarly, the intelligible is the example of the reality portrayed in the soul, as the mind abstracts it from all accidental and extraneous attributes, especially when abstraction is needed. As for the levels of perceptions in abstraction, first know that a perception which requires abstraction will never lack extraneous accidents and overpowering symptoms in the external existence, such as quantity, quality, location, and position. For example, the human has an essence as a rational living being. This essence is generic to all individuals of the species. In existence, this essence isn't specific or generic without extraneous accidents. For if a human were generic, he wouldn't be a specific individual, and if he were specific, he wouldn't be a generic human because of his individuality. Once you understand this, know that the levels of perceptions differ in abstraction from these overpowering symptoms and accidents. They are on four levels. Sensation, it abstracts to a certain degree. The image doesn't exist in the sense as it is but rather an example of it. However, this example only exists when the external has a specific quality and distance, and it can be sensed with that form and position. If it is obscured or hidden, it can't be perceived. Imagination, its perception and abstraction are more complete. It doesn't need direct observation but perceives even in absence. However, it perceives with those accidents and overpowering symptoms of quantity, quality, etc. Illusion, its perception and abstraction are more complete than the previous ones. It perceives meanings abstracted from the accidents and symptoms of physical bodies, like enmity, love, opposition, and agreement. However, it doesn't perceive absolute enmity or love, but partial enmity or love, as in knowing that a wolf is an enemy and flees from it, or that a child is a friend and is affectionate. Intellect, this is the complete abstraction from all overpowering symptoms and all accidents of physical bodies. It moves beyond perceiving physical accidents like quantity and quality and all bodily symptoms. It perceives a complete meaning that doesn't differ with individuals, whether they exist or not, whether they are near or far. It penetrates into the realms of the kingdom and dominion, extracting realities from them and abstracting what isn't from them. This is if the perceiver requires abstraction. If he is free from physical accidents and purified from his attributes, he is self-sufficient and doesn't need to act upon it, but perceives it as it is. Questions and their respective distinctions containing precious knowledge. The first question. If it is said, you previously mentioned that the soul can possess a pure predisposition towards the intelligible, and also mentioned that anything abstracted from the bodily attachments is, in essence, an intellect. I see these as contradictory. If the soul is abstracted, then it's already intellectual, and if it's not abstracted, then it's not intellectual. If you say that it is intellectual, but doesn't perceive the intelligible due to being occupied with the body, then how can the body be both a servant aiding it in many aspects, as well as a tool assisting it in reflecting and organizing thoughts, and at the same time be an obstacle? We reply, not every abstraction, in any form, is an actual intellect, meaning that intelligibles aren't instantly acquired by it. Complete abstraction is when the material world doesn't influence its existence or its characteristics in any way. As for your point about how the body can be both an aid and an obstacle, this isn't implausible. A thing can aid in one context and hinder in another. The body may assist the soul in many aspects, as will be elaborated upon. 
but it may also obstruct it in many ways, especially when overwhelmed by desires and bodily tendencies, or when occupied with external and internal senses. The second question. If it is said, it has been said that when the intellectual form is realized in the soul, its potentiality doesn't cease, and it's known that potentiality and actuality cannot coexist, we reply, this is a fallacy and a deception. Potentiality exists relative to what hasn't been realized, not what has. The intelligibles we attain are not finite and don't come all at once, especially when the soul is preoccupied with the body or with the conditions accompanying the body. They are acquired to the extent they are learned and to the degree that they are illuminated by the guidance of God and the lights of His mercy. Indeed, the state and readiness of the soul can vary. Some souls are like oil that illuminates even without fire, grasping vast intelligible concepts not limited to a single instance, experiencing a continuous and sequential outpouring of knowledge. Others reflect deeply but don't often return to reflection voluntarily, and some are in between. Within these categories, there are countless distinctions and levels. Among these, people differ in their elevation, rank, honor, and proximity to God Almighty. Third question. It is known that the soul perceives rational concepts through an angelic power named intellect, which bestows rational concepts onto the human soul. This connection happens via the reflection of images in the imagination, meaning by thought, sight, and the arrangement of premises. This only happens when the body and imagination are intact. So, when imagination ceases with death, how can the soul connect with it to receive the truths of rational concepts? especially when you said that the body is a barrier. Thus, when separated from the body, how can the soul view and continuously connect with these rational concepts? We say, know that souls are diverse. A radiant soul, free from obscurities, sparkles with the lights of knowledge, supported by God, penetrates intuitions, sharpens the intellect, and doesn't require thought or sight. Rather, it receives from the higher realms whatever rational concepts it wishes, fully proven, to the extent that it seems overwhelmed by these concepts. This impression from the rational comes to the sensory and imaginative, conversing in suitable parables. This soul, while in the confines of the body, is as if it has purified itself and connected with the sacred realm. For it, whether it departs the body or remains in it, it utilizes the body, not the other way around. This is the prophetic, holy intellect. Another type of soul connects to knowledge and truths of rational concepts through the body and its strengths, acquiring knowledge through imaginative premises. This only happens as long as it is cloaked in the body. When it departs the body and becomes independent and has achieved utmost readiness, it no longer needs imagination or thought, rather, they become a hindrance. Fourth question. If it is said that the soul perceives imaginary forms while in bodies, and the soul, when separated, neither aligns with nor parallels bodies, how can this be? We reply, the issue arises if one assumes these are physical, imaginary forms, but if perceived abstractly, there's no problem, your point that the soul, being separate, and the forms being physical is true, however, it's known that there's an intellectual relationship between the soul and the body, where one affects the other, for example, when the soul remembers divine aspects, the body gets goosebumps. Similarly, the soul is influenced by bodily states like anger, desire, and sensation. Thus, when the soul views imaginary forms in an appropriate manner, it is affected by them and this influence indicates that it can receive the desired mercy from God. Fifth question. It is known that the soul understands rational concepts in an organized and detailed manner. However, it's been said that what understands organized and detailed rational concepts isn't purely simple, and it's proven that what grasps concepts, however it may be, is abstract without any division. Therefore, the soul is either a material image, making it physical, and should not grasp rational concepts, or it's an independent abstract, making its understanding not detailed or organized. There's no middle ground. We say, you are right. The soul perceives rational concepts detailed and organized, and whatever perceives detailed and organized concepts is not purely abstract, relative to some concepts, its potential, containing both active and potential elements. Only God is the true one, 
with no anticipation in his essence or attributes. Anything other than him is somehow composite, even if intellectually it isn't physically or imaginatively composite. Sixth question. If it's said, when the soul achieves an intellectual image, it summons that image, does it need another perception? That it has perceived or achieved the abstract intellectual image? We reply, no, the perception itself is the attainment of the abstract image by the soul. If it has attained it, it has perceived it. There's no intermediary, and no need for another perception, else it would be an infinite regression. Question 7. If it is said, the soul, in acquiring the intelligibles, turns to the thinking power, using it to order premises and deduce conclusions. This only occurs in wakefulness when it is attentive, while during sleep, the imaginative faculty is suspended, and similarly after death. So how can the intelligible be achieved afterward? We replied, first, it is not certain that the thinking power ceases during sleep, or that the soul is inactive at that time. In fact, often the soul dominates the imaginative faculty, especially when it is free from the distractions of the senses, forcing it and using it for its purposes. Thus, many intelligibles are revealed in sleep. Yes, the majority of the time during sleep, the imaginative faculty dominates and doesn't obey the soul, it finds the common sense vacant, so it imprints images on it. That's why most dreams require interpretation. Then, the soul might need the thinking power for intelligibles. However, someone with strong intuition and a clear soul might acquire intelligibles initially. If he does not acquire them initially and feels an intense desire to obtain an intelligible, they will pour onto him. If he is incapable at that point and doesn't possess the intuitive or divine power, he then resorts to thinking and using imagination to deduce the intelligible. Question 8. If it is said, it has been stated that the soul perceives abstract universal meanings and perceives itself even though it is particular. How can this be? We replied, it perceives the abstracts from the appendages of bodies and accidents of matter, whether they are universal or particular. And as for yourself, even if it's particular, it's abstracted from the properties of bodies. You feel yourself, but you only perceive your physical self with a bodily instrument. As for your soul, it's not physical. The perception of your soul by yourself is nothing but the realization of its truth. Its abstract truth is evident to it, and this is not duplicated, its reality is singular, not duplicated. We have explained that the meaning of the intelligible is only the abstract realization for the knower. Not every intelligible that is realized by something, whatever its state, is an intelligible. It is with an additional condition, which is to be abstract. By saying our reality is evident to us, we do not mean our existence, for existence applies to everything. From this arises a profound insight, the undeniable truth unique to us, which other animals do not share, is that our abstract essence is not manifest in them. By our essence, we do not mean merely our existence, in relation to itself. Rather, we emphasize the nature of its existence and its property of being conceivable. For the essence of the soul does not vary, it remains one and the same, without multiplicity. Therefore, the soul's existence is not based merely on its conceivable nature but is rooted in the intrinsic essence of its existence, which is unique to itself and none other. This is the most sublime understanding I possess on these subjects. To truly grasp this, one must deeply contemplate and internalize it, for truths require intimate understanding and internal reflection. Once the soul comprehends, it quickly believes. This section necessitates the understanding of all divine attributes, because his attributes are all considered additional, conditional, and negative, and they do not add to his essence nor imply multiplicity in his essence. The ninth question. If it's said, if reasoning means that the knower grasps the essence of the known, then we can grasp our divine intellect and intelligences in their true forms. Every one of them then has two realities. Why is it not permissible for our essences to have two realities as well, yet here it is allowed? We say, if we can understand the distinctions in their true forms within our souls, they have two realities, a reality in themselves, as they are distinct and a reality imagined within us, as representations and examples of those truths. 
Knowledge about essences are not themselves essences but exist as conditions in minds and as actual entities in their own right. Furthermore, we are conscious of our own existence, and our consciousness of it is nothing but its reality manifesting directly to us without intermediaries. If we claim to understand our essence and mean anything other than this direct manifestation of reality, it is merely a hypothetical grasp, suggesting the reality would be understood if we were to reason about it. Any form of understanding, whether it's reasoning or sensing, is an observation of the thing's reality, not as an external entity. If perceptions were external entities, then non-existent things wouldn't be conceivable. However, they exist within us. Observing isn't creating a second existence but merely reflecting it within us, or else it leads to an infinite regress. However, to elaborate, we say, we observe their realities in a manner resembling sensations, as is customary. Upon close inspection, even the sensations are observations of their realities manifesting within us, making the external entities observable. The tenth question. If someone says, I believe that we perceive our own essences, but it has not yet been clarified whether it is permissible to understand through a physical instrument or not. Is the intellectual power within a body or not? Why can't we have an intellectual power in the body that is perceived by the imaginative power? Just as the intellectual power perceives the imaginative power, the essence of the intellectual power does not arise for itself but for another, just as the imaginative power is not realized for its own essence but is analogous to the intellectual power. We say, within us, there is a power through which we understand universal concepts and another through which we perceive particulars. The power with which we perceive universals perceives what is perceived by universals, call this whatever you like, but we name it intellectual power. It does not cease to either be a sensation or intellectual perception. As for intellectual perception, its obligations are known. As for sensation, you only sense your essence with your essence, not with any of your powers. If you sensed your essence with some of your powers like sensing, imagining, or supposing, then the sensed would not be the sensor, and you, with your sensation of yourself, feel that you are sensing yourself. Therefore, you are both the sensor and the sensed. Furthermore, if the sensor of yourself is a power other than you, it must either exist within yourself or in a body. If it exists within yourself, then your existence is due to your own power, which turns back onto itself with that power, existing not for another. If that power exists in a body and your essence doesn't reside in that body, then the sensor would be that body with that power for something distinct, and there would be no sensation of your essence directly and no perception of your essence specifically. It would just be a body sensing something other than itself, as you sense your body. However, perceiving the essence with a physical power is impossible. If your essence, with that power, resides in that body, its impossibility is evident because both the essence and its power would exist for another. Thus, the essence, with that power, would neither perceive its own essence nor that body, for the essence and power exist together with that body. If the essence of the soul and the power by which it perceives are the same, they do not separate. The eleventh question. If someone asks, how do we know that our sensation of our essence is our understanding of it? Perhaps it is another perception that doesn't require that the essence of ourselves is realized for us. It could just be an effect of some kind resulting from our essence. That effect is not the essence's reality. So, it's possible that we have a reality of existence from which an effect arises for us. We sense that effect, but the effect isn't the reality, so our essence doesn't arise for us through our essence. We said, whoever does not conceive the truth of his essence does not understand its nature, and cognition is but the realization of the truth of a thing as it is perceived, which is the meaning of a thing in relation to its term. And when he says, we experience an effect and feel that effect, it must either mean that feeling is the very occurrence of the effect or something that follows the occurrence of the effect. If it is the very occurrence of the effect, then his saying, we feel that effect is meaningless, it is just another name and an equivalent expression. If feeling is something that follows it, then it's either the realization of the essence of the thing or something else. If it's something else, then feeling is the acquisition of what is not the essence and meaning of the thing. And if it is the same, the essence of the self requires, in order to achieve its essence, 
another effect by which the essence of the self achieves that effect, it is not affected but composed. If the essence of the self is achieved secondly by another condition of abstraction or removal of some conditions that accompany it or in addition to it, then what is understood is that which is in another condition, and our discourse on the essence and its substance remains constant in both cases. Twelfth question. If someone says, you have mentioned that the hindrance to cognition is matter and preoccupation with the body, what is the evidence that the hindrance is matter and that it is confined to it? We replied, whoever truly knows the rational self knows that the hindrance is matter, this is because the essence in which the realities of things are manifested is the substance abstracted from the coverings of bodies and has nothing potential in it. The true nature of every such essence is that it is affected but does not react to foreign coverings. If it's affected by a foreign covering, it is because of the matter, as matter is what gets covered by externalities and contingencies. Therefore, whatever is rational is essentially abstracted from matter, does not react, is not affected, and has nothing potential in it, everything that exists for it is instantaneous. Thirteenth question. If it's said, what you have mentioned undermines a great principle, for the course of this discourse implies that our soul is a material substance, for it is known to accept intelligibles bit by bit, and it is affected and reacts to foreign coverings. If it were not a material substance, it would be appropriate for it not to be affected and for the intelligibles to occur instantly to it. It is known that the matter is otherwise. We said, you have missed a subtle point. We have stated that whatever is rational is actualized in its essence and does not react. This is a general cause, and its opposite would be a partial cause. This means that some of what is actualized in its essence and does not react can be rational. It is not necessary that our soul be a substance that is actualized in essence, free from the contingencies of matter and the properties of bodies. Indeed, it accepts intelligible forms progressively because in many intellectual matters, in most souls, it requires the assistance of the body. The body does not always cooperate or align with its purpose, so its goals and desires become fragmented. If the body does cooperate momentarily, it is like a fleeting lightning, followed by distractions that cloud its thinking and spoil its moment. We ask God for support, guidance, and direction towards the right path. Question 14. If it is said, you've mentioned that if your essence is actualized for you, then it is intelligible for you, the evidence for this is that the essence is either actualized for someone else or not, if it isn't actualized for someone else, it must be for you. But what do we know? Perhaps it is actualized neither for someone else nor for itself. We responded, this is a level between negation and affirmation with no intermediary. If your essence was not for you, you wouldn't say my essence or myself, because if it were for someone else, it wouldn't accept this attribution. Delving deeper into this, which is a profound secret and a gateway to vast knowledge, is that every pure reality does not exist as determined without contingencies that determine it. Hence, by its reality, it is one thing, but in terms of its contingencies, it's another. Overall, when you consider the reality with its contingencies, it is something. So the essence's reality in itself is something without any conditions, but in terms of being determined, it is something else. Therefore, there is otherness that accepts attribution and relation. God is the guide. Question 15. If it is said, you mentioned that the soul has a dominion by which it can grasp intelligibles. If this dominion by which it perceives intellectual forms is a power incidental to the soul, then the soul is composite. You've established the argument that it is singular and not composite. Hence, the argument that it does not perish with death becomes invalid. And if it isn't an incidental power but rather a completion, then in terms of its effects, it is affected, and in terms of its actions, it reacts. Then what is the proof that it is not an incidental power and that it is a completion? And how can this question be resolved if it is a completion? We said, know that the soul in itself is an essence that is not composite in nature. When taken with that inherent power, completion comes from the outside, hence, it does not affect or be affected, nor does it act or be acted upon. It's as if this completion imprints forms onto the soul's essence, thus, the soul imagines itself to be complete and through this power, 
it is capable of accessing other logical forms. This power is inherent, neither foundational nor incidental. Question 16. If it is said, you have proven through argument that the soul is distinct, how then does it benefit from the body and what is within it, such as the senses and imagination? How does it acquire knowledge through the power of imagination and attain virtues or vices through physical strengths? How do acts of devotion and persistence in worship influence enlightenment and purification? How do sins and indulgence in desires result in darkness that affects the soul, negating its inherent preparedness? We said, this is a noble question, and distancing oneself from it is nobler. Giving a definitive answer is difficult, the true way to understand it is through intuition and true knowledge. By nature, the soul is predisposed to knowledge, and knowledge is acquired gradually. Hence, thought and imagination must be utilized, as we've mentioned before, and as we will mention later about how the soul benefits from strengths. As for the effect of obedience and disobedience in enlightenment and darkening, it's because the happiness and perfection of the soul lie in its inclination towards truth, turning away from senses, immersing in the divine path, and being continually illuminated by the divine light. Anything that diverts it from this state detracts from its stature, the soul's distance from the divine magnificence and its distraction by worldly desires blocks divine lights from it. The more it is rooted in logical matters, the closer it is to happiness. The soul has closeness and distance, its closeness is measured by knowledge and virtue attainment, and its distance by ignorance and vice acquisition. This elucidates the secret behind the illuminative effects of following Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in his movements, stillness, sayings, and actions. Following him greatly enlightens the heart. For the heart to be illuminated by truths, it must be polished and balanced. It's polished by orienting to the divine and turning away from desires, balanced by good character in accordance with the Prophet's traditions, and enlightened by remembrance and acts of worship. The most powerful evidence of this is personal experience and intuition. Anyone who doesn't approach this with knowledge or intuition should still believe in it as it's a level of faith. May God grant success. The Origin of Virtues and Vices Know that most virtues and vices originate from three powers within a human, the power of imagination, the power of desire, and the power of anger. These three are both enablers and inhibitors for the soul. Enhanced Insight As for the imaginative power, it has two aspects, one relates to the sensory side and receives from its sensory images, whether they are perceived truly or metaphorically. In truth, the image in the mind is as it is in reality. Metaphorically, it is like an image that is not in its true form, but is perceived as such, such as a mirage, an echo, or a stationary object perceived as moving, and the imagination imagines it as such. The second aspect relates to the rational side and accepts rational images, whether they are perceived accurately or falsely. The accurate is like the image that is true in its form, while the false is like the image that is not in its true form but is perceived as such, like misconceptions, delusions, magic, and fortune-telling. Minds often deviate from the straight path, perceiving wrong as right and right as wrong. Hence, it's said, show us the truth as truth and grant us following it. One should not rely on these perceptions unless they are weighed against logical principles and clear proofs. Furthermore, images might fall into the imagination all at once, like a mirror reflecting another mirror, capturing an image instantly. This is true if the image appeared to the visual sense. As for the sounds perceived by the auditory sense, they are captured sequentially and gradually based on the sequence of letters and words. On the rational side, rational concepts might appear all at once, like opposing mirrors. This is because knowledge is etched in the essence of celestial souls. When the human soul connects with them, images are captured based on its clarity and readiness. Further explanation on this will come later in the discussion on prophecy and messages. If this is true, it's considered divine inspiration, intuition, or insight. In divine inspiration, one sees the image of the angel, in intuition and insight, one doesn't. If it's false, it's considered magic, fortune-telling, or divination. It might occur sequentially and gradually based on the deductive premises. If it's certain, it's considered a proof or argument. If it's popularly praised among people, it's rhetorical. 
If it's to challenge an opponent, it's dialectical. If it's an evident lie, it's sophistical. If it's imaginative, it's poetic. Then, if the imaginative faculty is dominated by sensory perception, every abstract concept is likened to a tangible one. But if the intellect prevails over it, every tangible thing is likened to an abstract concept. The imagination of the prophets, peace and blessings be upon them, sees in the tangible the abstract meaning, which stems from it, refers back to it, or is attributed to it. They might see a person in this world and judge him as an apple from paradise, or a person whose hand was severed in the way of God and is given wings to fly within paradise, or a person killed in the path of God who lives and sustains, delighted and gratified by the bounties bestowed upon him by God. Conversely, they may see from the abstract a tangible form or from the spiritual a physical form. For instance, this is Gabriel who comes to teach you the matters of your religion and manifests to you as a perfectly formed man. Also, due to the illuminative power of their imagination and the light of their spirit, they illuminate others who match them in that capacity and preparedness, allowing them to see as the prophet, peace be upon him, saw. Thus, imagination serves as a bridge between the two worlds, a barrier between the two seas, and a junction between the two domains. Without it, neither the tangible nor the abstract would remain accessible to man, and neither the image nor the meaning would be perceived by sensory or rational faculties. The imaginative power is not uniform across people but rather varies, at times even opposing. There are imaginations suited for spiritual beings like angels, who descend upon and manifest themselves to such individuals, influencing and embodying within them. This person might then speak with their words and they with his tongue, see through their eyes and they through his, hear with their ears and they with his. These are angels who walk the earth with tranquility, indeed, those who say, Our Lord is Allah and then remain steadfast, the angels will descend upon them. Quran 41:30. In contrast, there are imaginations that align with devils and evil spirits, who descend upon and manifest to such individuals. When they manifest, the person might speak their words and they his, see through their eyes and they his, hear with their ears and they his. These are the devils among mankind, wandering the earth inflamed, shall I inform you upon whom the devils descend? They descend upon every sinful liar. They pass on what is heard, and most of them are liars. Quran 26-221-223, wherever there is rectitude in imagination, it is the abode of angels, and wherever there is distortion, it becomes the dwelling of devils. As for the appetitive power, it also has harm and benefit, and it is more difficult to reform than all other powers, because it is the earliest in existence in a person, it is the most tenacious, and the most dominant. For it is born with him, and it is found in him as well as in the animal which is his kind, even in the plant which is like his kind's kind. Then there is the protective power that is found in him, and lastly, the power of thought, speech, and discernment is found in him. And a person does not become outside the category of beasts and the bondage of desires except by killing the desires or by suppressing and crushing them, if he cannot kill them, for they are what harm him and disgrace him and hinder him and divert him from the path of the hereafter and discourage him, and when he suppresses or kills them, he becomes a free, pure person, nay, divine, lordly, so his needs decrease and he becomes rich beyond what others possess, and generous with what he holds, and benevolent in his dealings. And as for its benefit, it is that this desire, whenever it is disciplined, it leads to happiness and the vicinity of the Lord of glory, so if it were imagined to be abolished, it would not be possible to reach the hereafter, and that is because the reach to the hereafter is through worship, and there is no way to worship except through worldly life, and there is no way to worldly life except by preserving the body, and no way to preserve it except by replacing what decomposes from it, and no way to replace what decomposes from it except by consuming food, and it is not possible to consume food except by desire. Also, the world is the farm of the hereafter, and the establishment of the earth and the arranging of livelihood by this desire, so if it were imagined to be abolished, the order of religion and worldly life would be disturbed, and transactions would be lifted among people, and the law and policy would be lifted, so this appetitive power is like an enemy whose harm is feared in one way and whose benefit is hoped in another way, and despite its enmity, it cannot be dispensed with assistance, 
so the wise person ought to take its benefit and not rely on it nor depend on it, except to the extent that he benefits from it, and how true in this respect is the saying of al Mutnabi. And from the miseries of the world for a free man is to see, an enemy to his ambitions in the guise of a friend, and from the windows of tricks in suppressing this desire, that he should overpower the desire with the force of protection, until it is suppressed and does not lean towards the vileness of morals and their lowliness, just as the way to suppress anger and its nature is to overpower the force of anger with the cunning of desire, until it breaks its ferocity or its excess, for it is led by the prospects of gains and the incidents of needs, and from the way in dealing with excess desire until it breaks it thoroughly, is to read the virtues of eating less from the narratives and traditions, and to understand the benefits of eating less in terms of purifying the heart and igniting the intellect, and piercing insight and accommodating thought that leads to knowledge, and enlightenment with the realities of truth and the tenderness of the heart and its purity, which by it he becomes ready to perceive the pleasure of intimate conversation and to be affected by remembrance, and from the humbleness and humility and the disappearance of arrogance, joy and happiness and vanity which is the beginning of tyranny, and the heedlessness of God Almighty, and that he should not forget God's trial and punishment and not forget the people of the lands. One of the benefits of eating less is to curb the desires that lead to sins, and to control the self that is inclined to evil. Among the benefits of eating less is to push away sleep, to stay awake longer, and to make it easier to be consistent in worship. Another benefit is the health of the body and warding off illnesses that can be an obstacle to worship and disturb the strength of thought. Among its benefits are having lighter burdens and embodying the value of contentment and independence from people, which is the essence of sincerity and honor. Also, it enables altruism, generosity, and charity towards orphans and the poor. In summary, the key to asceticism, purity, and piety is eating less and suppressing desires. The key to worldliness and the door to desiring it is the excessive indulgence in desires according to nature. This desirous strength has two branches, one is the desire of the stomach, and the other is the desire of the genitals. The desire of the stomach is for the individual's own survival, and the desire of the genitals is for the continuation of his progeny and species. But these desires can lead to calamities that destroy both religion and worldly life if they aren't controlled, subdued, reined in with piety, and restricted to moderation. If it weren't for these desires, women wouldn't have such influence over men, and women wouldn't be the snares of Satan. All immorality comes from these desires if they are excessive, and all scandals come from them if they are too lethargic, like impotence and effeminacy. The commendable state is for these desires to be moderate and obedient to reason and religious law in their expansions and contractions. No matter how excessive they become, they can be tamed by hunger, marriage, lowering the gaze, neglecting them, and by occupying oneself with knowledge and acquiring virtues. As for the anger-driven strength, it is a flame ignited from God's blazing fire that only manifests in the hearts. This force is dormant in the heart like fire under ash, and arrogance can extract it from the heart of every stubborn tyrant, just as fire can be extracted from iron. It is clear to those with insight that there's a connection between man and the cursed Satan. Whoever's anger is ignited has strengthened his connection with Satan, as he said, you created me from fire and him from clay. The nature of clay is to be calm, passive, and accepting, while the nature of fire is to blaze, burn, move, be restless, rise, and reject. The outcomes of anger include malice, envy, and many other negative traits. Its source is a piece of flesh that, if it becomes good, the entire body becomes good. In this strength of anger, excessiveness leads to destruction, and negligence falls short of commendable qualities like patience, forbearance, passion, and bravery. From moderation, most of the commendable qualities arise, such as generosity, self-respect, endurance, forbearance, steadiness, chivalry, and dignity. Triggers for anger include pride, vanity, jesting, mockery, insult, deception, intense greed for unnecessary wealth and status. All of these are condemned traits, both religiously and logically. To be free from anger while these triggers remain is impossible. So, it's essential to remove these triggers with their opposites to control anger and return to a state of moderation. This applies both sensibly and logically. Mothers of Virtues 
The virtues, though they are numerous, can be encompassed by four that cover their branches and types. These are, wisdom, courage, chastity, and justice. Wisdom is the virtue of intellectual power, courage is the virtue of the spirited power, chastity is the virtue of the appetitive power, and justice is about these powers being in their rightful order. Through justice, all matters are perfected, and thus it is said, by justice, the heavens and the earth stand. Let's delve into these foundational virtues and what stems from them and falls under their categories. As for wisdom, we mean what God Almighty magnifies in his saying, and whoever is granted wisdom has indeed been granted abundant good. And what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, intended when he said, wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wisdom is associated with intellectual power. It has been previously established that the soul has two powers, one facing upwards, which receives the truths of universal necessary and theoretical sciences from the higher realm. These are certain truths, eternal and everlasting, that do not change with different eras or nations, like knowledge of God Almighty, His attributes, angels, scriptures, messengers, various creations, His management of His dominion, conditions of appearance and return, and the conditions of the hereafter including happiness and misery. In general, all the truths of sciences, the second power faces downwards, referring to the body and its governance. Through this, the soul perceives goodness in actions. This is called the practical intellect, and by it, one governs the powers of their soul and the people of their home and country. The name wisdom is metaphorically assigned to this power because its knowledge is like mercury, unstable and changing according to different circumstances and individuals. For example, giving away money is a virtue, but it might become a vice at certain times and for certain individuals. Thus, the primary meaning of wisdom is more appropriate, even if the latter is more popular. The latter is a perfection and completion of the former. The former refers to theoretical scientific wisdom, while the latter is practical wisdom. By practical wisdom, we mean a state and virtue of the rational soul that governs the spirited and appetitive powers, adjusting their motions to their necessary contractions and expansions. Its knowledge about correct actions and management of worldly affairs, derived from the theoretical intellect. The theoretical intellect is inspired by the universal angels, while the practical intellect is inspired by the particular theoretical intellect and governs the body according to divine law. This is analogous to the intellect, soul, and celestial bodies. The intellect perceives universals and has no power, the soul perceives universals from it and, by these universals, understands particulars, which move the heavens and thereby produce the elements and their compounds. Similarly, our intellect receives universals from angels, which flow to the practical intellect. The practical intellect, through the body and imaginative power, perceives the particulars of the physical world and moves them according to divine law, leading to the formation of noble character traits. This ethical virtue is surrounded by two vices, cob, deceit, and bala, folly. As for deceit, it is the extreme excess of this virtue, a state in which a person becomes crafty and cunning by excessively indulging in anger and desire, causing them to act more than necessary. As for folly, it is the shortfall of this virtue and a lack of moderation, a state in which the soul underperforms in its anger and desire, failing to act as required. Its origin is slow understanding and a lack of comprehensive knowledge about proper actions. Under the virtue of wisdom full good management, clarity of mind, insightful opinion, and accurate assumptions, the vice of deceit encompasses cunning and audacity, while the vice of folly includes recklessness, stupidity, and madness. Courage is the virtue of the angry strength, powerful in its protectiveness but still obedient to the reasoned mind educated by the religious law showing when to act and when to refrain. It stands between two opposite vices, rashness and cowardice. Rashness is the excess over moderation, a state in which a person recklessly engages in dangerous matters which reason dictates should be avoided. Cowardice, on the other hand, is the deficit, a state in which the strength of anger retracts more than necessary, avoiding action where action is due. Whenever these characters are present, such actions emerge, from cowardice comes undue hesitation, and from rashness comes misplaced boldness, both are condemnable traits. From courage arises the proper boldness and restraint, as and when needed, and this is the praiseworthy trait.
It is referred to in the Quranic verse, severe against disbelievers, merciful among themselves. Not every instance of severity or mercy is commendable, but what conforms to the standards of reason and religious law is. If someone naturally leans towards cowardice, they should force themselves to act courageously, practicing until it becomes second nature. If one inclines towards rashness, they should remind themselves of the consequences and the dangers of their actions and force themselves to restrain until they return to moderation or something close to it. Achieving true moderation is challenging, if it were easy, the soul would not be attached to the body and would not feel regret over missing out, nor would its joy be clouded by the glimpses of the beauty and majesty of the truth. But due to this challenge, it is said in the Quran, there is not one of you but will pass over it, hell, this is an absolute decree of your Lord. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, said, the chapter of Hud and its sisters have turned my hair grey. He referred to the verse of God, so remain on a right course as you have been commanded. Indeed, maintaining a straight path, seeking moderation between extremes, is challenging. It is finer than hair and sharper than a sword, as described regarding the path in the afterlife. Whoever remains straight in this world will be straight in the hereafter. Indeed, a person dies as they have lived and is resurrected in the state they died. That's why in every unit of the prayer, we recite the chapter of al fatiha which contains, guide us to the straight path. It's the most noble and challenging thing for a seeker. If this was only for one characteristic, it would be burdensome, so imagine when it's for all manners which are countless, no one can be saved from these risks without God's grace and mercy. Hence, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, all people are lost except those who have knowledge, and all those with knowledge are lost except those who act upon it and all those who act upon it are lost except those who are sincere, and those who are sincere are in great danger. We ask the Almighty God to guide us past the dangers in this life and not to be deceived by delusions. Then, under the virtue of courage, come generosity, assistance, self-worth, tolerance, forbearance, firmness, nobility, chivalry, and dignity. Under the vice of recklessness, come extravagance, audacity, ugliness, rage, arrogance, and self-conceit. Under the vice of cowardice, come meanness, betrayal, low spirit, panic, inconsistency, frailty, and degradation. Chastity is the virtue of the lustful strength, and it means easily submitting to the intellectual power. It has two vices, excessive desire and lethargy of desire. Excessive desire is when lust is exaggerated to pleasures which the intellectual power dislikes and prohibits, while lethargy is the lack of arousal for what the mind requires. Both are reprehensible, while chastity which is moderation is commendable. One should monitor his desires, especially regarding private parts, food, wealth, leadership, and love for praise. Excessive indulgence in these is a deficiency. Perfection lies in moderation, and the criteria for moderation are intellect and religion. For instance, Knowing the purpose of food is to replace what is lost from the body's parts due to innate heat, so the body stays alive and the senses remain sound. This allows achieving knowledge and realizing the truths, when one recognizes this, they eat to sustain worship without indulging in it, being moderate without being overtaken by excessive desire. He knows that the desire for intimacy was created in him, to prompt him to engage in intimacy, which is the cause for the continuation of the human species. He seeks marriage for offspring and chastity, not for play and pleasure, although deriving pleasure and playfulness from it leads to harmony and attraction, fostering good companionship and the sustainability of marriage. He limits the number of marriages to an extent that he doesn't neglect their rights, and whoever understands this finds it easy to limit himself. In this context, one should not compare himself to the Prophet, peace be upon him, as he was not distracted by multiple marriages from the remembrance of God the Almighty. He wasn't obliged to seek worldly means for the sake of marriage. Whoever believes that what doesn't harm the prophet won't harm him is like someone thinking that what doesn't pollute the vast ocean doesn't pollute a cup of water drawn from the ocean. How many fools deceive themselves, comparing themselves to him is like comparing angels to blacksmiths, leading to their own ruin without realizing. We seek refuge in God from the blindness of insight. All of this is the wisdom of chastity. As for what falls under the virtue of chastity and its vice, the virtues of chastity include modesty, forgiveness, patience, generosity, 
good judgment, tranquility, decorum, discipline, contentment, calmness, piety, eloquence, assistance, and good appearance, I mean the obligatory adornment that has no ostentation. As for the vices that fall under the two defects of chastity, which are excessive desire and lack of desire, they include, insolence, malice, wastefulness, inadequacy, showing off, restlessness, stinginess, indifference, frivolity, avoidance, irritability, sloth, envy, and schadenfreude. As for justice, it is a state of the three powers, arranged proportionately and hierarchically, ascending with submission. It is not a mere part of virtues, but rather encompasses them, just as a praiseworthy arrangement between a ruler, his soldiers, and his subjects is manifested by a just and powerful ruler, strong and obedient soldiers, and weak and easily governed subjects, it is said that justice prevails in the land. Justice cannot be established if only some possess these characteristics and not all. Similarly, justice within the dominion of the body relies on these traits. Inevitably, justice in personal ethics results in justice in dealings and governance, branching from it. The essence of justice is an admirable arrangement, whether in ethics, rights in dealings, or in parts that maintain the land's stability. Justice in dealings is a balance between the vices of deceit and mutual deception. It's about taking what is rightfully yours and giving what is due, while deceit is taking what is not yours, and mutual deception is giving in dealings without praise or reward. Justice in governance is arranging the parts of the city analogous to the arrangement of one's soul, so the city is harmoniously structured, its parts in proportion and its pillars cooperate for the desired collective purpose, like a single entity. Every aspect is appropriately placed, and the inhabitants are divided into those who serve without being served, those who are served without serving, and a class that both serves and is served. Similar divisions exist within the soul's faculties. Justice is only surrounded by the vice of oppression, its opposite, there's no middle ground between arrangement and disarrangement. By such order and justice, the heavens and the earth were established, making the entire universe like a single person, with its forces and parts cooperating and arranged in precedence. Such is the decree of the most powerful, the all-knowing. The explanation of this order is from the purely spiritual to the purely physical and everything in between. The world is divided into influencing entities that are not influenced, like intellects, influenced entities that do not influence, like bodies, and entities both influenced and influencing, like souls. All of this is by the decree of the Almighty, all-knowing, justice encompasses all virtues, and its opposing oppression encompasses all vices. May God guide us to the straight path, the middle way between excess and negligence. Achieving this completeness brings one nearer to God, as close as the nearest angels. All creation yearns for its possible perfection, its ultimate goal. If attained, it joins the horizon of the world above, but if deprived, it descends to the depths below. Humans either achieve perfection and come closer to God, at par with angels, which is their happiness, or they succumb to the vices common with animals, descending to their level and facing their demise. May God protect us from such a fate by His grace. Mentioning the connection to the Creator The connection to the Creator, may He be glorified and exalted, is the origin and foundation of all connections because He is the true Sovereign. From his connection comes forth the connection to the angels, his messengers, and the connection to the apostles, who are the mediators of his messages and the conveyors of his laws. Hence, it is imperative to firmly establish the connection with him through continuous remembrance and sincere devotion to his presence, which is a sign of the servant's love for his Lord. This, indeed, is the secret behind God saying, So remember me, I will remember you. Quran 2-152 Moreover, strengthening this connection with frequent prayer and contemplation of his verses and his signs in the universe will undoubtedly lead to a connection with him that is pure and untainted by the defects of nature or the disturbances of thought. This connection, undoubtedly, is the spirit of worship and the essence of servitude, for worship without the presence of the heart is like a body without a soul. The heart's presence with God in worship and acts of obedience is the life of faith and its perfect completeness, just as the heart's absence is the death of faith and its obliteration. Hence, 
the servant must exert in every prayer and every chant a conscious effort to turn to God with his heart and soul, ensuring that no part of his heart is heedless or absent, even for a moment. This is indeed a great matter, for it is the heart that God looks at and by it, he judges the servant. For the heart to be with God, one must eliminate what occupies it other than him. It must be void of everything so it can be filled with God's remembrance, and this cannot be unless the heart is freed from the shackles of worldly life and its ornaments, as well as the whims of the self and the deceptions of Satan, which constantly aim to cut the connection between the servant and his Lord. The servant must, therefore, be alert and guard against these dangers that threaten his faith and connection to his Creator and among the things that help in strengthening the connection and assisting the heart in its turning to God is occupying oneself with knowledge that brings one closer to him and the company of righteous people, for they are the ones who guide to his pleasure. The servant should also follow the footsteps of the prophets and the truthful, who are the best examples in this connection. Additionally, he must continuously supervise his heart and his actions, hold himself accountable before the sunset of life, and before the dawn of the hereafter, when there will be neither trade nor friendship nor intercession. It is then the righteous will be saved, and the transgressors will have lost, and God is the guardian of success. The Example of the Heart and the Sciences Know that the example of the heart, which is the director of the spirit for all the limbs served by all the powers and organs, in addition to the realities of knowledge, is like a mirror to the images of colored objects. Just as an image of a colored object and its likeness are imprinted in the mirror, and become present in it, similarly, for every piece of knowledge there is a reality, and that reality is its image, which is imprinted in the mirror, I mean the mirror of the heart, and it becomes clear in it. And just as the mirror is one thing, the image of the person's is another, and the occurrence of its likeness in the mirror is yet another, these are three matters and they require a fourth one, which is light, by means of which the image is disclosed in the mirror and becomes visible. Similarly, here are four matters, the heart, the realities of things, the occurrence of the imprint of these realities in the heart and their presence in it, and light, by means of which the realities are disclosed in the heart. In religious terms, this light is represented by Gabriel, peace be upon him, and in the terms of the philosophers, it is represented by the intellect, by means of which knowledge is bestowed upon human spirits. The scholar is like the heart in which the likeness of the realities of things resides, and knowledge is like the occurrence of the likeness in the mirror, and the fire and the ray are like the angel entrusted with bestowing knowledge upon human hearts. And just as images are not disclosed in the mirror for five reasons, the first is due to the deficiency of its form, like the essence of iron before it is rotated, shaped, and polished, the second is due to its filth, rust, and cloudiness, even if it is complete in shape, the third is due to its preparation for something other than the image, such as when the image is behind the mirror, the fourth is due to a veil placed between the mirror and the image, the fifth is ignorance of the direction in which the sought image lies, which hinders matching the direction of the image with its counterpart, likewise, the heart is a mirror prepared to manifest the reality of all matters, and yet the hearts are empty of them for these five reasons. The first one, a deficiency in its essence like the heart of a child, for the realities of knowledge do not manifest in it due to its deficiency or like a spirit deficient in its innate nature, for while souls may be of one kind, there is a great disparity and a wide range within this type. The second reason, is the turbidity of sins and the filth that has accumulated on the heart due to excessive desires. Indeed, this prevents the clarity and purity of the heart, thus hindering the manifestation of truth within it, like the sun that is partially or completely eclipsed, causing its light and splendor to vanish in proportion to its darkness. To this points the saying of the prophet, peace be upon him, whoever approaches a sin, intelligence departs from him and does not return. That is to say, a turbidity occurs in his heart whose effect never vanishes, because the utmost he can do is to follow it with a good deed that erases it. If a good deed is done without a preceding sin, the benefit of the good deed is lost, but the heart returns with it to the state it was in before the sin without any increase. Thus, turning towards obedience to God the Almighty and turning away from the dictates of desires is what polishes and purifies the heart, and therefore, God the Almighty says, and those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways, Quran 29:69, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, 
He who acts on what he knows, Allah will grant him knowledge of what he does not know. The third reason, is being preoccupied with other than the sought truth. Even if the heart of the obedient and righteous is pure, the clear truth does not manifest in it, because it does not seek the truth nor aligns its mirror towards what is sought. Rather, it may be engrossed with the details of physical obedience or preparing the means of livelihood and does not turn its thought to contemplation in the divine presence and the subtle truths. It will only uncover what it contemplates, whether the intricacies of the faults in deeds and the secrets of the self's defects, if that's what it contemplates, or the benefits of living if that's what it contemplates. If the preoccupation with acts of obedience and their details prevents the unveiling of the clear truth, then what about the diversion of thoughts towards worldly pleasures and desires, their ties and decorations? How could that not prevent the revelation of the hidden? The fourth reason, is the veil, for the obedient who subdues his desires and dedicates his thought to a truth from among the truths, that may not be revealed to him, because it is veiled by a preconceived belief in the opposite of the truth from childhood by way of imitation, and good assumption prevents that from revealing the truth of the truth in his heart, preventing the unveiling in his heart of anything contrary to what he has conventionally assumed. This is also a significant veil that has obscured most theologians and those who are fanatically adherent to their doctrines, and even most of the righteous who contemplate the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, because they are veiled by conventional beliefs that have solidified in their souls and settled in their hearts, and have become a barrier between them and grasping the truths. The fifth reason, is ignorance of the direction from which the sought after can be found. For the seeker of knowledge cannot attain knowledge of the unknown except by recalling the sciences that suit his quest until he remembers them and organizes them in himself in a particular order known to the scholars, thereby extracting his quest through the method of analogy and deducing the unknown from the known that proceeded, and this is the logical rule. Indeed, logic is a legal mechanism, protected by its adherence, from leading one astray and thought. When one judges by the laws and methods of reasoning, then one finds the way to the sought knowledge, and the reality of what is sought becomes apparent to the heart. The desired sciences are not innate, needing no effort in deduction, contemplation, and consideration, but can only be captured with the net of the acquired sciences. Every theoretical science is obtained only from two preceding sciences that combine and couple in a specific manner and in a known form from the formal shapes, be it categorical or conditional, connected or separate, resulting in a third science called the conclusion upon its realization, and the sort before its realization. Ignorance of those matters, of those premises, and of the manner of their coupling and arrangement that leads to the sort, be it in concept or belief, is what prevents knowledge. Just as a mirror, if it is not aligned with the half of the image, the image does not appear in it, and likewise, if it is distorted from the direction of the image. In capturing sciences, there are wonderful methods, intricacies, and subtle distortions that are more amazing than what we mentioned with the mirror, and it is rare for one with simple knowledge to guide to the manner of trickery in those intricacies. These are the causes that prevent hearts from knowing the realities of things, otherwise, every heart by nature is suitable for knowing the truths, although there is a great variation among them, because it is a divine and noble matter, as we have mentioned, that distinguishes it from all other substances of the world with this feature and honor, and to it refers the saying of the Almighty, Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and feared it, but man, undertook to, bear it, Quran 33:72, indicating that man has a unique characteristic by which he differs from the heavens, the earth, and the mountains, with which he became capable of bearing the trust of God Almighty. This trust is knowledge and monotheism, and every human heart is originally prepared for the trust and capable of it, but the mentioned causes deter it from rising to its burdens and achieving its actualization. Therefore, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, every newborn is born upon the fitra, natural disposition, then his parents make him Jewish, Christian, or Magian. And the saying of the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, were it not for devils hovering over the hearts of the sons of Adam, they would look at the kingdom of heaven, referring to some of these causes, which are the veil between the heart and the kingdom. And in the tradition, God Almighty said, My earth and my heaven do not contain me, but the heart of my believing, gentle, and submissive servant does. And in the tradition, it was asked, Who is the best of people? He said, 
Every believer with a feverish heart, it was asked, what is a feverish heart? He said, it is the pious, the pure one, without deceit, injustice, malice, or envy. That is why Umar, may God be pleased with him, said, my heart has seen my Lord if the veil has been lifted through piety. And when the veil is lifted between him and his heart, the image of the kingdom and the heavenly realm is revealed in his heart, and he sees a paradise whose width is the heavens and the earth or even broader, for although paradise is vast and its corners are far flung, it is finite. As for the world of the kingdom, which is the knowledge of truths and secrets that are absent from the sight of the eyes specialized in visual perception, it is infinite. Certainly, what appears to the heart from it is an immense amount, yet it is in itself, in addition to the knowledge of God, the exalted, infinite. The entirety of the realms of the kingdom and the sovereignty, when taken all at once, is called the divine presence, for the presence encompasses all that exists, since there is nothing in existence except God, his actions, his kingdom, and his servants among his actions. Thus, what manifests to the heart from this is paradise itself to some people, and it is the reason for deserving paradise according to the people of truth, and the extent of his kingdom in paradise is according to the extent of one's knowledge, and by how much of God, his attributes, and his actions have been manifested to him. Indeed, the purpose of obediences and the actions of the limbs are all for purifying the heart and cleansing and clarifying it, and the purpose of its purification is the attainment of the lights of knowledge within it, which is meant by his exalted statement, so whoever Allah wants to guide, he expands his chest to, contain, Islam, and by his exalted statement, is one whose chest Allah has opened to Islam, so he is in a light from his Lord. Yes, this has ranks among which scholars and sages differ, and each has a known measure, and its ultimate degree is that of the prophets whose hearts shimmer with the lights of truths, and to them are unveiled the secrets of the kingdom and the sovereignty in the purest revelation and clearest expression, may God grant us to follow them in all their actions, states, and morals. Examples of the heart with its soldiers, and it has three parables. First, we say the example of a person's self in his body is like a king in his city and his kingdom, for the body is the kingdom of the self, its world, its abode, and its city, and its powers and limbs are like the craftsmen and workers, and the rational power of thought for it is like the advising minister and the wise vizier, and the desire for it is like a mischievous slave who brings food and provisions to the city, and the anger and pride for it is like the chief of police, and the slave who brings the provisions is like a lying, cunning, deceitful, and wicked individual who takes on the appearance of an advisor, but under his advice is immense evil and deadly poison, and his habit and custom are to contest the advising minister in every plan he devises, so much so that he does not refrain from contesting and opposing him in his views at any moment. Just as the governor in his kingdom, when he consults in his arrangements for his minister, disregards the indications of the wicked slave, rather, he infers by his indications that the correct course is contrary to his opinion and disciplines his chief of police and entrusts him to his minister, and makes them commanded by him, with authority over this wicked slave and his followers and supporters, so that the slave becomes commanded not commanding, and ordered not ordering, the affairs of his city become upright and justice is established because of him. Similarly, the self, when it relies on reason and disciplines the force of anger and imposes it over desire, and seeks assistance from one of them against the other, sometimes by reducing the excesses of anger and its severity with the allure of desire and its enticement, and sometimes by suppressing desire and subjugating it by imposing the force of anger upon it and by making its demands appear vile, its powers become balanced and its morals become good, and whoever deviates from this path is like the one about whom God, the exalted, said, have you seen the one who takes as his God his own desire, and Allah knowing, him as such, left him astray, and said the exalted, and he followed his desire, so his example is like that of a dog, if you chase it, it pants, or if you leave it, it, still, pants. And we have mentioned how to discipline these soldiers in the previous section. The second example, the body is like a city, and the intellect, I mean the perceptive power, is like a sovereign who manages it. Its perceptive powers, including the external senses and the internal feelings, are like its soldiers and aides, and its members are like its subjects. The commanding soul that incites evil, which is desire and anger, 
is like an enemy that contests its kingdom and seeks to destroy its subjects. Therefore, his body becomes like a fortress and a frontier, and his soul is like a resident garrisoned within. If he struggles against his enemy and defeats and overthrows him as is required, his efforts will be praised when he returns to the metropolis, as Almighty God says, indeed, God prefers the Mujahideen, those who strive, with their wealth and lives over those who remain, behind, by degrees, Quran 495. However, if he neglects his frontier and fails to care for his subjects, his deeds will be condemned, and he will face divine retribution upon meeting God Almighty. He will be told on the day of judgment, O bad shepherd, you ate the meat and drank the milk, but you did not fetch the lost nor mend the broken. Today, I will take vengeance on you, as is related in the traditions, and to this struggle they refer when they say, we have returned from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. The third example, the intellect is like a skillful hunting knight, his desire is like his horse, and his anger is like his dog. When the knight is skillful, his horse well trained, and his dog disciplined and trained, he is worthy of success, but if he himself is foolish, his horse unmanageable, and his dog lame, then neither will his horse charge at his command, nor will his dog be released at his signal to obey, thus, he is likely to fail and suffer, more likely than achieving what he seeks. The foolishness of the knight is like a human's ignorance and lack of wisdom and the dullness of his insight, the unruliness of the horse is like the dominance of his desire, especially the appetites of the stomach and private parts, and the lameness of the dog is like the dominance of anger, its overpowering control, its intensity, and its ferocity. The soul and its need for the body. Know that the vital powers aid the rational soul in certain matters, among which is that the sense supplies it with particulars, and from these particulars, four things occur for it. First, the extraction of universal concepts by the soul from the particulars, in a manner that abstracts their meanings from matter and from the relations and appendages of matter, and considers what is common and what is distinct, what is essentially existent and what is accidentally existent. This leads to the soul's initial concepts based on its use of imagination and illusion, like genus, species, general accident, and specific accident. Second, the soul's establishment of relationships between these universal concepts, similar to affirmation and negation. Whatever composition is essential and clear in itself, it accepts, and whatever is not, it leaves until it encounters a medium. Third, the acquisition of experimental premises, which is that the sense perceives an attribute that necessarily belongs to the judgment of a subject, whether it is affirmative or negative, or that which requires connection or its absence, or that which necessitates contradiction or its absence. This is not always equal at all times but always until the soul is satisfied that it is in the nature of this attribute to have this relation to this subject, and that it necessarily follows or contradicts it by essence, not by coincidence. This becomes a belief that results from sense and reasoning, sense for witnessing it and reasoning because if it were by coincidence, it would not always or mostly be found. This is like judging that senna is naturally laxative to the bile due to our frequent sensing of it, and our reasoning that if it were not by nature but by coincidence, it would be found only occasionally. Fourth, the reports that are believed due to their extreme frequency, so the human soul utilizes the body to acquire these principles for conception and belief, then when it has acquired them, it returns to itself. If anything from the lower powers happens to it, such as occupying it with its task, it hinders its act except in matters where the soul specifically needs it again, like returning to the imaginative powers to grasp a principle other than what was acquired, or to aid by bringing forth an imagination. This often occurs at the beginning and rarely thereafter, however, when the soul is complete and strong, it acts independently in all respects, and the imaginative and sensory powers, as well as the rest of the bodily strength, do not distract it from its action but rather occupy it. An example of this is that a person may need a mount and tools to reach a destination, but when he arrives, if there are causes that prevent staying there, the very means that facilitated arrival become an obstacle. Clarification of how these powers lead one another and serve one another. Indeed, you find the acquired intellect to be an absolute leader and is served by everything, for it is the ultimate goal. Then, the intellect in action is served by the intellect in habit, and the potential intellect, 
due to its readiness, serves the intellect in habit. Next, the practical intellect serves all of these, because the physical relation exists for the perfection of the theoretical intellect, and the practical intellect is the manager of that relation. Then, the practical intellect is served by the imagination, and the imagination is served by two powers, one that follows it and one that precedes it. The power that follows is the one that preserves what the imagination delivers, and the power that precedes it comprises all the vital powers. Then, the imaginative power is served by two powers of different origins, the appetitive power serves it by command because it incites it to motion, and the imaginative power serves it by accepting composition and detail in its forms. These two are leaders of two groups, as for the imaginative power, it is served by the fantasy, and the fantasy is served by the five senses, as for the appetitive power, it is served by desire and anger, and desire and anger are served by the power that moves actually. Here, the vital powers culminate, then the vital powers as a whole are served by the vegetative powers, and the foremost and leading of them is the generative power, then the nutritive power serves the generative power, and the augmentative power serves them all. Then, the four natural powers serve these, which are the digestive, and it is served in terms of retention and attraction, and all of them are served by the expulsive power, and all are served by the four qualities. However, heat is served by cold, and both are served by moisture and dryness, and here are the last degrees of the powers. Human souls are originated. Human souls occurred when the point was ready to accept the soul from its giver, as God Almighty said, so when I have fashioned him, in due proportion, and breathed into him of my spirit, Quran 15:29 just as an image occurs in a mirror when it becomes polished, even though the one with the image precedes the polishing in existence. The summary of the proof is that if souls existed before bodies, they would either be numerous or one. The falsehood of their unity and their multiplicity therefore negates their existence prior to bodies. The impossibility of their unity comes from the fact that after being associated with bodies, they would either remain one or become multiple, and the impossibility of both unity and multiplicity therefore negates their pre-existence. The impossibility of their unity after association with bodies comes from our certain knowledge that what Zaid knows, Armour might be ignorant of, and if the intelligent substance from both was one, the joining of opposites within it would be impossible, as it is in Zaid alone. By the intelligent soul, as we mentioned, we mean it's impossible for it to be numerous, because one cannot become many or be divided unless it has dimensions, like bodies. A single body can be divided because it has dimensions, thus it has parts that can be divided. But how can something without parts or dimensions be divided? The presumption of their multiplicity before association with bodies is also impossible, because they would either be identical or different, and both are impossible. The impossibility of identicalness comes from the fact that the existence of two identical things is impossible at the root, thus, the existence of two blacks in one place or two bodies in one place is impossible, because duality requires difference and there is no difference here. Two blacks in two places are possible, because this one differs from that one in place when this one is specific to a place not specific to the other. Similarly, it is possible to have two blacks in one place at two different times, because this one has a characteristic the other does not, which is the separation by this specific time. So, there are no absolute equals in existence, but rather they are relative, as when we say Zaid and Arma are similar in humanity and corporeality, and the blackness of ink and a raven are similar in blackness. And their difference is impossible, because difference is of two kinds, one is by the difference in kind and essence, like the difference between fire and water, and between blackness and knowledge. The second is by the accidents that do not enter into the essence, like the difference between hot water and cold water. If the difference in human souls is by kind and essence, then it's impossible, because human souls are agreed upon in definition and reality, and they are one kind, because the definition, which is the rational animal, encompasses them. And if they are different by accidents, it's impossible because the one reality only differs in its accidents if it is related to bodies and attributed to them in some way, and there is no relation to bodies before the existence of bodies, thus the difference is impossible, as the difference in parts of the body is necessary, whether it's close to the sky or far from it, for example. However, if it wasn't so, 
the difference and diversity would be impossible, and this matter may require further clarification, but this amount is sufficient to give an alert to it. And if it is said, how will the state of the souls be after separating from the bodies, with no connection to the bodies, how can they differ and vary? The answer is that we say because they have acquired, after being attached to the bodies, different characteristics such as knowledge and ignorance, clarity and turbidity, good and bad morals. Because of these, they remained different, so their multiplicity was perceived unlike before being in bodies, for there was no cause for their differentiation. It is evident that the soul develops just as it uses a suitable physical matter, and the body becomes a tool and a kingdom for it, the newly created soul inherently has a natural inclination to be concerned with that particular body, to attend to its states, and to be drawn to it. This disposition necessitates its specificity to that body, and it must be uniquely suited for the governance of a particular body rather than another, even if that particular suitability is hidden from us, for such suitabilities are not limited and not apparent, and God, exalted be he, oversees their secrets and inner realities. And if it is said, we do not concede that human souls are uniform in type and meaning, nor do we concede that species only multiply due to their relation to matter, place, and time. Rather, physical things multiply by their measures and temporal beings, and human souls are not material in their essence. Their relationship to matter is managerial and dispositional, not impressionable in matter, so as to require a distinct place and time. Management and disposition do not necessitate intrinsic multiplicity, for one can manage multiple things, and many can manage one thing. This relation in itself does not cause multiplicity in essence. We say, the evidence that human souls are uniform in type is what we have mentioned, that the definition of a human encompasses them, which is a living, speaking entity, and what is encompassed by the type's definition is uniform in type. The evidence that the reasons for multiplicity are what I mentioned is that things whose essences are just realities only multiply due to their carriers, recipients, and those affected by them or due to their relation to them and to their times only. If they are immaterial, they do not join with that, so it is impossible for there to be difference and multiplicity between them. As for their saying that the human soul is not material to be differentiated by matter is admitted, however, it has a relationship to matter, whatever the relationship is, even if it is not impressionable, then it is managerial and dispositional. This relationship is sufficient to cause distinction. It is said that the human soul possesses that excellent city. If it is said that we do not concede that the multiplicative causes are confined to what you have mentioned of the types of carriers, recipients, and those affected by them or their relation to them, then what is the evidence of limitation? Aren't immaterial things different in essences and realities and have no carriers or recipients, no place, no time, and only differ and vary by their own intrinsic realities? And their type is in their person, I mean in their essence, so why don't you say about human souls that they differ by their characteristics or by something else other than carriers? Aren't souls after separation different in number? And you say they differ by what they have acquired from the bodies of morals and sciences, and you said that it is sufficient for distinguishing the disposition that it was the soul of a certain body, and if this extent is sufficient for distinction, then why wouldn't it be sufficient for distinguishing the disposition that it will be the soul of a certain body, since the impression in the body is not a condition? We said, in paradoxes, there is proof that they are divergent in truths, whereas human souls are encompassed by a single definition, as we mentioned, and their existence and multiplicity only become possible after separation, in forms and characteristics acquired from bodies. Before contact with a body, it is not possible for them to acquire anything from bodies, since there are no bodies, and what does not exist has no influence, so we definitely know that after contact with the body, souls are only perfected with the assistance of the body, and acquire virtues and vices from the physical relationship. Therefore, before the body, there is no relationship, no acquisition, and no divergence, hence it is established that souls occur with the body. If it is said, you have made the existence of human souls prior to bodies improbable with your demonstration that they cannot be conceived before bodies, and we present two practical objections to their existence connected to bodies, and occurring with the creation of bodies, because it is agreed among us that human souls are not material nor imprinted in matter, and such is not their way, so their creation does not happen gradually, 
piece by piece, or time after time, but their existence is a direct act of creation, and the existence of the body is not purely creative, but rather gradual, piece by piece and transformation part by part. So, to which specific part does the turn come in transformation, until at that point the soul is brought into existence and connected to it? And there is not a specific part except that it is possible for the soul to occur before it by a moment or after it by a moment. And if you said that it occurs at the completion of readiness, it is said, the completion of readiness does not happen suddenly and at once, but rather gradually, perfection after perfection, and it has become clear that it is a single perfection that occurs instantly without gradual progress. Moreover, the readiness and the completion of readiness are only required in what is a material form, I mean imprinted in matter, so the readiness is somehow a cause for the acquisition of the form from the giver of forms, and this is not required for the souls which are not imprinted in matter at all, nor is there any relationship between them and material powers except that of managing and administrating in the kingdom. So, how can the administration in it be a cause for the necessity of the administered and managed entity? And the manager is more deserving to be prior in existence to the kingdom and the condition of readiness to accept the form, so that the form exists in the ready, is one thing, and the condition of readiness to accept the management of the soul is another, for the first readiness may serve as a cause for the existence of the soul in some way, but it is rather a cause for accepting its management in it. Either it benefits him as a priority or does not derive benefit from it, and this is a significant problem. The answer to it is a single word, for knowledge is a single joke increased by ignorance. So we say, there is no doubt that souls are creative and are not imprinted in matter, but are brought into existence by their creator upon the completion of the preparation, which is expressed in the revelation by saying, so when I have fashioned him. The creator knows best the completeness of the readiness, and human powers are incapable of comprehending the details of these preparations, but in general, we know that forms overflow from their creator and giver as necessitated by the generosity of the purely generous, due to the completeness of the knowledge encompassing the details of the information, giving each deserving their due and completing what is lacking for each inadequate one. Indeed, the essences of things and their readiness stem from his abundant generosity, through the causes that provide specific preparedness from elemental bodies and their mixtures, and the movements of the heavens and their bodies, their forms and properties, and the overflow of intellects upon the souls and the outpouring of souls seeking completion as driven by the celestial movements. So everything is from the generosity of the true generous one who grants every reality its existence, and he is most knowledgeable about the completeness of the readiness, and which preparedness deserves which form. Human knowledge falls short of comprehending that, and when the discussion reaches God Almighty, the question of why ceases, just as the pursuit of what should not be questioned ceases, for they are not to be questioned about what they do, while they will be questioned. The second problem, if souls are similar in kind, overflowing from the giver of forms, and there is no difference in his overflow, then whence must each newly created soul naturally have an aggressive disposition towards engaging with a specific body and concerning itself with its conditions? And whence must it have a particular suitability for governing a specific body rather than another? If this disposition is inherent to its essence, then it is specialized in this disposition before the body's existence, and if this disposition is acquired from the body, then how can the cause precede the effect, and how can that disposition be naturally aggressive? In summary, if the disposition is not specialized, then why is it specified for one body rather than another, and if the disposition is natural as it is, then it is the one specialized for itself after agreeing in kind, and if it is acquired from outside, which is either this body or another, then let it actualize its existence until it acquires the specified disposition, and all of this is impossible. Then the difference in suitability and dispositions necessitates the difference in causes, and the giver of forms is one in essence, unique in bestowal, so there is no difference there, nor does the influence of different temperaments affect the difference in the dispositions of souls, for there is no imprinting, no indwelling, and no contact between the immaterial and the temperaments, unlike the souls of plants, animal souls, corporeal forms, and natural forms, for the difference in souls and forms is due to the difference in their matter and forms based on their readiness. The solution to this problem is to say, indeed, the different suitabilities and dispositions require different causes, 
and the causes of readiness and causes of mixtures, and all that occurs in the elemental world is tied to the celestial movements, and even choices and wills are undoubtedly things that occur after they did not exist, and for every occurrence after non-existence there is a cause and an incidental reason, and this leads to movement, and from movements to the circular ones, so all readiness is subject to the celestial movements, then the circular movements are based on the choices of the celestial souls, and all rely on the divine intellect superior over all, from which decrees branch out. Thus, the divine generosity, through the intellects, souls, and celestial movements, grants each matter its readiness for a particular form, and souls do not come into existence through specific readiness, but upon specific readiness, and there is a difference between occurring upon it or by it. Then, the nature of the dispute within the soul only occurs after it has been contacted, for the emergence of the soul has a characteristic in the agent and a characteristic in the recipient. As for the characteristic of the agent, it is the divine generosity which is the source of existence, and it overflows by its essence onto everything that truly accepts existence, and this characteristic is expressed by power. And if you attribute this overflow to the intermediaries, then they are the givers of forms. An example of this is the flood of sunlight onto everything capable of illumination when the veil between them is lifted, and those capable of illumination are the things that can be colored, unlike the air which has no color. As for the characteristic of the recipient, it is the evenness and balance achieved by leveling, as it was said, I have proportioned it. And an example of the recipient's characteristic is the polishing of iron, for a mirror whose face is covered with rust does not accept the reflection even if it is aligned with the image, and when the polisher busies themselves with polishing it, then as soon as polishing occurs, the image is reflected from the one holding the image who is aligned with it, likewise, when evenness and readiness occur in the sperm. The soul occurs in it from its giver and creator without change in the giver, but indeed the spirit has now occurred not before, due to the change in the place by the attainment of evenness now not before, as the image overflowed from the one with the image onto the mirror in the judgment of illusion without change in the image, but it was not acquired before because the image was not prepared to be imprinted in the mirror, but because the mirror was not polished. So if it is said, if the souls occur with the bodies, what then is the meaning of his saying, peace be upon him, Allah created the souls before the bodies by two thousand years. And his saying, peace be upon him, I was the first of the prophets in creation and the last of them in mission. And his saying, Peace be upon him, I was a prophet while Adam was between water and clay. We say, none of this indicates the eternity of the soul, but rather its occurrence and being created. Yes, maybe by its apparent meaning, it suggests the precedence of its existence over the body, as a group of philosophers presumed, and the matter of appearances is simple, for their interpretation is possible and the definitive proof cannot be dismissed by appearances but rather it is applied to interpret the appearances, as in the case of the ambiguous verses about God, the exalted. As for his saying, peace be upon him, God created souls before bodies, he meant by souls the souls of the angels, and by bodies the universe consisting of the throne, the chair, the heavens, the planets, the air, the water, and the earth. And just as the bodies of all Adam's offspring are small in comparison to the mass of the earth, and the earth is much smaller than the sun, then the mass of the sun bears no relation to its orbit, nor does the orbit to the heavens above it, then all of that is encompassed by the chair as it encompassed the heavens and the earth, and the chair is small compared to the throne. Therefore, when you contemplate all this, you will deem the bodies of Adam's offspring as insignificant and not understand them from the general term bodies, Similarly, know and realize that the souls of humans, in comparison to the souls of angels, are like their bodies in comparison to the bodies of the universe. If the door to the knowledge of the angelic realm were opened to you, you would see the human souls like a lamp that draws from a great fire that envelops the world, and that great fire is the last of the souls of the angels. The souls of the angels have an order, and each one is distinct in its rank, and no two are in the same rank unlike the numerous human souls despite the unity of the species. As for the angels, each one is a species in itself, and that is the whole of that species. This is indicated by the verse of God, and there is not one of us but has a known station, and by his saying, Peace be upon him, the one who bows among them does not prostrate, and the one who stands does not bow, and they are from one but each has a known station. 
Thus, do not understand from the absolute term souls and bodies anything other than the souls of angels and the bodies of the world. As for his saying, Peace be upon him, I am the first of the prophets in creation and the last of them sent forth, and his saying, We are the last and the first. And indeed, he said, Peace be upon him, the first thing God created was the pen, and he said, The first thing God created was the throne, and he said, The first thing God created was the essence of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and other such statements, then uncovering the cover from this has aspects beneath each aspect are delicate benefits and subtleties of wisdom, rarely are they inscribed in books. The first aspect, indeed, we have observed all existence with the testimony of sense and intellect to be arranged and differentiated in kind and individual. In the compounds closest to our senses, the minerals, plants, animals, and humans are on a hierarchy, and this ends with the human and the human ends with the single individual who is the best of all, like the prophet in his time and the saint in every era. And as for the simple bodily entities, I mean those homogeneous in parts, they are also on a hierarchy in essence, space, size, and movement, and the best of all is the outermost body, which is referred to in the revelation as the throne and the chair that encompassed the heavens and the earth. Regarding the spiritual essences, meaning those abstracted from material substances, sanctified from place and time, there is indeed a hierarchy and superiority. The stronger in power, more expansive in knowledge and encompassing, more profound in unity, and resembling the perfection of divinity holds the highest station and ultimate rank. Necessarily, these hierarchies must culminate in one entity because if the differentiated rankings do not end with one, this would imply an infinite regression, which is impossible. So, in every category, the hierarchies culminate in one entity which is their beginning. The language of prophecy sometimes refers to this entity as the first creation of God Almighty, so the spiritual hierarchies end with the Holy Spirit or the active intellect or the intense power that became stable, which is the first of creations. Then it descends in order and hierarchy, as it is said, the first thing God Almighty created was intellect, then soul, then prime matter, or as narrated in tradition, indeed, the first thing God created was the pen, then the tablet, then the external darkness. As for corporeal entities, they culminate in the outermost body, which is narrated to be the first creation of God, the throne and then the footstool. And as for compound entities, they end with the essence of prophethood, the most complete and superior of which is the essence of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as narrated, the first thing God Almighty created was the essence of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Thus, every statement has a context, and every doctrine has a carrier and a justification, then the primacy in each category, is it primacy in time, or primacy in rank, or primacy in essence, meaning the efficient or perfection cause? That is another topic, easily grasped and closely reached. The second point, beginnings are led to perfections, so much so that if there were no perfection, there would be no beginning, just as if there were no beginning, there would be no perfection. The intelligibles are manifested through the sensibles, just as the perfection of divine majesty is revealed through his actions and creations. Similarly, the true command is manifested through creation, intellect is manifested through the soul, the soul is manifested through nature, and nature is manifested through the universal body. All existences are revealed through the human being, so that his body and nature are the manifestations of the body and nature, his soul and intellect the manifestation of the soul and intellect, and his submission the manifestation of the true command, thus revealing the majesty and honor of the Creator. And it is valid to say, if it were not for you, I would not have created the spheres, for he is the essence of creation, the choice of the created beings, the perfection, the ultimate destination, and the Sidrat al-Muntaha, the low tree of the utmost boundary. He is the first creation and the last to be sent forth, as he, peace be upon him, mentioned. The third point, the nature that has been subdued influences the preparation of matter to receive the outpouring of the command, intellect, and soul, until it brings about in compounds through the refinement of elements and the extraction of the essence from materials, and the testing of combinations from temperaments, layer after layer, and refinement after refinement until there arises in the individual composites a person in correspondence with the universal intellect. In fact, this person is the intellect itself or the intellect of the person, and that is the prophet of his time, 
so the return is through him as the beginning was to him. The one who embodies the principle resembles the one who embodies perfection, and the end is the return to the beginning, the first thought is the last action, and the meaning of the prophets, peace be upon him, statement becomes apparent, we are the last and the foremost. The fourth point, just as religion and law began with Adam, peace be upon him, and a kind of perfection was completed with Noah, peace be upon him, and another kind of perfection with Moses, peace be upon him, and another kind with Jesus, peace be upon him, and yet another kind of perfection with the Chosen One, peace be upon him. And the return began from the Chosen One, peace be upon him, in the abode of recompense, for that he said, I am the first from whom the earth will split open, I am the last, al Akib, and I am the gatherer, al Hashir, upon whose feet people will be gathered. The Permanence of the Soul We mentioned that it, the soul, does not die with the death of the body, then we mention that it does not perish absolutely, and we will provide their proof from both tradition and reason. As for the tradition, it is said in the Quran, and do not say of those who are killed in the way of Allah they are dead. Rather, they are alive, but you perceive, it, not. They rejoice in what Allah has bestowed upon them of his bounty, Quran 3-169-170. And it is known that one who is alive, provided for, and joyful cannot be dead or non-existent. Similarly, the verse, and do not say of those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead. Rather, they are alive, Quran 2-154, and the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, said, the souls of martyrs live in the bodies of green birds that roam freely in paradise. This belief has been firmly established in the creeds of all Muslims, for the messenger of mercy and forgiveness is for those who remain, not for those who perish. Likewise, the gifting of charity, they believe that it reaches the deceased, and so do dreams, all of which is evidence that the soul remains. We have mentioned that the soul is not imprinted in the body, but it is related to the body through management and control. Death is the severance of that relationship, I mean its activities and management of the body. The animal spirit that dies is a subtle vapor that originates in the heart and rises to the brain, and from the brain through the veins to the entire body, and in every place it reaches, it benefits from the external senses and internal feelings. That spirit cannot be purified, and if that spirit is nullified, the following external and internal senses and moving powers also cease. As for the rational proof, it is because everything that is corrupted is corrupted by the corruption of something else, so it is attached to it in some form of attachment. And everything attached to something else in a form of attachment either has a mutual existence in attachment, or is subsequent in existence in attachment, or is antecedent in existence to it, which is before it in essence, not in time. If the attachment of the soul to the body is a mutual attachment in existence, and this is something intrinsic to it, not accidental, then each of them adds its essence to its companion, so neither the soul nor the body is a single essence, but they are two essences. And if that is an accidental, not an essential matter, then if one of them perishes, the other's accidental relation of addition ceases but its essence does not perish with its corruption. And if its attachment to it is subsequent in existence, then the body is a cause for the soul in existence, and there are four types of causes, either the body is an efficient cause giving existence to the soul, or a material cause for it by way of composition like elements to bodies, or by way of simplicity like bronze to a statue, or it might be a formal cause, or it might be a final cause, and it is impossible for it to be an efficient cause, because the body, as a body, does not act but acts through its powers, and if it were to act by its essence and not its powers, then every body would perform that act. And all physical powers are either accidents or material forms, and it is impossible for accidents or forms that are dependent on matter to produce an existence of an entity that is independent in itself, not in matter, and an absolute substantial existence. It is also impossible for something to be a cause of potentiality, as we have proven and clarified that the soul is not in any way layered in the body, so the body is therefore not imagined with the form of the soul, not in simplicity, nor in composition, as if a part of the body is combined to then generate the soul. It is impossible for the body to be a formal or perfect cause for the soul, it is rather the other way around, so, the soul's attachment to the body is not an effect tied to an intrinsic cause, indeed, 
the body and its temperament are incidental causes for the soul, for if a body occurs that is fit to be an instrument for a soul and a kingdom for it, the separate causes create the individual soul or it occurs because of them, as creating it without a specific cause to create one rather than another is impossible. With that, multiplicity in number is also prevented as we explained, because every being, after not being, must be preceded by matter, in which there is a preparation for its acceptance or a disposition towards it, as clarified in other sciences. Because if it was permissible for an individual soul to occur without an instrument through which it is perfected and operates, it would exist in vain, and nothing is in vain in nature that directs everything from the elements to their perfection and purpose. But when the preparation for the relationship and readiness for the instrument occurs, it is then necessary for something to happen from the divine beneficence through the separate causes, which is the soul. And when the occurrence of something with the occurrence of something else is necessary, it does not necessarily cancel with its cancellation, unless the essence of that thing is established by that thing and in it. And things may occur due to other things and those things may cease, yet it persists if its essence is not established in them, especially if the giver of existence to it is something else, not that which is merely prepared to give existence with its existence, and the giver of existence to the soul is something other than the body, as we explained, and it is not merely a force in a body, but it is, without doubt, also a substance other than a body. Therefore, if its existence comes from that thing and from the body, it occurs only when it deserves existence, so it has no connection in existence itself with the body, nor is the body a cause for it except, incidentally. It is therefore not permissible to say that the attachment between them is in a manner that necessitates the body to be essentially prior to the soul. This is a philosophical argument concerning the nature of the soul, its independence from the body, and the cause-effect relationship between the two. The passage suggests that while the body may be an incidental cause for the soul, the essence of the soul does not depend on the body, and the soul comes from a different source of existence, presumably a divine or spiritual one. As for the third category that we had mentioned in the beginning, it is when the soul's attachment to the body is like that of something which proceeds in existence. Now, this precedence could either be temporal, making it impossible for the soul to be connected to the body if its existence preceded the body in time, or the precedence could be in essence and not in time, since in time it never leaves it. This type of precedence is such that the existence of the preceding essence necessarily entails that the existence of the latter is derived from it. Consequently, if the latter were to be presumed non-existent, then the preceding would also not exist, not because the presumption of the latter's non-existence causes the non-existence of the preceding, but because it is not permissible for the latter to be non-existent unless something by nature affecting the preceding has caused its non-existence. Therefore, the non-existence of the latter does not cause the non-existence of the preceding, but rather the presumed non-existence of the preceding itself, because the non-existence of the latter is assumed after something has affected the preceding causing its own non-existence. If this is the case, then it must be that the causative factor of non-existence affects the essence of the soul and corrupts the body with it, and that the body does not corrupt solely due to its own specific causes, such as changes in temperament or structure. Thus, it is invalid that the soul is connected to the body as something that proceeds in essence, and then the body corrupts entirely due to itself. Therefore, this type of attachment does not exist between them, and if this is the case, then all forms of attachment have been invalidated, and it remains that the soul has no attachment to the body in existence. Rather, its existence is connected to the divine goodness through other principles that neither change nor cease to exist. The soul does not perish at all. We say that the soul is not susceptible to extinction, non-existence, corruption, or destruction, for anything that can corrupt due to some cause has the potential to corrupt, and before corruption, it has the act of continuing. It is impossible for a single aspect and in one thing to have both the potential to corrupt and the act to continue. Rather, its predisposition to corruption is not due to the act of continuing, because the concept of potential is different from the concept of act, and the attribution of this potential is different from the attribution of this act, for the attribution of that is to corruption and the attribution of this is to continuity. Therefore, these two concepts exist in the thing for two different reasons, which can only be in composite entities or simple entities within composites. As for simple, 
separate entities in their essence, these two conditions are not permissible, and we categorically state that it is not permissible for these two concepts to coexist in anything simple in essence, because anything that continues to exist and has the potential to corrupt also has the potential to continue, for its continuation is not a necessary compulsion, and if it is not compelled, then it is possible, and possibility is the nature of potential, therefore, in its essence, it has the potential to continue, and the act to continue is inevitably from it, not the potential to continue from it, which is clear. Therefore, the act of continuing is something that occurs to a thing that has the potential to continue from it, and that potential does not actually belong to any essence, but to something that actually continues to exist, not by its own existence. It follows that its essence must be composite of something that makes its existence actual, which is the form in everything, and of something that acquires this act and in its nature lies its potential, which is its matter. If the soul is absolutely simple, it cannot be divided into matter and form, and if it is composite, let us set aside the composite and consider the substance that is its matter, and let us turn our discussion to the soul of its matter and speak about it. And we say that this matter, either it is divided in this way permanently and we affirm the discourse permanently and this is impossible, or that the thing which is the essence and the substance does not perish, and our discourse is about this thing which is the substance and the origin, not in something that is composed of it and another thing. Therefore, it is clear that everything that is simple and not compound, or it is the origin of a compound and its essence, is not combined in it by the act of remaining and the power to be annihilated with respect to its essence. Therefore, if there is a power to be annihilated in it, it is impossible that there is an act of remaining in it, and if there is an act of remaining and existing in it, then there is no power to be annihilated in it. So, it is clear therefore that the essence of the soul does not have the power to corrupt. As for the beings that corrupt, it is the compound that is combined, and the power to corrupt and to remain is not in the meaning by which the compound is one, but in the matter which is potentially receptive to both opposites, so therefore, in the corrupt compound there is neither the power to remain nor the power to corrupt, hence they do not combine in it. And as for the matter, either it remains not by a power that prepares it for remaining, as some think, or it remains by a power by which it remains, and it does not have the power to corrupt, but the power to corrupt is something else that occurs in it. The simples that are in the matter, the power of their corruption is in the matter, not in their essence, and the proof that requires that every corrupt being is from the aspect of the finite power of negation and nullification, only requires it in what its being is from matter and form, and that in its matter there is the power that this form remains in it, and the power to corrupt is in them together. So, it became clear then that the soul absolutely does not corrupt, and to this we have directed our discourse, and God is the guardian of success. Affirming the active intellect and the passive intellect in human souls and the ranks of the intellects. The affirmation of the active intellect in terms of religious law is more apparent than establishing it through its clear appearance in the texts, such as his statement, Exalted be he, he taught him, Adam, the manifest power, and his statement, Exalted be he, indeed, it is the word, conveyed by, a noble messenger, who is, powerful, with position at the owner of the throne, secure, in position, and his saying, it is not for any human that Allah should speak to him except by revelation or from behind a veil or that he sends a messenger. 3. As for the intellect, it is from several aspects, first, what we have mentioned before about the hierarchy of existence and their differentiation, and that in the bodies of the simples it ends at the throne, and in the spiritual beings to the intellect and the soul, and in the composites to the essence of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and we have elaborated on that section so we will not repeat it. The second aspect, it has been made clear to you that what is imprinted with the intellectual form is neither a body nor in a body, for a body divides and what is in the body also divides, and intellectual forms are universal and united and do not divide. If they were to settle in a body, they would divide, and their division is impossible, so their settling in a body and what is in the body is impossible. You know that what is imprinted by the preceding form, for I mean imagination, fantasy, and the physical senses, are deeply rooted in bodies, and that if the form occurs in the faculties and does not disappear from them, and that a person perceives intellectual forms then they disappear from him, and if he wants to return to them, 
he returns to them readily without the need to reacquire them, but only needs to turn his attention to them. So, these intellectual forms that have disappeared, either they have ceased to exist, which should require reacquisition as at first or it should not, and if they have not ceased to exist, then they must be in the soul or in the body or outside. If they are in the soul, then it should be aware of them and rational, because there is no meaning to rationality except the occurrence of that form in the soul, and it is not permissible for them to be in the body, for we mentioned that intelligibles do not settle in bodies, and what is in bodies, and if they are outside, then either they stand by themselves, or they are in another essence whose function is to bestow intelligibles upon human souls, and it is not permissible for them to stand by themselves, because meanings stand by essence and do not stand by themselves, so it remains that they are in the essence that bestows intelligibles, thus proving by this the existence of a being whose function is as we mentioned, and that is the active intellect, and it is the Holy Spirit. Then the proof that understanding is nothing other than representation, for if it disappears from it, then revisits it, nothing other than representation occurs. If this representation was fixed to the soul, it would be aware of it and rational about it, so it must be that the form has been removed from the soul completely, which is contrary to what imagination perceives and disappears from it, for the imaginative power has a keeper that preserves its perceptions, so whenever it disappears from imagination and turns to it, it retrieves from it the meanings it derived from the forms. Yes, we do not deny that extinction occurs in two forms, sometimes it ceases from the perceptive power and is preserved in another power like a storekeeper for it, and sometimes it ceases from both the power and the storekeeper. In the second case, it necessitates the undertaking of acquiring something new, while in the first, it does not need acquisition but rather differentiating and examining the treasury without the need for acquiring. In intelligible matters, both cases are possible, but we have explained that there is no storekeeper for them neither in the soul nor in the body, so it remains that it must be something external, if there is any connection between our souls and it, the special intellectual forms are imprinted in them due to that preparedness for specific judgments. And if the soul turns away from it to what pertains to the physical world or to another form, what it has represented is erased at once, as if the mirror that is aligned with the sanctity has been turned away from it to the sensory side or to something else of the sacred matters, and this also happens if the soul acquires the ability to connect with the active intellect. The third aspect, the human soul may be potentially intelligent and then become actually intelligent, and whatever moves from potentiality to actuality only does so due to a cause that is itself in actuality. So here, there is a cause that brings our souls in intelligibles from potentiality to actuality, and since it is the cause for providing the intellectual forms, it is actually intelligent with the principles of the intellectual forms being abstract. This entity is called, in relation to the intellects that proceed from it to actuality, the active intellect, as the potential intellect is called, in relation to it, the passive intellect, and the intellect that exists between them is called the acquired intellect. The relation of the active intellect to our souls is like the relation of the sun to our eyes, just as the sun sees by itself in actuality and illuminates by its light what is not actually seeing, so is the case with this intellect with our souls, for when the intellectual power gazes upon the particulars in the imagination and the light of the active intellect shines upon it, it becomes abstracted from matter and its relations and imprinted in the rational soul not as if the soul itself transitions from imagination to the intellect on its own nor as if the meaning submerged, in relations. Which in itself and its consideration is abstract, understands like itself, but rather in the sense that its examination prepares the soul for the effusion from the active intellect, for thoughts and reflections are movements preparing the soul towards receiving the effusion, just as the middle premises are more firmly prepared for receiving the conclusion, even if the former is by one means and the latter by another. Therefore, when the rational soul forms any relationship to these forms by the mediation of the illumination of the active intellect, something of its kind occurs in it in one way and not of its kind in another, just as when light falls on colored objects, it affects the vision from them in a way that is not uniform from every aspect. So the imaginations that are potentially understandable become actually understandable, not in themselves, but what is captured from them. Just as the effect conveyed through the light from the sensible images is not the images themselves, but something else appropriate to them, which is generated by the mediation of the light in the receptive counterpart. Similarly, 
the rational soul, when it contemplates those imaginative images and is connected by the light of the active intellect in a form of connection, is prepared for the emergence within it of the abstractions of those images from their impurities. The first thing that is distinguished by the human intellect is the essential from the accidental within them, what they share in common and in what they differ. Thus, the meanings become a single concept within the intellect in regard to their similarities, but in relation to their differences, they become many meanings. The intellect has the power to multiply the one from the meanings and to unify the many. As for unifying the many, there are two aspects. One of them, that the many different meanings in the imaginations, by number, become one single meaning if they do not differ in definition. And the second, that a single meaning by definition is composed from the meanings of the genera and the species, and the aspect of multiplication is the opposite of these two aspects. This is one of the unique properties of the human intellect, and is not present in other powers, as they perceive the many as many as they are, and the one as one as it is, and they cannot comprehend the simple one but the one as it is a composite of things and their accidents, nor can they separate the accidental from the essential. So, when the sense conveys an image to the imagination and the imagination conveys that image to the intellect, the intellect takes a meaning. If another image of that kind is conveyed to it, which is only another by number, the intellect does not take any different form than what it took first, except from the aspect of the accident that particularizes this from that aspect by taking it once in the abstract, and once with that accident. And for this reason, it is said, Zaid and Arma are one meaning in humanity, I mean that if the former provided the soul with the image of humanity, then the second does not at all provide anything of that meaning, but the imprinted meaning from them in the soul is one, which is from the first imagination, and there is no effect for the second imagination. And when the intellect perceives things in which there is precedence and succession, it must conceive time necessarily, and that is not in time, but in an instant, and the intellect conceives time in an instant. As for its composition of definition and measurement, it necessarily occurs over time. However, the conception of the result and the defined happens at once, the inability of the mind to conceive things that are at the height of intelligibility and abstraction from matter is not due to something in the nature of those things themselves, nor to something inherent in the instinct of the intellect. Rather, it is because the intellect is preoccupied with the body and often needs the body in many matters, which distances the body from its most excellent completeness. But if this preoccupation is removed, the soul's understanding of the abstract becomes the best, clearest, and most delightful of understandings. As for the ranks of the intellect from potentiality to habit, actual intellect, and acquired intellect, we have mentioned them, and as for the sacred intellect, we will mention it, God willing, in the characteristics of prophecy. A principle in prophecy and messengership. It includes clarifications, clarification whether messengership is obtained through definition or not, clarification whether messengership is acquired or a divine favor, clarification of proving messengership through evidence, clarification of the specific qualities of messengership which are miracles, and clarification of the method of calling and what is taken from auditory evidence and what is not. Clarification that messengership is not captured through definition and reality by mentioning its category and its division because the knowledge of things does not depend on capturing their definitions and finding their category and division. How many existents have no category, division, definition, or form, and for those who have a category and division, one may not capture its category and division, and most matters are like that. Indeed, giving definitions is difficult and hard for the minds, yes, its existence and reality can be inferred through its effects, because the mind and the soul and many of the separable things are conceivable, and they have no definition or form but are only indicated by evidence. If someone asked a prophet from among the prophets about the specific qualities of messengership, its essence, and to express its definition by its category and division, consider how he would answer that or whether he would embark on establishing that, mentioning its definition, form, and enumerating its specific qualities until his messengership depended on knowing all of that, and if the respondent did not know that, he could not believe it. Or was he required to believe immediately, whether he knew the definition of messengership or not, and if messengership is a rank above the rank of humanity, just as humanity is a rank above animality, 
The followers of the messenger are not dependent on knowing messengership just as the domination of animals does not depend on knowing humanity. Likewise, if a human wanted to define the specifics of humanity to an animal, it would be foolishness and imposing the unbearable. Similarly, if the messenger wanted to define the specifics of messengership to a human, that would be imposing the unbearable on him, so neither the demand is obligatory upon him nor is the response necessary. This is like when Pharaoh asked Moses, peace be upon him, about the essence of the Lord of the worlds, he said, the Lord of the heavens and the earth and everything in between, if you should be convinced, Quran 26 23-24, and he asked him a second and a third time, but Moses did not come with a definition or form, nor did he mention a category or division in defining what he was asked, except for pure lordship, and the definition by the realities are in their spatial and temporal conditions and the events that occur between space and time. Is the message a favor acquired or a divine influence? Know that the message is a divine influence, a heavenly step, and a gift from God that is not acquired by effort nor attained by earning. As God says, Allah knows best where to place his message, Quran 6-124, and and thus we have inspired unto you, O Muhammad, a spirit of our command. You knew not what the book was, nor faith, but we have made it a light, Quran 42-52. However, Effort and earning are involved in preparing oneself to accept the effects of revelation through worship coupled with thought and pure dealings, free from desires for vision and reputation. Thus, the matter is not geographically coincidental, so that every crawler and walker might attain it, nor is it contingent on effort and earning so that every thinker and striver might achieve it. Just as humanity for the human species and angelic nature for the angels is not acquired by individuals of the species, and working according to the type is not free from acquisition and choice for preparation and readiness. So too, prophethood for the type of prophets is not acquired by individuals of the species, and working in accordance with prophethood is not free from acquisition and choice for preparation and readiness. Revelation is sent down, as in the Quran, 20-1-2, Tar. We have not sent down to you the Quran that you be distressed, at the time when his worship had swollen from worship to the point that he said, then am I not a grateful servant? And Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to practice to Hanuth in Hero before the revelation and loved solitude. He saw the vision as clear as the dawn, but these are incidental states and symptoms that arise from the type due to a calling and deserving from the perfection of the constitution, the goodness of form, the completeness of moderation, the purity of the birth and upbringing, the pleasantness of lineage, noble characteristics, proper demeanor, patience, dignity, gentleness, mercy, and compassion for allies, severity and valor against enemies, truthfulness in speech, delivery of trust, protecting from all vices, adorning with all virtues, honorableness from all lowly matters, forgiving those who wronged him, doing good to those who did evil to him, maintaining kinship ties, preserving secrets, being a good neighbor, supporting the oppressed, helping the distressed, loving good deeds, despising bad deeds, and more, as in your companion, Muhammad, has not strayed, nor has he erred, Quran 53-2, in this world, nor does he speak from, his own, inclination. It is not but a revelation revealed, Quran 53-3-4, in that world, he owns the souls of the worlds willingly and unwillingly, and he is not proud or overbearing or harsh or severe, he is feared when silent and not blamed when he speaks, graceful in movements and stillness, he has risen to bear the burdens of the message he carried, fulfilled it, and his mercy overflowed to the worlds, so he accomplished it. May God's blessings be upon him and upon his pure and virtuous family, proving the message with evidence the explanation of its proof is in two ways one is comprehensive, and the other is detailed. As for the comprehensive way, just as the human species is distinguished from all other animals by the rational soul, which is above them in rational virtue, governing them, owning them, and disposing of their affairs, so too the souls of the prophets, peace be upon them, are distinguished from the souls of people by their divinely guided intellect, which is above all other intellects in divine virtue, managing them, owning them, and disposing of their affairs. And just as the human's movements are miracles to animals, for no animal moves like his intellectual, verbal, and active movements, so all the movements of the prophet are miracles to humans, for no human moves like his intellectual, 
verbal, and active movements. And as the prophet is distinguished from the people by his mind, which is suitable for abstract intelligences and the first intellect, he is also distinguished by his soul, which is akin to the souls of the heavens and the celestial soul. Likewise, he is distinguished by his nature and temperament, which are predisposed to actually accept such intellect and soul, just as it is inconceivable in the divine natural order that every animal's seed becomes a human, it is also inconceivable that from the seed of every human, a prophet arises. God creates what he wills and selects, for his mercy whom he wills, Allah selects messengers from the angels and from the people. Quran 22:75 so he is chosen in his nature and temperament, elected in his soul and intellect, with no one among people sharing these with him. On the other hand, although the Prophet shares humanity and being human with people in terms of form, he is distinguished from them in terms of meaning, since his humanity is prepared for receiving revelation, say, I am only a man like you, Quran 18-110, refers to the aspect of resemblance in form, to whom has been revealed refers to the aspect of distinction in meaning. As for the details, they come through various ways, the first way, a proof that has been established from voluntary movements, which are of three kinds, intellectual, verbal, and practical. Intellectual movement includes truth and falsehood, verbal includes honesty and lies, and practical includes good and evil. These expressions are technical, and the meaning derived from them is straight and understood. There is no doubt that despite their contradictions and differences, they are not all obligatory in action or in acquisition, for indeed, he who issues such a fatwa, verdict, deserves death by his own fatwa, because killing him would be part of the actions, and it is obligatory in action, and not all of it is obligatory to abandon. For he who issues this fatwa should not even breathe, because breathing involves movement, and it is obligatory to abandon. Thus, it is evident that some of these are obligatory to abandon and others are obligatory to perform, and the distinction between movement and movement is by these limits. It cannot be that either everyone knows this or no one does, or some know it and others do not. It is evident that not everyone knows it, and it is false that everyone knows it. So, it appears that some know it and others do not. Therefore, the first division establishes limits in the movements, and the second division establishes owners of these limits who know them, and they are the prophets and the bearers of the divine laws, peace be upon them. And if a person introspects, he knows that if he is not familiar with these limits, he must be under the rule of those who are. Thus, the existence of prophecy is proven by the necessity of movements. The second way, is to say that the human species needs to come together for the betterment in their voluntary movements and beneficial transactions, and without that assembly, Neither their personhood would survive nor would their species be preserved, nor their wealth and sanctities be protected. The nature of that assembly is called a faith, miller, and a law, sharia. The explanation of this is that in preserving his life and maintaining his kind, and guarding his wealth and his family, he needs cooperation and resistance. As for cooperation, it is to acquire what he does not have but needs for his food, clothing, and shelter, and as for resistance, it is to protect what belongs to him, his self, his children, his family, and his wealth. Likewise, in maintaining his kind, he needs cooperation in pairing and participation, and resistance that preserves it for himself. This resistance and cooperation must be based on a defined limit, a just cause, and an encompassing and preventive tradition. It is known that no mind is sufficient to establish this tradition on a law that covers the interests of the species as a whole and specifies the condition of each individual in detail unless it is a mind supported by revelation, designated for the message, derived from the spiritualities that are decreed to preserve the order of the world. They act by his command and walk by his tradition in creation and judge by his ruling. Thus. The grace is continuously transmitted to him from the decrees and the judgments, then from it overflowing onto the individual bearing that trust, capable of the secrets of the religion, following the truth in all matters, and followed by creation in all their movements. He speaks to people on the measure of their intellects with his mind that stands on those measures and imposes on the servants according to their capacity by his power that encompasses those capacities. These proofs are branches of a single root which is the affirmation of the command for God, the Almighty, and it is the third way to prove prophethood. 
and whoever does not recognize his command does not recognize prophethood at all, for the prophet is an intermediary of the command, as the king is an intermediary of creation and the command. And just as it is obligatory to believe in God with regard to creation and command, it is obligatory to believe in God and the intermediary of creation and command, whoever believes in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers. Quran 2-285 the path to establishing the divine command is of two types, the first is that contingencies, just as they need a preference for existence over non-existence, and just as movements, by their renewal, need a mover to sustain them successively, also the movements that deviate from their original direction and those that differ from their natural tendencies need, by their renewal, a mover that has a will and makes choices. Then. The movements that tend toward a system of good without corruption and evil need a mover who commands and manages affairs, as God Almighty said, and he inspired in every heaven its command, Quran 41:12. Similarly, human actions, as they require an intellectual will in their differing directions, also need a commander who guides us within their varied limits so that the person obliged may choose truth over falsehood in intellectual movements, honesty over lies in verbal movements, and good over evil in practical movements. Just as the command for management runs over all creation for the system of the existence of the great world, as he almighty said, the sun, the moon, the stars are subjected by his command. Indeed, for him is the creation and the command, blessed is Allah, Lord of the worlds, Quran 754. Likewise, the command for accountability runs over the specific creation for the system of existence of the small world, as he almighty said, O mankind, worship your Lord, who created you, Quran 2.21, and so all the commands and prohibitions directed at people. Just as he inspired in every heaven its command through an angel, so too he inspired in every time his command through a prophet, so that is the decree and this is the accountability. The second way in establishing the divine command is to say, it has been established and verified by proofs that the prime creator is a sovereign to be obeyed, so to him belongs creation and command entirely, and for every sovereign in his authority are commands and prohibitions, enticements and deterrences, promises and threats. It is not permissible for his command to be something created, for the created as such indicates only a creator, so it does not signify command in the sense of requirement, demand, accountability, and identification, and neither encouragement nor deterrence. And whoever does not affirm for God Almighty a command to be obeyed has indeed rendered all these commands, prohibitions, reminders, and alerts dependent on one claiming prophethood, limited to him and extending beyond him, and what he attributes to God Almighty of God said. God mentioned. God commanded. God forbade. God promised, and God threatened, would then be metaphorical not actual. And who is more unjust than one who invents a lie about Allah or says, it has been revealed to me, while nothing has been revealed to him? Quran 693, thus they have attributed to the Prophet, who is at the highest level of humanity, the most severe of wrongs which is at the lowest levels, and treachery which is the most vile of bad deeds, far removed is the station of prophethood from that. Properties of prophecy Prophecy has three distinct properties, one of them is related to the power of imagination and practical intellect, the second is related to the power of theoretical intellect, and the third is related to the power of the soul. The first property, know first that it is not possible to prove the principles of sciences and their premises from the sciences themselves, thus we accept here that every effect must necessarily follow from its cause until it exists, and that the celestial motion is elective, and that elective motion can only follow from a deliberate choice that necessitates action, and that the choice of a general matter does not necessitate a particular matter, for a particular matter can only necessarily follow from a particular choice that specifically pertains to it, and that all actual motions are particular. So if they are elective, they must be from a particular choice, hence the mover of these must be perceptive to particulars and not just pure intellect, but rather a soul that uses a physical tool through which it perceives particulars perceptually, whether it be imagination or practical intellect which is higher than imagination, and it also has a universal intellect which derives from the separate intellect that perceives the universal sciences. And all this is explained in the divine sciences, 
Hence from accepting these premises, it appears that each of the celestial motions is moved by a psychic substance, which understands particulars in the manner of understanding that pertains to them, and in it are formed their images and the images of the motions that each one chooses, and it transcends them until the forms of motions are continually renewed within it, so that the motions are renewed and it must necessarily imagine, at that time, the purposes that the motions lead to in this world. And it also imagines this world in detail and in summary, and nothing from its parts is hidden from it, and it necessarily follows that it imagines the matters that will occur in the future, and this is because they are matters, and their existence is necessitated by the relationship between the personal related motions and the relationships here, and the relationships between these matters and those motions, so nothing at all escapes being its occurrence in the future as necessary due to the existence of these as they are in the present, for matters are either by nature, or by choice, or by chance, and those that are by nature are necessarily so due to nature, either a nature that is present here primarily, or a nature that occurs here due to a nature that is here, or a nature that occurs here due to a celestial nature. As for choices, they necessarily result from choosing, and choosing is an event, and every event that occurs after not existing has a cause, and its occurrence is necessitated by its cause, whether it is something existing here in one of the aspects, or something celestial, or something shared between them. As for coincidental occurrences, they are frictions and collisions between these natural and elective matters with each other in their courses, so then possible things, if they are not necessitated, do not exist, and they are only necessitated not by themselves but by the relation to their causes and to the gatherings that are due to various causes. Therefore, everything that comes into being is imaginable in all the existing conditions of nature and of earthly and celestial will at the time, and according to the course of each of them in the present, for it is imaginable what must come from the continuity of these on their respective paths from the entities, and there are no entities except what is necessitated from them as we said. Therefore, entities then can be perceived before coming into existence, not because they are possible but because they are necessitated, and it is only that we do not perceive them, because either all their causative factors leading to them are hidden from us or some of them are apparent to us and some are hidden. To the extent that they are apparent to us, we have intuition and suspicion about their existence, and to the extent that they are hidden from us, we harbor doubt about their existence. And as for the movers of the celestial bodies, all the aforementioned conditions are present to them, so all the subsequent conditions are necessitated together, so the form of the world is as it wishes to be and it is delineated there, then those images, not alone but the intellectual images that are in the separate substances, are not veiled from our souls by any veil from their side, the veil is in our reception, either due to our weakness or due to our preoccupation with other than the direction in which access to them and connection with them occurs. However, if neither of the obstacles is present, then connection with them is readily available, and our souls do not need anything other than connecting with them and observing them to perceive them. As for the intellectual forms, the connection to them is through the theoretical intellect. Regarding these images under discussion, the soul conceives them through another power, which is the practical intellect, and in this realm, imagination serves it. Thus, the particular matters are grasped by the soul through its power called the practical intellect from the higher psychic substances, and the universal matters are grasped by the soul through its power called the theoretical intellect from the higher intellectual substances, which must not contain any of the particular images at all. The readiness of souls to receive varies among the souls, especially the readiness to accept particulars through connection with these psychic substances. In some souls, this readiness is weakened due to the weakness of the imaginative power, in some, this readiness is not present at all also due to the weakness of the imaginative power, and in others, it is stronger. So much so that if the senses cease using the imaginative power and stop engaging with what is presented to it, the practical power draws it towards that direction until those images are imprinted in it. However, because the imaginative power has an instinct for imitation and transition from one thing to another, it leaves what it has taken and brings forth something similar, its opposite, or something related, as happens to the awake person who sees something, then the imagination turns to other things that are brought to it in connection until it makes him forget the first thing. Then it returns in the way of analysis and conjecture and goes back to the first thing by taking the present from what the imagination had led to, 
and realizes that it has followed in the imagination following any form that preceded it, and so on until it reaches the beginning and remembers what it forgot. Thus, interpretation is the reverse analysis of the act of imagination until it reaches the thing that the soul had witnessed when it was in contact with that realm, and the imaginative took it and moved to other things. So, this is one level, another level is where the readiness of a soul strengthens until it substantiates what it has attained there, and the imagination settles on it without being overcome by the imagination and moving to another, thus the vision that does not require interpretation. Yet another level is even more prepared than the last, and these are the people whose perfection of their imaginative power and its intensity is such that the sensory powers do not engulf it in bringing what is presented to it, thus preventing it from serving the rational soul in its connection with those principles that inspire it with particular matters, and therefore in the state of wakefulness, it connects and accepts those images. Moreover, the imaginative power does the same as it does in the state of the vision that needs interpretation, by taking those states and imitating them and dominating the sensory until what it imagines affects the phantasmic power, by imprinting the images that occur in it on the participating phantasm, and thus, astonishing divine images are seen, and divine sayings are heard, like those revelatory perceptions. This is one of the lower levels of the meaning called prophecy, and stronger than this is when those states and images are substantiated on their form, preventing the imaginative power from turning to imitate them with other things. And stronger than this is when the imaginative power continues in its imitation, and the practical intellect and the fantasy do not abandon what they have substantiated, so in the memory is established the image of what it has taken, and the imaginative power turns to the phantasm, and imitates in it with astonishing images and sounds, and each one of them leads in its way. And these are the layers of prophecy related to the practical and imaginative mental powers, look at the stories of the Quran and how they cover their details as if, the Prophet, witnessed and attended them, as if they were within the Prophet's sight and hearing. See how they were validated such that none of those who denied prophecy rejected them, and do not be surprised when we say that the imagined can be imprinted in the fantasia, imagination, and be seen, for the mad may see what they imagine, and there is a reason connected to clarifying the cause for which passers-by may report of existing matters and are often believed to be true, and for that, an introduction, the imaginative power is like place between two powers using it, a lower and a higher one. As for the lower one, it is the sense, for it provides it with sensory images that occupy it, and as for the higher one, it is the intellect, for by its power, it diverts it from imagining falsehoods that are not brought by the senses and are not used by the intellect in them. The combination of these two powers in using it prevents it from fully issuing its particular actions, until the image that it presents becomes imprinted in the fantasia as if it was in the senses. Thus, if one of the two powers withdraws, it's not far-fetched that the other might in many cases, not be hindered from acting and preventing it, sometimes it frees itself from the pull of the sense and becomes strong enough to resist the intellect, and delves into what is its own act without heeding the intellect's opposition, and this is in the state of sleep, and when it presents the image as if seen. And sometimes it frees itself from the governance of the intellect when the instrument which the intellect uses to manage the body is corrupted, and it becomes resistant to the sense and does not allow it to occupy it, but rather proceeds to issue its actions until what is imprinted in it from the images is as if seen, for its imprint in the senses, and this in the state of insanity. And something like that may occur in fear, due to the weakness of the soul and its collapse, and the domination of illusion and certain assumptions over the intellect, it sees terrifying things. So, the passers-by and the mad may imagine what does not exist for this reason. As for their news about the unseen, most of that occurs to them in states like epilepsy and fainting, which corrupt the movements of their sensory powers, and it may happen that their imaginative power is taxed due to their numerous disturbed movements, because it is a physical power, and their concerns are diverted from the sensibles, so they often reject the sense. And if so, it may happen that this power is not completely occupied by the senses, and the slightest calmness occurs from its disturbed movements, and also its drawing along with the rational soul becomes easier, the practical intellect has an insight into the horizon of the aforementioned world of the soul, it sees what is there and what it sees is conveyed to the imagination and appears in it, as if seen and heard, so then, 
when the passerby reports it and it comes out according to his saying, he would have foretold the future occurrences. And now we must conclude this statement, as we have delivered the secrets contained therein, and God is the facilitator. If someone says, if the companions of jinn, soothsayers, and diviners, and some madmen may sometimes inform about the unseen and their news is confirmed, and they warn with signs and their effects are realized, then the prophetic characteristic is nullified. The answer is to say, we have previously clarified in the preceding statements that imagination in animals varies in degree, superiority, opposition, and arrangement. So much so that some philosophers have said, the highest degree of it is when the soul reaches the universal soul that governs the sphere of the moon, which is the giver of forms. Were it not that the particulars among the existing corrupt beings are imagined and envisioned within the universal soul itself, it would not bestow upon each matter its deserved form, nor would it be prevented from imagining the necessary particulars of its own movements among the beings derived from it in the elemental world. Thus, by this meaning, the celestial bodies have acquired additional meaning beyond the separate intellect due to the manifestation of a particular and a universal opinion. Although the universal opinion is derived from the intellects, once you comprehend this, human souls may engrave from that world according to their preparedness and the absence of any impediment, and become like a mirror facing the universal soul, until everything in the universal soul is reflected in them. To this extent, they have magnified the matter of imagination. On the other hand, in the lower realm, we find an animal devoid of imagination or with weak imagination, quick to forget, unable to stabilize an image for even an hour or a moment. Instead, new imaginations arise according to the renewal of movements, this is on the pattern of difference by degree, as for what is on the pattern of difference by opposition, there is imagination and envisioning that is entirely true, arising from an excellent soul, and imagination and envisioning that is entirely false, arising from an evil soul, and imagination and envisioning between the two extremes. If it turns to good, it adheres to it, and if it turns to evil, it adheres to it. Here, there is another mode of discourse, which is to affirm an intellect that is abstracted from all imagination, and to affirm an imagination that is abstracted from all intellect, and to affirm an intellect that is all imagination, and to affirm an imagination that is all intellect. Here, there is an active sense from imagination, and an imaginative act from sense, and an intellectual act from imagination, and an imaginative act from intellect. Here, there is knowledge based on the mixture of assumption, and assumption based on the mixture of knowledge, and they assumed as you assumed that Allah would never raise anyone, from the dead, referring to the first assumption, and we assumed that we could never frustrate Allah upon the earth, nor can we frustrate him by flight, referring to the second assumption. The exclusive mention of assumption in the Quran in relation to the jinn is for a reason in the properties of the jinn, which is that their existence is imaginative and their perceptions are imaginative, and their forms are only perceived by the imagination. Just as imagination is in the middle between sense and intellect, so everything that is imaginative is in the middle between the corporeal and the spiritual like the jinn and demons, and mediums always consist of a mixture of the two extremes or are free from the extremes. As for the second characteristic of prophecy, which follows the theoretical power, we say, it is evidently known that the intelligible matters that one acquires by achieving the middle term after ignorance can only be acquired in syllogism, and this middle term can be achieved in two ways, sometimes it is achieved through intuition, and intuition is the act of the mind that independently infers the middle term, and intelligence is the power of intuition. Sometimes it is achieved through learning, and teaching leads to intuition, for the beginnings inevitably lead to intuitions inferred by the masters of those intuitions, then conveyed to learners. It is possible for a person to have intuition themselves, and for reasoning to be established in their mind without a human teacher. This varies in quantity and quality, as for quantity, it is because some people have more intuition for middle terms, as for the how, it is because some people are quicker in intuition, and because this disparity is not confined to a single degree but is susceptible to increase and decrease. Among them are the dull who do not benefit from thought readily, some are somewhat clever and enjoy their thoughts, and others are sharper and possess an accuracy in rational matters. This sharpness is not uniform among all, it may decrease or increase. 
Just as you find the side of deficiency can end at a point where intuition is non-existent, be certain that the side of excess can extend to a point where one relies on learning and thinking in most cases. Thus, one acquires knowledge spontaneously along with the mediums and proofs. Therefore, it is possible that a person, due to extreme clarity and perfect connection with rational principles, can have an intuition ignited in everything so that the image in the active intellect is formed, either instantly or nearly instantly, not traditionally but with certainty, along with the intermediate limits and manifest proofs. The difference between intuition and thought is that thought is the movement of the soul in meanings, aided by imagination in most matters seeking the middle ground and what is associated with it, approximating knowledge of the unknown in the absence of it, using what is stored inside. This may lead to the desired outcome or may not. Intuition, however, is the immediate representation of the middle ground in the mind by knowing the cause and thus the effect, or knowing the evidence and thus immediately or almost immediately acquiring the knowledge of what is indicated. This acquisition sometimes occurs after seeking and longing, and sometimes without such desire, as if the knowledge appears to a noble and enlightened soul on its own, as if it had chosen it, its oil almost glowing with the light of instinct even if the fire of thought had not touched it. The path of inspiration and intuition does not depart from the path of acquisition and thought in the essence of knowledge, nor in its place, nor in its cause, because the seat of knowledge is the soul. The cause of knowledge is the active intellect or the close angel, but it differs in the aspect of the removal of veils, for that is not by the servant's choice, and revelation does not differ from inspiration in any of that, but in witnessing the angel who conveys knowledge. If someone asks, if this intuitive power exists in other than a prophet, since a person finds in themselves this intuition in many matters, and everyone has intuition in their craft, then the condition in a prophet to be in all rational matters is a condition that does not exist, for he may be prevented from intuition in a question or questions. In any case, his mind at that time is not confused about anything from the unseen or witness, he is by himself an intellect in action and does not need an intermediary, so he has no intuition. But you have affirmed intuition for him, and this is contradictory, and if intuition is in some matters, then others share it with him, and it is not a characteristic exclusive to him. Also, not all matters are more deserving than others, nor is there a defined limit that is exclusive to prophecy, so why is the prophetic characteristic determined? Also, you have established for the intellect four ranks, potential, habit, intellect in action, and acquired intellect, so in which rank does a prophet have a characteristic that distinguishes him from the rest of the people? The answer is to say, he who does not establish opposition and sequence in human intellects does not rightly establish this characteristic. As for the opposition, it is between the prophet's intellect and the soothsayer's, and as for the sequence, like the prophet's intellect and that of a truthful ally. The two opposites are adversaries in need of a judge with no judge above, and the two sequentials end with an intellect with no intellect above, and in both cases altogether, the prophet's intellect is above all intellects and governs over them and manages them, and brings them from potentiality to action, and completes them with effort to the utmost limits of perfection appropriate for each one of them, so it is not possible to define a limited limit, but if it can be said that this power is susceptible to increase and decrease, then the prophet's intellect is above all intellects. The third property of the soul, we say, it has appeared to us in divine sciences that the form that is in the corporeal bodies of the universe is contingent in existence on the forms that are in the souls and the universal minds, and that this matter is submissive to accept what is conceived in the world of intellect. For these intellectual forms are the principles for these sensory forms, and from their very essence, the existence of these species in the corporeal worlds is necessary. The human souls are close to those essences, and indeed we find that they have a natural activity in the body that belongs to every soul. For the voluntary form that is etched in the soul necessarily follows a compulsory shape of the organs, an unnatural movement, and an uninstinctive inclination to which nature yields. The fearful form that is etched in the imagination causes in the body a temper without change from a natural change similar to it, and the angry form that is etched in the imagination causes in the body another temper without a similar changer, and the beloved form and the desirous power, when it glimpses in the imagination, 
it brings about a temper that generates coolness from the moist matter in the body, and directs it to the organ which is the tool for the lustful act so that it becomes ready for that matter. The nature of the body is nothing but from the element of the world, and if these natures were not present in the essence of the element, they would not be found in this body. We do not deny that there might be from the psychic powers what is stronger in action and effect than our own souls, so that its effect is not limited to the matter it has shaped, which is its body, but if it wishes, it can produce in the matter of the world what it conceives in itself. The beginning of these events is not to be moving, calming, cooling, heating, condensing, and softening, as it does in its body, hence it follows that it causes torrential downpours, winds, thunderbolts, earthquakes, and exciting screams, followed by waters and flowing springs, and the like in the world by the will of this human. And the one who achieves this perfection in the nature of the soul, and then becomes good, adorned with virtuous conduct and the commendation of morals and the path of the spiritualists, avoiding vices and lowly matters, is someone with a miracle from the prophets, that is, someone who claims prophethood and challenges with it, and these matters are accompanied by the claim of prophethood or a grace from the saints, and it increases his self-purification and control of his powers and their release from this sense in addition to what his nature requires. Then, from who is evil and uses it in evil is the wicked sorcerer, and know that these matters are not just to be spoken of, and testimony to them is not just suspicions of their possibility or logical matters only, even though that is a reliable matter to lean on, but they are experiences that have been established and sought their causes. And it is a fortunate coincidence for those who love insight to encounter these conditions in themselves or to witness them repeatedly in others, until that becomes a taste in affirming wonderful matters that have existence and validity, and calling him to seek their cause. For when taste is accompanied by knowledge, that is one of the best benefits and greatest returns, and God is the ally of success. Conclusion, what is the best of humankind? The best of humankind are those who have been granted perfection in the intuition of the theoretical faculties, to the extent that they are independent of any human teacher by origin, and to whom the imaginative power has been given such straightness and ambition that they do not pay attention to the sensory world with its content, until they observe the psychic world with its conditions of the universe and establish them in wakefulness. Hence, the universe and what happens in it become representational to them and deeply engraved in their nature, and their psychic power has an effect on the world of nature until it reaches the level of celestial souls. Then, those who possess the first two aspects but not the third, and those who have this natural predisposition in the theoretical power but not in the scientific, and those who acquire this perfection in the theoretical power but have no share in the matter of the scientific power among the aforementioned wise men. Then, those who have neither a natural predisposition nor an acquired effort in the theoretical power, but have a predisposition in the scientific power. The absolute leader and the true king who deserves by his essence to rule is the first among the mentioned group, who, if he relates himself to the world of intellect, finds as if he is connected to it in a single instance, and if he relates himself to the psychic world, he finds as if he is from the inhabitants of that world, and if he associates himself with the world of nature, he acts within it as he wills. Those who follow him are also great leaders in rank, and the rest are the nobles of humankind and its dignitaries. As for those who have not completed anything from the powers, but who correct morals and acquire virtuous qualities, they are the intelligent of the humankind, they are not of the high ranks but are distinguished from the rest of the human types. Happiness and Misery After Departure Know that the prophets, peace and blessings of God be upon them all, have explained the states of the afterlife in the most comprehensive and clear manner. They were sent to urge people towards it through encouragement and warning, with tidings for those who follow and warnings for those who disregard, so that people would have no argument against God after the messengers. This is especially so with the final Sharia, which established the conditions of the afterlife both spiritually and physically, promptly and in the future, through parables and proofs. The state after death can only be known through the prophets, peace be upon them, for they have been privy to its conditions through revelation and news. Pure reason alone cannot guide one to the exact nature of knowledge and ethics, nor can it dictate the precise reward or punishment in the afterlife that befits each act of knowledge or deed. 
It is known that sciences are structured in a hierarchical and differentiated manner, honored by the nobility of their subject matter. The levels of honor within them are arranged according to the levels of nobility in the subject matter, and the levels of happiness and reward are accordingly assigned based on the levels of honor within them. Similarly, ethics and actions vary, differentiated by good and evil, and their measures in deed and reward are beyond the guidance of any mind unless it is aided by revelation and prophetic knowledge, with insight into the varieties of rewards in that world. Therefore, the Sharia has explained physical happiness in the most complete and clear manner, needing no further elaboration. As for the happiness or misery according to the spirit and heart, it has been indicated and highlighted in several places, and we shall explain that to the extent that our limited minds can grasp in this foreign world. So, we say, it must be known that each psychic power has its pleasure and good, and its pain and evil that are specific to it. For example, the pleasure of desires is to receive from its sensibilities a matching quality of sensation, as is the pleasure of triumph in anger, hope in imagination, and the remembrance of past successful affairs in memory. The pain for each one is what opposes it, and they all share a kind of partnership in that the sensation of what is compatible and suitable is good, and the pleasure derived from it and the actual and true compliance with each is the achievement of a perfection that is, in comparison, an actual perfection. This is a principle. Also, even though these powers share these meanings, their levels are, in fact, different in reality. The one whose perfection is better, more complete, more enduring, more accessible, and more firmly possessed has the greater and more abundant pleasure, and this is a principle. There may be an outward manifestation of perfection such that it is known to be for Zaid, yet he does not feel pleasure unless he attains it and senses it, without this sensation, he does not desire it, like the impotent who, even though they know that sexual intercourse is pleasurable, do not desire it nor yearn for the specific desire and longing that are associated with it, but a different desire, such as someone who craves an experience through which perception occurs even if it is harmful. This is also the state of the blind with beautiful images, and the deaf with harmonious, melodious tunes, therefore, the wise must not imagine that every pleasure is like that of a donkey's in its belly and genitalia, and that the primary principles that are close to the Lord of the Worlds are devoid of pleasure and joy. And indeed, the Lord of the Worlds, in his dominion and the peculiar splendor that belongs to him, and his infinite power, there is a matter of utmost virtue, honor, and goodness. It is so noble that we refrain from calling it pleasure, for what comparison can there be with that sensory experience? We know this for certain, but we do not feel it due to the absence of that state, making our condition like that of the deaf and the mute, and this is fundamental. Also, perfection and the suitable matter could be facilitated for the perceptive power, and there may be an impediment or a preoccupation for the soul, so it dislikes it and prefers its opposite, like a sick person's distaste for honey and his craving for unpleasant and inherently repugnant flavors. Sometimes it may not be distaste, but rather a lack of enjoyment, like a fearful person who finds pleasure but does not feel it, and this is fundamental. Also, the perceptive power may be prevented by what is the opposite of its perfection, and it does not feel or reject it until the obstacle is removed, then it returns to its instinct and is harmed by it, like a person with a fever who may not feel the bitterness in his mouth until his temperament is corrected and his organs purified, then he would dislike the temporary condition that befell him. Likewise, an animal may not desire food at all, which is the most suitable thing for it, and it dislikes it, and this may continue for a long time, until the obstacle is removed and it returns to its natural duty, then its hunger and craving for food intensify to the point that it cannot endure its absence and would perish without it. Similarly, a great cause of pain like the burning of fire or the chill of bitter cold may occur, Yet the senses may be afflicted so that the body does not suffer from it until the affliction is removed, then it feels it at that time. Once these principles are established, we say, the perfection that is specific to the rational soul is that it becomes an intellectual world, imprinted within it the form of the whole, the intelligible order in the whole, and the overflowing good in the whole, starting from the origin of the whole and ascending to the noble spiritual essences, then to the spirits associated with some form of attachment to bodies, 
then to the celestial bodies with their forms and powers, and so on until it encompasses in itself the form of the entire existence, becoming an intellectual world parallel to the entire existing world, witnessing the absolute good and beauty, united with it, imprinted with its examples and forms, and intricately woven into its fabric and made of its essence. If this is compared with the beloved perfections of the other powers which exist at a level where it would be improper to say that it is superior or more complete than them, there is indeed no comparison at all in any aspect of virtue and perfection, abundance, and permanence. How can eternal permanence be compared to the transience of the corruptible, and so is the intensity of arrival, how can that which arrives through the contact of surfaces and bodies be compared to that which arrives by permeating the essence of a thing as if it were one without separation? Hence, the intellect and the intelligible are one or nearly one, and that the perceptive power in itself is more complete is a matter that is not hidden, and that it is more intense in perception is a matter also revealed by the slightest research, for it is more abundant in perceptions and more thorough in pursuit of the perceived, stripping it of extraneous add-ons, did not enter into its meaning except incidentally and delving into its inner and outer aspects. But how can this perception be compared to that perception, or how can we attribute sensual pleasure and bestial and irascible pleasure to these blisses and pleasures? But in our world, and with our bodies and our immersion in vices, we do not feel that pleasure when something of its causes occurs to us, as we have hinted at in some of the principles we have presented before, and for that reason we do not seek it nor incline towards it, except perhaps if we have cast off the remnants of desire and anger and their kin from our necks, and have glimpsed something of that pleasure. Then, by no means, our imagination of it is nothing but a frail and weak fancy, especially when the problems are resolved, and the sought-after certainties are clarified, and our enjoyment of that is like the sensory pleasure from delicious tastes by their sense from a distance. And if we separate from the body and the soul is awakened, while in the body due to its perfection which is its beloved, and has attained it while naturally inclined towards it once it actually understands that it exists, except that its preoccupation with the body, as we said, has made it forget itself and its beloved, just as sickness makes one forget the need for a remedy for what dissolves, and just as a sick person forgets the pleasure of sweetness and its desire, and leans with desire away from the disliked things, then truly what arises for it at that time from the pain of loss is equal to the pleasure that we have necessitated and indicated to its great status, so that is the misery and punishment which no separation by fire for joining or altering it, or altering the balance of temperament, can equal. Then our state at that time is like the numbness we have indicated previously, which once worked within us as heat and cold, but the material substance and the presence of sense prevented us from feeling pain, then it happened that the obstacle was removed, and we felt great suffering. And if the intellectual power has reached from the soul a degree of perfection, it is possible for it, if it separates from the body, to complete the perfection it ought to achieve, like the numbness that tasted the most delicious food and experienced the most delightful state and was not aware, then the numbness disappeared and he suddenly experienced great pleasure, and that pleasure is not of the same kind as that sensory and animalistic pleasure by any means, but a pleasure resembling the good state that pure living essences possess, nobler than any pleasure and more honorable. This happiness and that misery are not for every one of the deficient, but for those who have gained the intellectual pleasure and longing for its perfection, and that is when it becomes evident to them, that the nature of the soul is to perceive the essence of everything by acquiring the unknown from the known and completing in actuality, for that is not natural in them by default any addition to all other powers, but the feeling of most powers in their perfections only happens after reasons. And as for the souls and the pure naive powers, they are like potential matter set without at all acquiring this longing, because this longing only occurs and is imprinted in the essence of the soul, when it is proven to the psychic power that here are matters that knowledge gains through intermediary definitions and principles known in themselves, and before that it does not occur, because this longing follows an opinion, and it is not a primary opinion, but an acquired one. So those, if they acquired this opinion, the soul necessarily clings to this longing, and if they departed without achieving what they could reach after complete separation, they fall into this kind of eternal misery, because that happiness was acquired by the body alone and it has separated, and these are either those who are deficient in striving to gain human perfection, 
or obstinate deniers fanatically attached to corrupt opinions opposed to true opinions, and the state of the deniers is worse than the state of the deficient, and the state of the deficient is more severe than the state of the pure naive souls. And as for how much should be acquired by the human soul from the conception of intelligibles so as to exceed the limit at which such misery occurs, I cannot precisely determine it except approximately, and I believe that when the human soul conceives the separate principles truly, and affirms their existence with certain belief by demonstration, and knows the ultimate causes for the matters that occur in the general movements not the particular which are infinite, and it is established in him the form of the whole and the relations of its parts to each other, and the order taken from the first cause to the furthest of existences occurring in its arrangement, and he conceives the comprehensive care for the whole and its nature. And he realizes that the true essence creating the whole, which existence is peculiar to it, and which unity is peculiar to it, and how it is known so as not to be affected by multiplicity and change in any way, and how the existence relates to him, the most high and sublime, then as the observer increases in insight, he increases in readiness for happiness, and as if man does not get rid of this world and its relations, except that he becomes more strongly related to that world, so he develops a longing for what is there, and a love for what is there, which prevents him from turning to what is behind altogether. And we also say that this true happiness is not achieved except by the rectification of the practical part of the soul, to it ascends the good word, and the righteous deed raises it. We present an introduction to this, saying, character is a faculty by which the soul easily issues actions without prior deliberation, and praiseworthy character is the mean between two blameworthy extremes, for every extremity in matters is blameworthy. We have explained this most thoroughly previously, in summary, the relationship with physical powers should not be purposeful, but rather it should be the practical mind that takes control, and the animal force that follows and complies. Thus, the intellect should be affected by the animal forces rather than affecting them, and the animal forces should be affected and not affect. If it is so, then the soul maintains its nature while also achieving a form of superiority and purity, which is not contrary to its essence nor does it incline towards the physical aspect. Then, the body only overwhelms and distracts the soul from the desire which is specific to it, from seeking the perfection that is for it and from feeling the pleasure of perfection if it happens for it, or the pain of losing perfection if it falls short, not that the soul is imprinted in it or immersed in it, but because of the relationship between them, which is the innate desire to manage it and to be occupied with its effects and what incidents it brings upon it. Thus, if it leaves while possessing the faculty of connection with it and being similar to its state, to the extent that it lacks this, its heedlessness of the movement of desire towards its perfection diminishes, and to the extent that it remains, it hinders it from pure connection with the place of its happiness, causing there to be disturbing movements that greatly increase its harm. Then, that physical state is opposed to its essence and harmful to it, and it is the body that distracts it from the complete immersion in it. So, when it leaves the body, it feels this great opposition. Indeed, people are asleep until they die, then they wake up and they suffer great harm. However, this harm and this pain are not due to something inherent but due to a strange incidental matter, and the strange incidental matter does not last and does not remain and disappears and becomes null with the cessation of the actions that affirm that state by their repetition. Hence, the punishment according to that is not everlasting but fades away and vanishes bit by bit, until the soul purifies and reaches the happiness that is peculiar to it, and for this reason, the al do not believe in the eternal damnation of the sinful believers, because the foundation of belief is solid, and the incidents fade away, are excused, and are forgiven. As for the foolish souls that did not acquire desire nor turn towards the knowledge of the knowledgeable, then if they leave the bodies and were not possessing the reprehensible forms, they go to the expanse of God Almighty's mercy and a kind of comfort, and for this, he, peace be upon him, said, the majority of the people of paradise are the foolish, and the highest levels are for those of understanding. And if they have acquired the physical forms stained with sins and the impurities of desires, and they have no form other than that, nor a meaning that opposes and contradicts it, then inevitably their desire is towards what it necessitates, so they suffer a severe punishment of loss because the body and the needs of the body are not fulfilled, as the instrument of remembrance and thought has ceased to exist, and the creation of attachment to the body has remained, and even if they held false beliefs and corrupt opinions, 
and yet stubbornly clung to those beliefs and denied the truth, then that is the companion of pain and the associate of a severe and lasting torment. In summary, this chapter suggests that if the soul departs before it has acquired either truth or falsehood, it is among those who are saved, neither at ease from deeds nor tormented, like the case of children and the insane. If it adheres to delusional and corrupt beliefs contrary to the truth, and further acts against the law, Sharia, then it is in enduring punishment. However, if it holds true beliefs with absolute, incontrovertible proofs and complements these with righteous actions, it is among the people of paradise. If it holds true beliefs but becomes preoccupied with the vanities of the world and its pleasures and desires, then it is punished, turning to what it left behind and not reaching its goal, for the means of pursuing the world will have failed. Yet, this punishment does not last but vanishes over time. If the soul attains knowledge at the level of perfection and believes in truths based on certain proofs, but does not follow the paths of religious law, nor does it pursue good deeds, nor act according to its knowledge, then it is punished for a time, but this too will pass, and it will reach a level of happiness in the hereafter due to its knowledge, for these afflictions caused by desires will fade. If the soul acquires certain knowledge either through contemplation and it purifies and beautifies its character and acts according to religious law, it attains the highest level of happiness and achieves unbroken connection with the absolute beauty and majesty of the truth, as God Almighty says, faces that day will be radiant, looking at their Lord, Quran 75 22-23. Thus, it is incumbent upon the rational person to strive for such happiness and to guard against its opposites and obstacles, and God is the guardian of facilitation and success. When the human soul is stripped of the body and no longer has any connection except with its own realm, it is conceivable that it could have within it whatever is accessible through intellect and opinion and all that intellect can comprehend as befitting that realm. That is the realm of permanence and actual existence, the realm where the soul connects with the principles that form the structure of all existence, so it is imprinted therein without deficiency or interruption from the continuous outpouring, to the point that it does not need to act or speak to achieve as it did before, as this is the realm of thought and remembrance and the like. Here, the soul is imprinted with the entirety of existence and does not need to seek another form, nor does it engage in anything from this world or in attaining its particular forms as it used to when it was particular. The pure soul turns away from this world while still connected to the body, not retaining or desiring to remember what happens in it. So what then of the one who attains pure detachment along with an unbroken connection to absolute truth and beauty, and the higher world which exists in eternity, which is a realm of permanence, not of renewal where thoughts and memories can occur. This realm of renewal is a realm of movement and time, so all pure intellectual meanings and those that become particular, material parts are all actually there. And so is the state of our souls. The argument here is that it is not permissible to say that the forms of intelligible objects occur in the substances of that realm by transference from an intelligible state, there is no change from one state to another, nor does any chronological precedence occur for the universal meaning over the particular meaning as it does here. For you first conceive of the universal, then time separates it into particulars, rather, knowledge of the general as general, and of the detailed as detailed, is without separation by time. Therefore, if this is the case with the substance which is like a seal, so it is with the substance which is like wax, the relationship of the substance which is like wax, when obstacles are lifted, to that which is like a seal is one of unity, there is no precedence or delay, but all are together. And this is a chapter of utmost verification. The Reality of Meeting and Vision Know that perceptions are divided into what enters the imagination, like imagined images, colored objects, and forms of animal and plant beings, and what does not enter, like the essence of God Almighty, and everything that is not a body, such as knowledge, power, will, etc. If someone saw a person, then closed their eyes, they'd find that person's image present in their imagination as if looking at it. But when they open their eyes and see, they recognize the difference between the two. The distinction is not due to a difference between the two images, because the visible image corresponds to the imagined one. The distinction lies in clarity and revelation, the visible image becomes clearer and more apparent upon seeing. This is like someone who looks during dawn before daylight fully spreads, then looks again in full daylight, 
the difference between the two moments is only in the degree of clarity. Hence, imagination is the beginning of perception, and vision is the culmination of that perception, the pinnacle of revelation. This doesn't mean that vision is necessarily in the eye. If God Almighty created this perfect, clear perception on the forehead or chest, for instance, it would still deserve to be called vision. When you understand this about imaginations, know that information that doesn't form in the imagination also has two levels of recognition, one preliminary and the other a completion of the first. The difference between the second and the first is the same as the difference between imagination and vision. The second is also called, in addition to the first, observation, meeting, and vision. This naming is correct because vision is called so as it represents the pinnacle of revelation. Just as the natural way of God dictates that closing one's eyelids prevents complete revelation through vision and acts as a barrier between sight and the object seen, and for vision to occur the barrier must be lifted, similarly, the human soul, as long as it is veiled by bodily distractions and desires, and influenced by human attributes, does not achieve the vision and meeting of information beyond imagination. This life acts as a veil preventing it, just as eyelids prevent sight. Thus, God Almighty said to Moses, Peace be upon him, you cannot see me. And he also said, Eyes cannot encompass him, meaning in this world. When this veil is lifted with death, the soul remains, stained with the residues of this world, not completely detached from them. Some souls accumulate so much impurity and rust that they become like mirrors whose essence has deteriorated from the prolonged accumulation of impurity, they are beyond repair and polishing. These are the souls forever veiled from their Lord, we seek refuge in God from that, others haven't reached the extent of such degradation, and are not beyond purification and polishing. They are briefly exposed to the fire to remove the impurities they are stained with, and their exposure to the fire is as needed for purification. The least duration is a fleeting moment, and the longest, as reported, is 7,000 years. No soul departs from this world without some stain or tarnish, no matter how minor, and thus Almighty said, Indeed, each, one, of you will approach it, that is upon your Lord an inevitability decreed. Quran 1971, O God, except souls that have immersed themselves in contemplation of the Almighty, engaged in the path of sanctity, always waiting for the dawn of the truth in their secrets, these people's beginning and end are the same. Among human souls and minds, there are those whose essence is naturally inclined towards abstraction and sanctity, free from the attachments of material and the distractions of this world. They are powerful and prepared, deeply rooted in the realm of distinct intellects, connected to the first intellect, drawing from the supreme word, supported by God's command, sent to the world of bodies not to be completed by them or their bodily powers but to complete the potential intellects so they move from potentiality to actuality. Rather, to bring intellects into actuality by power, and to complete the rational souls immersed in the states of this world to the extents of perfection predetermined for them. These souls' innate nature aligns with their end, they are the high assembly, the primary principles. It's rightful for them to say, we were shades on the right side of the throne, so we glorified and the angels glorified by our praise. Truthfully God said, say, if the most merciful had a son, then I would be the first of, his, worshippers. Quran 4381, and truthfully he, Prophet Muhammad, said, I was a prophet while Adam was still between water and clay. Whoever observes the contrasts and orders in existence and the established and resumed rules in judgments will face no doubts. As for most souls, they are certain of their destiny according to the extent they are tainted with sins, but when God perfects their purification and sanctification, and the time decreed in the book comes, and the obligations promised by the law regarding presentation, reckoning, and others are fulfilled, and the entitlement of paradise is achieved at a time when God is not known by any of his creation, as it occurs after the resurrection and the time of resurrection is unknown, then it prepares with its purity and clarity from impurities. It doesn't burden its face with dust or darkness because the truth, majestic in its glory, will manifest. This manifestation will be an unveiling in addition to its state, like the unveiling of visible things in addition to what one imagines. This viewing and manifestation are called vision. Thus, the vision is true provided that one doesn't understand from the vision the completion of imagination in a specific imagined and visualized form. 
direction, or place, because that is what the Lord of the worlds transcends, as you knew him in the world with real, complete knowledge without imagining, visualizing, or estimating a shape or form, you'll see him in the afterlife likewise. In fact, I say the knowledge obtained in this world is what gets completed and reaches the pinnacle of unveiling and clarity, it turns into viewing, there's no difference between viewing in the afterlife and what's known in this world except in terms of increased unveiling and clarity. If there's no affirmation of form and direction in knowledge, then in the completion of that very knowledge and its elevation in clarity to the pinnacle of unveiling, there's also no direction or form. It remains the same except for increased unveiling, just as the visualized form remains the same except for increased unveiling. That's why only those who truly know in this world will achieve the level of viewing and vision in the hereafter. Because knowledge is the seed that turns into viewing in the afterlife, just as a seed turns into a tree and grains into crops. Whoever doesn't have a seed, how can he get a palm tree? Similarly, whoever doesn't know God in this world, how can he see him in the afterlife? And since knowledge is of varying degrees, the manifestation also varies in degrees. The difference in the manifestation, in addition to the difference in knowledge, is like the difference in plants due to the variation of seeds. For they undoubtedly differ in their abundance, scarcity, beauty, strength, and weakness. Hence, he peace be upon him, said, Indeed, Allah manifested himself to the general public, and specifically to Abu Bakr, because he surpassed the people with a secret that settled in his heart. Without doubt, he had a unique manifestation, and anyone who did not know God in this world will not see him in the hereafter. For no one in the hereafter will have what did not accompany him from this world, and no one reaps but what they sow. A person will be resurrected based on what they died upon and die upon what they lived upon. Thus, what accompanied them of knowledge is the very thing they will enjoy, except that it will be transformed into a vision when the veil is lifted, and the pleasure will multiply just as the pleasure of a lover multiplies when they replace the imagined image of the beloved with seeing their actual image. That is the peak of their pleasure, therefore, the bliss of paradise is proportional to the love of God Almighty, and the love of God is proportional to knowledge. The root of all joys is knowledge, which is expressed by the Sharia as faith, so if you say, the pleasure of seeing, if it is related to the pleasure of knowledge, is little even if it multiples, for the pleasure of knowledge in this world is minimal and weak, multiplying it to a near infinite degree of intensity until all other pleasures of paradise seem insignificant. Know that this belittling of the joy of knowledge comes from a lack of it. How can one who lacks knowledge comprehend its pleasure? And if one possesses weak knowledge and a heart filled with worldly attachments, how can they experience its pleasure? For those who truly know God, in their understanding, contemplation, and intimate conversations with him, they have pleasures such that if paradise were presented to them in this world as a substitute for it, they would not exchange it for paradise. This pleasure, in comparison to the pleasure of meeting and seeing, God, is like the comparison of the pleasure of imagining the beloved to actually seeing them. To show the vast difference between the two, consider this example, the pleasure of looking at the face of the beloved in this world varies for several reasons. One reason is the perfection of the beloved's beauty or its deficiency, the second is the intensity of love, the third is the depth of understanding, and the fourth is the removal of distracting obstacles and pains from the heart. If a weak lover looks at his beloved's face from behind a thin veil at a distance, such that it prevents the full revelation of their image, and is simultaneously being bitten by insects that distract and pain him, he will still derive some pleasure from seeing his beloved's beauty. But if suddenly the veil is torn, the light shines, the pains are removed, and an intense passion overcomes him, consider how the pleasure multiplies, making the initial pleasure almost insignificant. Similarly, understand the relation between the pleasure of seeing and the pleasure of knowing. The thin veil is an analogy for the body and its distractions, and the insects represent the dominating desires of hunger, thirst, anger, grief, sorrow, and weak passion. Love is analogous to the soul's deficiency in this world, its detachment from longing for the higher assembly, and its inclination towards the lower worlds. This is like a child's inability to appreciate the pleasure of leadership and contentment with playing with a bird. Even if a Noah's understanding strengthens in this world, they are not free from these desires and it's unimaginable for them to be completely free. Yes, 
These obstacles may weaken in certain states, but they don't last. The brilliance of knowledge may momentarily dazzle the mind and magnify the pleasure to such an extent that the heart almost bursts from its greatness. But this is fleeting like a flash of lightning and seldom lasts. Distractions, thoughts, and worries often disturb and sour it. This is an inevitable reality in this transient life. This pleasure remains marred until death. The good life is only after death, the real living is in the hereafter, and indeed, the hereafter is the real life if they only knew. And whoever reaches this rank, indeed, he loves to meet God, so he loves death and does not dislike it except in anticipation of further completion in knowledge. For the ocean of knowledge has no shore, and encompassing the essence of the glory of God is impossible. The more the knowledge of God increases, along with his attributes, actions, and the secrets of his kingdom, the stronger becomes the joy of meeting him and its greatness. O oh God, do not take us out of this world except when we are fully knowledgeable, immersed in monotheism, detached from the ties of this world and its decorations. By your mercy, O oh most merciful of the merciful. The Knowledge of the Creator, Exalted Be His Majesty The knowledge of the Creator, Exalted Be His Majesty, is aligned with what was previously discussed regarding the knowledge of the self and its powers. Thus, we ascend to the knowledge of the truth, exalted be his majesty, and the knowledge of his attributes and actions, for beginnings are sought for the sake of their ends, and ends manifest due to beginnings. Any knowledge that does not lead to the understanding of the Creator, exalted be his majesty, is devoid of utility and benefit, and is of little return and value. We say that we have affirmed the existence of the soul in general by knowing its effects and actions. The vegetative soul is known by its effects in nutrition, growth, and reproduction. The animal soul by its effects in sensation and voluntary motion, and the human soul by initiating and comprehending faculties. We have learned that these actions are related to a principle called soul. The existence and characteristics of these entities are based on that principle, which is the soul. Thus, know that existent beings are of two types, either its existence is dependent on another, such that the non-existence of that other necessitates its non-existence, or it is independent. If dependent, we call it contingent, possible, and if not, we call it necessary in itself. This entails several matters for the necessarily existent. It cannot be an accident because accidents depend on bodies, and their non-existence is required when the body does not exist. It cannot be a body because a body is divided by quantity into parts, making the whole dependent on the parts, and also because a body is composed of matter and form, each being dependent on the other. It cannot be like a form because forms depend on matter, nor can it be like matter as it is the subject for forms and doesn't exist without them. Its existence cannot be different from its essence because essence without existence is potential. Existence that is potential is accidental to the essence, and every accident is caused. It cannot depend on another in a way that the other depends on it. It cannot depend on another in a compounding manner, for then it would be contingent. There cannot be two necessarily existent entities, just as one body has only one soul, the universe has only one Lord, the creator of all. Everything other than the necessary being must originate from the necessary being, just as the soul is the perfection of a natural, organized body. Similarly, the Lord is the originator of all, through him is the perfection, continuity, and beauty of all. So, what is the proof that there exists a necessary being, on which everything depends, and whose existence does not depend on anything else, making it the pinnacle of all existence and from whom all desires are attained? We said, because existence is either necessary or possible, and what is possible must depend on something else for its existence. The universe as a whole is possible in existence, so it must rely on what is necessary for existence. As for what is based on explaining that the soul is a substance that has no measure and quantity, and we have proven this with evidence, know for sure that the soul is a substance, and the creator is not a substance. Because a substance is that which exists not in a subject, meaning if it exists, its existence is not in a subject, and this feels like it is created. The substance is an actual existence, and what is necessary in its existence is its actual existence, and its existence is its actuality. If you know this, then know that we have proven the existence of the soul, 
and that it is a substance with a special proof and a proof based on premises. The special proof is that the soul does not separate itself from itself. If there is an existence from its creations what has this characteristic, what do you say about an existent that achieves all the right of its existence? For every right in terms of its essential reality by which it is a right is an agreed upon single right not referred to, how then is he sustained over the dominion? And if the soul does not separate itself from itself, even though it is not purely one, the one truth who does not hover around his oneness with plurality, division, and duality is more deserving of not separating himself from himself. He is thus knowledgeable of himself and knowledgeable of everything he created, invented, brought into existence, and caused. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him, and this is the meaning of the living, for the living is the one who is aware of himself. We have clarified that the soul is one and has no quantity or measure, similarly, know that the true creator, glory be to him, has no quantity or measure. From this, it is known that all that the anthropomorphists assert about affirming directions, superiority, form, place, and movement are all false. The exalted creator is not a substance that accepts opposites and changes, nor an accident that is preceded in existence by a substance. He is not described with a how, so he resembles or is likened, nor with a quantity so he is measured or divided, nor with what is added so he is equaled in his existence and is paralleled, nor with where so he is encompassed or contained, nor with when so he transitions from one time to another, nor with a position so forms differ regarding him and limits and endpoints surround him, nor with a quality so it encompasses him, nor with a reaction so his existence changes due to an action. And if it is proven that what is necessary in existence in its essence has no plurality in any way and it is necessary to describe what is necessary in existence with attributes, then it is necessary to affirm the attributes in a way that does not lead to plurality. So we absolve him of having a kind or separation, for the one who has no partnership with another, has no separation separating him from others. From this, it is known that all his names, the exalted, even existence, in terms of partnership, not in terms of complicity, and attributes are not affirmed in a way that is accidental, like the color that stands in place and like our knowledge that is incidental to the essence, because this leads to precedence, delay, and plurality. But attributes are affirmed in terms of addition to the actions or in terms of causes, reasons, and matters for him. It is apparent from this that he is alive because he knows himself, and we affirm that he knows because he is independent of matter and his existence is for himself. Whatever is separate from matter, its essence is the outcome of its existence. So, he knows by himself and is not separated from his essence, and his knowledge of himself is not additional to his essence lest it leads to multiplicity. For if a man knows himself, is the known different from him or identical? If it's different, then he didn't know himself but knew another. If what he knows is identical to himself, then the knower and the known are the same. Understand this in the context of the Creator, glorified be he, just as the knower is the known, knowledge is the known, just as sensation is what is sensed. For what is sensed is what's imprinted on the senses, not what is external. Thus, knowledge is the known, but the expressions differ regarding knowledge, the knower, and the known. It becomes clear that he knows all types and kinds of existence, and not an atom's weight on earth or in the heavens, neither smaller nor larger, escapes his knowledge. Because he knows himself, it is fitting that he knows it as it is, as his essence is abstract for itself, and his essence is the principle and creator of all existence. He is overflowing, pouring existence upon everything, he knows what he creates and what follows his essence. The multiplicity of knowledge doesn't lead to multiplicity in his essence, because his knowledge isn't based on the precedence of premises or the expansion of thought and reflection. His essence pours knowledge upon creation, not acquiring knowledge from creation. His knowledge is the cause of existence, not existence being the cause of his knowledge. He holds the keys to the unseen, known only to him. As he knows species and kinds, he knows contingent possibilities, even if we do not know them because a possibility, as long as it's recognized as such, it's impossible to know whether it will occur or not. Every possibility in itself is necessary because of its cause. If we understood all the causes of one thing and knew they exist, we would affirm the existence of that thing. The first, the truth, 
knows contingents and their causes because everything ascends to him in the chain of ascent. Since he knows the arrangement of causes, he knows all their reasons and outcomes. His knowledge is free from sensation, imagination, multiplicity, and change. After understanding this, understand his knowledge. If you comprehend his knowledge, know that he has a will and care, but his will and care are not additional to his essence. The proof that he has a will is that the doer either acts naturally, which is exalted above him, or by will. Nature is action without knowledge of the effect. So, the one acting by will knows its effects. So, he knows his actions and creations, and he is pleased with them, not displeased. It's appropriate to describe this as will. In summary, the specification of actions and their differentiation from one another is evidence of the existence of will. His care is the envisioning of the system of everything and the manner of its effects in the best and most complete way in the system, without any inclination or purpose driving him to what he wills. There's nothing more suitable for him, and he doesn't act to avoid blame or seek praise, and just as he is all-knowing and willing, he is also able, for the one who is capable is he who acts if he wishes and refrains if he does not wish. The capable is capable in that he acts if he wishes, not that he must act if he wishes, whatever he wills exists, and what he does not will does not exist, the Most High is wise, because wisdom is either knowledge of the realities of things, and there is no knowledge beyond that, or it refers to someone who performs actions in a perfectly ordered and measured manner, encompassing all that is needed in perfection, beauty, and decorum. He created everything in its due proportion, then guided it, he is generous, for generosity is the granting of goodness and bestowing it without a purpose, the Most High has generously bestowed goodness upon all existences as they deserve, without any omission or deficiency, all of that without any motive or benefit. He is the true generous and the absolute bestower, the name generosity for others is metaphorical, the Most High is intrinsically pleased, meaning perfect in knowledge and perfect in that which is known, or in his generosity and grace upon all that exists, because he most comprehensively perceives that which is most profound. He is beyond the nature of possibility and matter, and perfection is in being pure from matter and its implications, and sanctity from the nature of possibility and its consequences. Conclusion and Apology Know that even though we have derived knowledge of his essence and attributes from knowledge of the self, it is only by way of inference. Otherwise, God Almighty is beyond all the attributes of creatures, he cannot be described, he is too exalted to be described, too glorious to be said as glorious, too mighty to be said as mighty, and too great to be said as great. When speech reaches God, one should withhold, I cannot enumerate praises upon you, you are as you have praised yourself. He is beyond what describers describe, his greatness is above all, his glory is more majestic than any glory, attributes are lost in him, and he is sanctified beyond any epithet. This speech perplexes even the most profound thoughts, these are the words of the righteous, the chosen, the virtuous. This proves that it is not appropriate to say about him what causes guilt or repels harm, brings joy or happiness, causes laughter or joy, or results in love and longing. He is exalted above all of that. Whatever words appear in the Quran and the traditions are to be understood in their end meanings, not in their initial implications. On understanding the order of God's actions and directing causes to their sources. Only those who understand the effect of the soul on its power and body can grasp this. Know that the principle of human action is a will that either manifests its effect or not in the heart. This effect then flows through the animal spirit, which is a subtle vapor in the cavity of the heart, to the brain. From there, the effect flows to the nerves extending from the brain, from the nerves to the tendons and ligaments related to the muscle, which then pulls the tendons, causing the fingers to move. Through the fingers, the pen moves, and with the pen, ink, for instance, is used, creating the image of what one wishes to write on paper. This image is imagined in the storage of imagination. If he did not imagine the written image in his mind, he could not create it on paper. Moreover, those who study the actions of God Almighty and how he brings about plants and animals on earth by moving the heavens and stars, and how the angels obey him in moving the heavens, realize that human activity in his world, i.e., his body, resembles the Creator's activity in the larger universe. 
they come to understand that the heart's role in its actions is analogous to the throne, and the heart's relation to the brain is like the throne's relationship to the chair, Kersey. Our senses are like the obedient angels who naturally obey and cannot oppose his commands. Nerves are like heavens, the power in the finger is like the harnessed nature concentrated in bodies, materials are like the basic elements which are the mothers of composites in assembling and separating, and the storage of imagination is like the preserved tablet. The more one truly understands these analogies, the better they understand God's actions in the dominion and the kingdom. The Categories of God's Actions We have mentioned that powers are divided into active and perceptive. The perceptive is divided into external, like the five senses, and internal, like inner feelings such as imagination and illusion. Then, there's the human intellect, which is divided into theoretical and practical. Similarly, understand that all of God's actions are divided into intellects abstracted from materials witnessing the glory of God, souls that move the heavens, and bodies. Just as the body, human, is affected by the compounded powers within it but doesn't affect, and the practical mind affects the animal powers but is influenced by the theoretical mind, understand that all of God's actions fall into these categories, affected but not affecting, affecting but not affected. The affected that doesn't affect are the bodies of the universe, the affected that affects are the souls that are influenced by the intellects and affect the bodies of the heavens, the intellects affect but are not affected, their perfections are innate. In the world of bodies, nature is subservient to the soul, regardless of whether one knows or doesn't. If one follows the nature in subservience, they follow the guidance above it. God says in the Quran, and the sky, we built it with might and we continue to expand it, and the earth, we spread it out, so excellent spreaders are we. And of all things we created pairs, perhaps you will remember, all creations are inherently dual, subtle or dense, comprehensible or perceivable. There is duality in composites and simplicity, between simplicity and composites. The souls, through celestial spheres, give and elements receive, and from the giver and receiver come results and offspring of minerals, plants, animals, and humans. Between intellect and soul is duality, as between the pen and the tablet. Those who possess creation and command are exalted above duality, both in giving and receiving. Glorified is he, who does not have a child nor a partner, he created everything in a determined measure. Another classification. It is that the animal and human powers, along with the body, vary in virtue and perfection, arranged in honor and completeness. So, know that existence, in terms of perfection and deficiency, are divided into what does not require something else to acquire a property from it, but every potentiality for it is present with it and is called complete and into what does not have every potentiality present with it, but it needs to attain what it has not yet attained. This is called deficient before its completion. Then the deficient is divided into what does not need an external factor for it to attain what it should, and this is called self-sufficient, and into what does need and is called absolutely deficient. The complete is the intellect, the deficient is the bodies, and the deficient in a complete sense is the soul. Just as the body and everything composed of elements is deficient, the complete is the intellect, and the completely deficient is the spiritual powers like imagination, delusion, and the like. A different kind of knowledge. Just as the movement of a body indicates a mover, and the moved, if it's not naturally so, indicates an aware entity moving it by will. This perceiver can be apparent or hidden, and might be theoretical, visual, or practical. Similarly, know that the existence of bodies, like the hollow moon, are susceptible to composition. For instance, clay is composed of water and soil. We say that this observed composition indicates the existence of linear motion, and motion, in terms of its distance, indicates the conformation of two naturally distinct directions. The difference between these directions indicates the existence of an encompassing body like the sky. The occurrence of motion indicates it has a cause, and the cause has a cause, and so on ad infinitum. This is only possible due to the celestial movement being cyclical, and cyclical motion is only intentional. Partial intent is derived from a holistic intent, where the partial intent belongs to the soul, and the holistic intent belongs to the intellect. Thus, 
It's established that the elements susceptible to composition exist, as do the moving heavens that move these elements. These moving heavens indicate movers which are celestial souls, and these souls are derived from intellects. Everything depends on God Almighty as the creator, innovator, inventor, fashioner, initiator, manifester, restorer, and resurrector. His is the entire dominion, and the entire dominion is the first with no beginning before him, the last with no end after him, whom the eyes of the onlookers cannot comprehend, and whom the illusions of describers cannot define. He originated creation with his power, and designed them according to his will. The noblest of creations is the intellect. He created it by command without prior matter or time. Everything else is preceded only by command. One doesn't say about the command that it's preceded by the exalted creator or not preceded, but precedence and succession only afflict those existence which are in opposition. The exalted creator is the advancer and the delayer, not advanced or delayed. Below the intellect is the soul, which is preceded by the intellect, and the intellect is essentially prior to it, not in time, place, or matter. Essential precedence starts only from the intellect, temporal precedence starts from the soul, and spatial precedence starts from nature. Nature, therefore, precedes space and spatialities and isn't afflicted by space, instead, space originates from its motion or its movement in a body. The soul precedes time and temporalities and isn't afflicted by time. Rather, time and eternity originate from it, I mean from its longing, towards the perfection of the intellect. The intellect precedes essences and existentialities and isn't afflicted by essence and substantiality. Rather, substantiality originates from it, I mean it's the principle of substances. He is prior to essences, substances, eternity, time, place, body matter, and form, and he isn't described by anything below him except metaphorically. To whom belongs the creation and command is to whom belongs the dominion and kingship. He is the first and the last so that he is known not to be temporal, he is the apparent and the hidden so that he is known not to be spatial. His majesty is exalted, and his names are sanctified. By command, we mean the divine power, and when it's said that the intellect emanated from him by creation, it's not a claim that he is the creator per se. Rather, we mean by it to absolve the first truth from acting directly. The real creator is the one to whom belongs creation and command, blessed be his name. Just as the soul is one but has different powers and illuminates the body and the animal spirit in various ways depending on the power in place, so in the place of sight, in the place of hearing, in the place of smell, in the place of common sensation, in the place of imagination and delusion, and so on. Similarly, the first truth, may his glory be exalted, in relation to the existence of the creative intellect, and with respect to its existence in its perfection in action, with respect to the soul, it directs and leads from potential to actuality. In relation to nature, it motivates, in relation to bodies, it manages, in relation to temperaments and elements, it moderates, in relation to compounds, it shapes, in relation to the shaped, it gives life, in relation to animals, it gives sensation and guidance, in relation to the human intellect, it imposes duties and clarifies, and in relation to the prophets, peace be upon them, it gives command, speech, scripture, and messengership. And it is not for a man that Allah should speak to him except by revelation or from behind a veil or by sending a messenger and he reveals with his permission whatever he wills. Indeed, he is high and wise, the supreme command in relation to beings is about formation and creation, and in relation to the details of those charged, it is the command which includes prohibition, promise, threat, news, and information. The apparent command of creation is the states of angels and leading entities to their perfections. The perfection of beings is in accepting the command, the perfection of the accountable is in their acceptance of reward. Whoever does not accept the command is excluded from the realm of truth, and exclusion from the truth is a curse, as was the fate of the first Satan, he did not accept the command, and was expelled from the paradise of reason, and it was said to him, get out of it, indeed, you are outcast. And that is the meaning of the curse. Whoever accepts the command is admitted to the realm of reward and attains sovereignty, like the angels who were commanded to prostrate. Just as the vegetative, animal, and human powers cannot do without the constant illumination and influence of the soul, even for a moment, 
so too in the greater world we say, at the beginning, that every possessor of a rank, even if he is given a specific duty and is prepared for his task, cannot do without what is above him in terms of support, effusion, attention, and reinforcement. Similarly, in the return, if the role of each rank holder is transferred to the higher one, his work will not be entirely severed from his dealings. If the function of nature were interrupted, the vegetative powers would cease, and with their cessation, the animal powers would cease. Similarly, if the soul's function were interrupted, the animal powers would cease, and with their cessation, the human powers would cease, and similarly, if the function of the intellect were interrupted, the human powers would cease, and with their cessation, prophethood would cease. Nature guards the vegetative soul, the soul guards the animal souls, the intellect guards the speaking human soul, and the command of the Almighty Creator guards the prophetic holy soul. There is no soul but that it has over it a protector. In general, they have successors from in front of them and behind them who guard them by the command of God, specifically by the command of God. The first truth, as it created the first intellect, perfected it in action, as it devised through the soul, it perfected it with the power directed towards the perfection of the intellect, as it originated through it, nature, it supplied it with motion, as it produced bodies, it decreed their management, as it composed the elements, it balanced them, as it adjusted the mixtures, it manifested them in images, as it formed them, it enlivened them with souls, as it subjugated them with souls, it administered them with intellects, as it administered the intellects, it led them to their return through duties and laws, it commanded and prohibited, gave good tidings and warnings, promised and threatened through the tongues of the prophets, peace be upon them. In essence, the creation of this world isn't like building a house or setting up a scene with many creatures in it. Rather, God has ordained for each of his creations what he has created for them. He has distanced his gaze, planning, knowledge, power, and will from them, and they act according to his creation and decree. The dwelling is not in need of a maintainer, for the builder can be independent of the built as some people think and its inhabitants do not need a planner or decreer once they rely on their natural state, as some imagine, just as they were in need of being created initially, they continue to need sustenance and guidance, he is the sustainer over his dominion, exalted is he, just as a human is physically complete through nature to live in this world, the soul must be refined through divine law to thrive in the hereafter, angels are set to work with nature, achieving physical perfection, prophets, peace be upon them, guide according to the divine law, ensuring the refinement of souls, as the best essence is extracted from mixed substances to give a clear and pure entity in this world, the finest souls are refined through divine tests until they are pure in the next world. Without such refinement, an angel wouldn't be sent to the womb, and without this purification, a prophet wouldn't be sent to guide. I am amazed by those who are spiritually and physically balanced in creation and decree, Angels shape the creation from dust to the complete human form for this world, while prophets guide people from ignorance to pure, divine knowledge for the next. Both angels and prophets work for the higher purpose, always in awe and reverence of him, praising day and night without tiring. If someone says, what you mentioned in proving these elevations and balances between the soul and God Almighty, his attributes, and actions, all point to affirming a resemblance between the servant and God. But we know, both religiously and logically, that nothing is like God and he is the all-hearing, all-seeing, he does not resemble anything nor can anything resemble him. The answer is, in asserting this knowledge, we have emphasized God's transcendence beyond all created attributes and formations. No matter how you understand any similarity negated about God, you'll realize he has no equal. Not every shared attribute necessitates resemblance. It's implausible to claim that because both God and humans possess existence, hearing, sight, knowledge, will, speech, and power, they are similar. This is not the case. If it were, all creation would be likened to God simply for existing. Resemblance involves sharing in essence and nature. For example, a horse, no matter how you analogize, is not like a human because they differ in essence. God's unique attribute is his self-existence and everything conceivable derives its existence from him. This attribute is incomparable. So, a servant being alive, patient, or grateful doesn't imply resemblance to God being all-hearing, 
all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-living, and active. I say that the divine attribute belongs only to God, Most High, no one knows it except God, and it cannot be imagined that anyone other than Him knows it, for this reason, He only gave His creation names that veil His essence, He said, Exalt the name of your Lord, the Most High, Quran 87-1, By God, no one knows God other than God, neither in this world nor the hereafter, this means in the sense of encompassing and perfection, He is the unique God, transcendent beyond essence, the One, sacred beyond quantity, the eternal refuge, elevated beyond modality, He neither begets nor is born, but He is the Creator and His existence is eternal, there is none comparable to Him in His essence, attributes, or actions. This is what we wanted to mention in this book, I have unveiled the faces of the hidden secrets, lifted the veils from the treasures of knowledge, indicated the concealed mysteries, and presented the hidden sciences in hopes of drawing closer to the brothers who possess strong intuition, clear intellect, pure souls, and sharp insight. I am certain that time has brought forth those who will inherit these secrets, those who will deduce from them, without relying on the whims of a student to verify them in the proper manner, memorize them, and pass them on after him, or relying on the aspirations of the people of the era, or those who will follow them in their search, investigation, resolving doubts, and diving into the depths of knowledge. Then, I forbid all readers who possess the heavenly suitability and clear intuition from sharing it with an evil or obstinate soul, exposing it to them, or misplacing it. Whoever grants knowledge to the ignorant wastes it, and whoever withholds it from the deserving commits an injustice. If someone is found who is trusted for the purity of his inner self and the righteousness of his behavior, who refrains from what whispers rush him to, and who looks at the truth with satisfaction and honesty, give it to him progressively, letting him delve into what he learns for what's to come. Take a solemn oath from him in the name of Allah, that he will follow your path with what you give him. If he disseminates this knowledge and wastes it, then Allah is between me and him, and Allah is sufficient as a reckoner. Allah is enough for us. He is the best guardian and the best helper. Notice. At the end of the version upon which this book was printed, the following statement was found. The one who has taken respite from the labor of rising to transfer this book from black ink to white paper is, Ahmad bin Shaban bin Yahya al-Andalusi, known as Ibn Obad al-Aziz al-Amir. This was done on Wednesday, the 15th of the month of Rajab al-Asim, in the year 1066 H. May the best of blessings and the purest of salutations be upon him. If you find any errors, remedy the shortcomings. Exalted is he who has no flaws. Chill books. Audiobooks with relaxing music, visuals and subtitles to help you stay engaged.